Book Three, Chapter One of A Woman of Genius by Mary Hunter Austin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Book Three, Chapter One. I have to take up my story again about eighteen months later, at the point of my going out to suburbia to ask Gerald McDermott for a part in his new play, which was being rehearsed with Sarah in the role of Bettina. But before that there had been some rather mortifying experiences to teach me that, though I was done with Higgleston, it was, to a certainty, not done with me. In any case, I suppose the shock of my husband's death must have affected my work unfavorably, but the knowledge of his secret defection, and the excuse he found for it in what was best in me, made still corroding poison at the bottom of my wound. What it all amounted to in my career was that the season which should have swept me back to Chicago in triumphant establishment of my gift trickled out in faint praise and cold esteem. It was not that you could place your finger and say, just there was the difficulty, but what came of it was another year on the road with Klein and Erskine in stock. The Hardings, notwithstanding their disappointment in what they expected to make of me, managed to be kind. "'You'll pull up,' they assured me. "'It's because you are really an artist that you show what you've been through.' "'And they didn't know the half of what that was. "'To Henry Mills, my engagement with Klein and Erskine "'was a step forward into that blazant and banal professionalism "'which passes in America for dramatic success. "'But Sarah knew, and I think I knew myself,' that the dance they led us in the spotlight of copious advertisement was a dance of death to much that the plastic art should be. In this instance it was demonstrated even to the hopeful eye of Henry Mills, for the play chosen proved so little suited to the semi-rural Middle West cities where we played it that before the season was half over we were recalled, and after an empty interval finished out the engagement in one of those sensation-mongering shows with which such combinations as Klein and Erskine clutch at the fleeing skirts of a public they never understand. It was about a month after the closing of this engagement that I took Sarah's suggestion about applying to Gerald McDermott, but not before I had tried several other things. The truth was I knew very well when I faced it that I had at the time nothing in me. To those who haven't it, a gift is a sort of extra possession, like an eye or a hand that can be commanded to its accustomed trick on any occasion. But to the owners of it, it is a libation poured to the unknown God. I had emptied my cup of its froth of youth, and as yet nothing had touched the profounder experience from which it should be fed and filled again and I had no technique to supply the insufficiencies of my inspiration. Somewhere within me I felt the stuff of power, stiff and unworkable, needing the flux of passion and the shaping hand of skill. Looking back now from the vantage of a tolerable success, if you were to ask me what, more than any other thing, prevents the fullness of our native art, I should say the blank public misapprehension of its processes— Turning every way to catch the favorable wind, what met me then was the general conviction on the part of my friends that if you had talent you had succeeded anyway, and if you weren't succeeding it was because you hadn't any talent. I suffered many humiliations before I learned how absolutely, by that same society that so liberally resents the implication of any separateness in art, the artist is thrust back upon himself to do what seemed necessary for the development of my gift, to have a year or two to travel and study, to connote its powers with its limitations, required money, and though there in Chicago there was money for every sort of adventure that stirred the imagination of man, there was none for the particular sort of investment I represented, at least not at the price I was prepared to pay." The half of what had been put into setting my brother on his feet would have served me, but I learned from Effie 
that as much of my mother's capital as had been put into Forrester's business was not only impossible to be withdrawn from keeping him upright, but threatened not to hold him so for as long as it was necessary for mother to see him in the figure of a provider. This had been made plain at Christmas when Effie had written me that a particular wheeled chair which my mother had set her heart upon because of a hope it held out of church-going would be impossible unless I came forward handsomely. I did come forward on a scale commensurate with the Taylorville estimate of my salary, which was by no means comparable to its purchasing power in Chicago. And now I was beginning to realize that unless someone came forward for me, I stood to lose the shining destiny to which I felt myself appointed. I was slow in understanding that it was not to be looked for by any of the paths by which interest and succor are traditionally due, not, for instance, from Pauline and Henry Mills. I was seeing a great deal of them since I had come to Chicago, not only because of our earlier friendship, but because I found myself constantly thrown back on all that they stood for by my distaste for much that I saw myself implicated in as a theatrical star who had not quite made good. I hated quite unjustly, I believe, the players with whom for the time I was professionally classed. I loathed the shallow shop talk, the makeshift rooms we lived in, the outward smartness and the pinch of anxiety it covered. I was irritated by my external and circumstantial resemblance to much that I felt instinctively, kept them where they were, and vexed at some cheapness in myself which seemed to be revealed by the irritation. I had been thrown up out of the freemasonry of the preliminary struggle into a kind of backwater of established second-rateness, where there were also second-rate manners and morals and social perceptions. It was a great relief to get away from it to Pauline's home in Evanston, and the air it had of being somehow established at the pivot of existence. Pauline had two children by now, and a manner of being abundantly equal to the world in which she moved, a manner which I was only just realizing was largely owing to the figure of her husband's income. What Pauline furnished me at her home, over and above the real affection there was still between us, was a sort of continuous performance of the domestic virtues. That faculty for knowing exactly what she wanted, which had led her to make the most of her housekeeping allowance, in the days when making the most of it was her chief occupation, now that the centers of her activity had been shifted from the practical to the social and cultural, stood her in remarkable stead. I was so constantly amazed by the celerity and sureness with which she seized on just the attitude or opinion which suited best with the part she had cast herself for as the perfect wife and mother, that it was only when I discovered its complete want of relativity to the purpose of the play, or to the rest of the company, that I was not taken in by it. I doubt now if Pauline ever had an idea or permitted herself a behavior which was not conditioned by the pattern she had set for herself, which she intrigued both Henry and myself into believing was the only real and appreciable life. At the time of which I write, it was a great comfort to me to get away from my own dreary professionalism to the nursery at Evanston, or to add my small flourish to the scene affair of Henry's homecoming, made every day to seem the one event for which the household waited, from which, indeed, it took its excuse for being. For all of this was so well in line with what Henry, who, with the amplification of his income, had taken on a due rotundity of outline and a slight tendency to baldness, conceived as proper for a man's home to be, that he played up to it as much as was in him. He had still his air of knowingness about the theatre, and if there was at times in his manner a suggestion that he might have found it pleasanter to adjust his relation to me on the basis of what I was as an actress, if I had not been quite so much the friend, it was so far modified by his genuine admiration for his wife and his cession to her of every right of judgment in the home, 
that I was inclined to accept him at his own and Pauline's estimate as the model husband. It was only a few days before my visit to Gerald McDermott that I had undertaken to state to Pauline the nature of the help I required and my title to it. I had gone out to dinner and found her putting on a new gown, one of those garments admirably contrived between the smartness of evening dress and the intimacy of negligee, in which Evanston ladies of that period were wont to receive their lords. "'I'm needing something new myself,' I said for a beginning, "'and I'm divided between the certainty that if I don't get an engagement I can't afford it, and if I don't afford it I probably won't get an engagement.' Pauline stopped in the process of hooking up to take stock of me. "'You absurd child!' The note of amused admonition with which he ordinarily accepted my professional exigencies turned on the note of correction. "'Don't you think you put too much stress on those things?' "'What things?' She had touched upon the spring of irritation. "'Clothes, you know, and appearances.' Isn't it better just to do your work well and rest upon that? Pauline, if you had ever looked for an engagement, you would know that getting it is largely a matter of appearing equal to it, and clothes are the better part of appearing. But if you know that your work is good, what do you care what people think of you? I dodged the moral situation about to be precipitated on me. It's about the only way you know it is good, "'knowing what people think of it. "'Now, see here,' Pauline protested, "'reinforced by the evident superiority "'of her viewpoint to mine. "'You're getting it all wrong. "'These things you are thinking of, "'they are not the real things. "'They don't count. "'Not in the long run. "'It's only the spiritual things that really matter.' "'She had put on all the plastic effect of nobility "'that was part of her stock in trade with Henry Mills. "'I thrust out against it sharply. "'Do you realize, Pauline, that if I don't get an engagement soon, "'I shan't be able to pay my board?' "'Oh, you poor dear!' "'She came over and took my hand. "'I don't know why women like Pauline do that, "'but when they do it, it is a sign they are not equal to the situation and are trying to fake it with you. I know it is hard. She found the cooing note with facility. But it will come right, it always does. I've always found that there is a way provided. Something flashed into my mind that I had read in the newspapers recently about the corporations Henry worked for, and I wondered if Pauline had the least notion how the way, for her, was humanly provided, but the sound of Henry's latchkey put an end to the conversation, which I hadn't felt sufficiently encouraging to warrant my taking up again. I went from Pauline's, at the very first opportunity, to Sarah Croydon, who was playing in Chicago and doing her kindliest to blow the wind of hope into my sagging sails, I met Cecilia Brune there. It had been to me the witness of how far I had fallen from my mark that I had been thrown with her again in my last engagement. Hers was the sort of talent that Klein and Erskine could play up to the limit of the inadmissible. There were not wanting intimations that Cecilia had moved her own limit a notch or two in that direction. She had taken a characteristic view of my reappearance in her neighborhood. "'Got into the bandwagon, didn't you?' she remarked. "'I saw Dean on the road last year, and she said you was going in for highbrow stunts. "'Nothing to it. You stay with Klein and Erskine. They get you on like anything.' "'Her own notion of getting on was to figure as the sole female attraction in a song-and-dance skit in what she pronounced vaudeville. "'It's the only place having a figure does you any good.' that she did not recommend it for me must be taken for her estimate of mine. Nevertheless, I was amused by her, and Sarah, I knew, was even a little fond. Sarah's affections were a sort of natural emanation from her, like the rays of a candle, and warmed all they lighted on. 
On this afternoon I found Cecilia drinking tea there, and I wasn't able to conceal my professional depression from her sharp, shallow inquisitiveness. There were never two or three players got together, I believe, but the talk turned on the comparative ineffectiveness of merit as against pull in the struggle for success. "'There's no two ways about it,' insisted Cecilia Brun. "'You gotta get a hold of some rich guy and freeze to him.' The extent to which Cecilia had blossomed out in ostrich tips and orchids that bright spring afternoon might have suggested to an inexperienced eye that the freezing process had already begun. I say might have, because Sarah and I found it difficult to disassociate her from the hard, grubby innocence in which our acquaintance had begun. Sarah, I know, believed in her, and had her in often to informal occasions as a bulwark against what, with all her faith and pains, she didn't finally save her from. "'You can talk all you want to,' Cecilia asseverated, "'about man being the natural provider. I've noticed he don't work out the job much without his getting something out of it. If you're suffering with that little old song and dance about men doing for you because you're a woman and need it, you gotta get over it. There's nothing lay down over that counter unless you deliver the goods. She was nibbling lumps of sugar moistened in her tea, and the wild rose of her cheeks and the distracting rings of her hair made her offensiveness a mere childish impertinence. Look at Helen Matlock, she ran on. Getting five hundred a week. And when old Sedgwick put it up to her, she said she'd die, rather. And then she went home and found her mother sick. And what did she do? Never batted an eye, but told her she'd got an engagement, and went back and made it good. And now she's getting five hundred. That's what I call doing well by yourself. She can't mean it, Sarah extenuated when Cecilia had gone. She's too frank about it. When she stops talking, I shall begin to suspect her. But is it true? About Miss Matlock, I mean. Just at that juncture, Helen Matlock was doing the work I felt most drawn to, most fit to undertake. I suppose so, Sarah allowed. It's a common saying that the way to the footlights in the Majestic is through the manager's private room. She came over and sat beside me on the bed, which, under a Baghdad curtain, did duty as a couch. "'There are other theatres besides the Majestic,' she said. "'None that want me,' I averred. "'Oh,' she cried, "'you don't mean—' "'No,' I had to own. "'I don't mean that I have a chance to get on even by misbehaving myself. "'I'm not the kind to whom that sort of chance comes.' Sarah stroked my hand a while. I've been thinking if you could get a small part or a season, you could take it under another name until you are quite yourself again. It's often done. I could see she had gone much farther than that with it in her thought. It was just such cover that I was seeking for the renaissance of my acting power. And that was what led me to my going out to suburbia to see Gerald McDermott about the part of Mrs. Brandeis in The Futurist. It was out quite in the frayed edge of outer fringe of real estate ventures, which hedged Chicago round, in a district which was spoiled for country, and not quite made into town, and from the number of weedy plots not built upon between the scroll-saw cottages had almost a rural air. Leaning trolleys went zizzing along the banked highways, and at the ends of the unpaved avenues there were flat gleams of the lake. Depressed as I was by the consciousness of having fallen from the estate of actresses who command engagements to those who seek them, I was still able to be touched a little by curiosity by what Sarah had told me of McDermott and his wife, whom he had married for her pretty feminine inconsequence, who, having no point of attachment to her husband's life but femininity, was able to imagine none for any other woman, and suffered incredibly in consequence. If one could only discover why clever men marry that sort of women, I wondered. Oh, Jerry thought he was going to bend her to his will, Sarah explained. 
but that kind don't bend, they just slump. I had hardly knocked at the door before I had an inkling of how painful to the author of The Futurist the process of slumping might be. I could hear the fretting of a child hushed suddenly by my knock, then the patter of little feet across the floor, and voices startled and pitched low. I was just debating whether I shouldn't pretend I hadn't heard anything and go away again, when Mr. McDermott opened the door. I had met him once at Sarah's, and should have known him again by the pallor of his countenance against the dead blackness of his hair, straight and shining like an Indian's. The effect of boyishness that one derived from his tall, thin figure was increased now by the marks of weeping about his eyes. In the glimpse of the room behind him I was aware of a disorder only excusable in the face of a family catastrophe. One of the children that ran to his knees was still in its little petticoat, without a slip, and had not been washed or combed that day. I wavered an instant between the obligation of politeness to ignore the situation and the certainty that I couldn't. Oh, I cried. I snatched at my repertory for the proper mixture of commiseration and consternation. Is anyone ill? His desperate need of help opened the door to me. My wife, he began, but the state of the room accounted for that, as he perceived, taking it in afresh through my eyes. Mrs. McDermott was lying on the sofa in the coma of exhaustion. She lifted her face to me for a moment, swollen with crying, and then let herself go again into that pit in which a woman sinks an impossible situation. She was really faint, poor thing, and, if I judged by the state of the house, had had no luncheon. I took all that in at a glance, but it was none of my business. Is it her heart? I wanted to know of her husband as I bent over her. He caught up the suggestion eagerly. Yes, her heart. She is very weak. He did whatever I suggested on that explanation. I would have proposed putting her to bed if I had not feared that that would involve more revelations of the family disorder than I was willing to tax him with. We got her out of her faintness presently and found her a safety valve in pitying her poor children with that sloppy sort of maternal affection which is not inconsistent with a good deal of neglect. I wasn't working for anything but to save Jerry, I came to call him that before many weeks, from the embarrassment of what I was sure had been a family fracas, which threatened at every moment to break out again. I suggested tea for I was satisfied that both of them wanted food, and while I was making toast before the sitting-room fire, Mrs. McDermott managed to get herself and the children into some sort of order. I could see then how pretty she had been in a large-eyed, short-lipped way, and how charming in her youth had been the inconsequence which as the mistress of a family made her a sloven not to seem to notice too much the superficial air of being prepared for company, which she managed to give the children by washing their faces surreptitiously, I explained to Mr. McDermott that I had come about the part of Mrs. Brandeis. "'Oh, you'll do,' he assented heartily. "'You'll do just as you are. Mrs. Brandeis is a widow, you know. That is, the Mrs. Brandeis that I created.' "'Just as you conceived it, of course,' I insisted. "'I should want to play it that way. "'The trouble is that Moresco isn't satisfied so easily. "'He wants me to make changes in the part. "'Well, I was prepared to make concessions. "'I'm afraid he has somebody in mind.' "'Fancy Follette, his wife broke in. "'A painting, flirting, immoral. "'Jerry scraped his chair back along the floor to cover the word.' but I knew where I was in a twinkling. Fancy Follette, she'll play it in short skirts. I'll be lucky if she doesn't insist on a song and dance. He doesn't need to have her unless he wants to. Mrs. McDermott was positive on that point. She was sitting with both children on her lap, chiefly in order to keep up the fiction that I didn't know she had just been having hysterics. 
I had cautioned her against letting them climb over her, and she promptly let them, because the idea that she was tending them at a risk to her health rather helped out with her own notion of herself as a misused but devoted wife and mother. Jerry looked at me over her head and a mute appeal to me to understand. "'Unless Moresco puts on my play, there is no chance for it,' he protested. "'I've been to the others. I'll tell you, though, if you go to him just as you are, he may think better of it. He can't possibly get anybody so good.' We neither of us believed that Mr. Moresco would turn down Fancy Follett for anybody, but we kept up the game of thinking so from sheer desperation. I played, too, at the pretense that Jerry's wife was a delicate, idealized sort of creature who did not understand the great hard world. That was no doubt what had appealed to him in the beginning, but she wasn't made up for the part. She had begun to put on weight after she had children, and her hair wanted washing. I got away as soon as I could and went straight to Sarah. They'd been having some kind of a row, I told her. Oh, it must have been Fancy Follette who set her off. Sarah was certain. She took to you as a relief, but you'll be in for it, too, if you get the part. I had to admit to myself after I had been to Mr. Moresco that there was not much likelihood that I would get it. He laid the tips of his pudgy fingers together and addressed me with the slight blur in his speech which convinced one of the racial affinity which he commonly denied. "'Mr. McDermott thinks it will suit me admirably,' I told him. "'Ah, yes, the author.' The manager mentioned him as though it were a fact indulgently admitted to the discussion." "'But then, my dear Miss Lattimore, we have to think of the audience. "'There was this peculiarity of Moresco's handling of an audience "'that he treated it as an entity, "'a sort of human stratification of which the three front rows were lubricious, "'the body of the orchestra highbrow, "'the first balcony sentimental and virtuous, "'the gallery facetious.' As far as possible, he arranged his plays to meet the requirements. Now we have Miss Croydon for Bettina. She is your type. He meant as a woman, not as an artist. Sarah and I were both serious and respectable. For Mrs. Brandeis, I think we should have something a little more snappy. It isn't written snappy in the play, I reminded him. "'Ah, no, that is the trouble. I have spoken to Mr. McDermott. He will perhaps change it.' "'And if he doesn't, you will keep me in mind for it?' I kept my voice with difficulty from being urgent. "'You see, I don't feel like playing a heavy part this year.' I glanced down at my morning. I hoped he would accept it as an explanation. Two or three days later, I saw Sarah, and she remarked that Jerry was rewriting some parts of his play at the request of the manager. The part of Mrs. Brandeis? Sarah nodded. Mr. Moresco wants it more... more... snappy, I supplied. And who is to have it, have you heard? Fancy Follette. Oh, well, she's snappy enough, I suppose. I know. I don't even like to be billed with her. But anyway, the part wasn't worthy of you. But I felt as I went home to my lodging that that was only Sarah's kind way of putting it. End of Book 3, Chapter 1book 3 chapter 2 of a woman of genius by mary hunter austin this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain book 3 chapter 2 i saw more than a little of jerry mcdermott during the spring and summer that i stayed in chicago haunting managers offices in my winter suit and a fixed determination not to let any of them suspect that I knew I couldn't for the moment act at all. Where the gift had gone I did not know, nor when, in some desperate encounter with the chance of an engagement, I attempted to draw about me 
the tattered remnants of my old facility, had I any notion what would bring it back again. Effie wrote me to come home for the hot weather, but though I regretted afterward not having done so, I could not make up my mind to leave Chicago. It seemed to me then that the deadly quality of Taylorville lay waiting like a trap, which, in my present benumbed condition, might close on me if I put myself in the way of it. I thought that if I got out of reach of the flare of light from the theater doors, of the smell of back scenes and the florid grip of the posters, that I should never in this world win back to them. A summer in Taylorville would have saved me money, would have rested and perhaps restored the balance of my powers, but the inward monitor of which I was the mere shell and surface clutched upon the city with the grip of desperation. I hung upon whatever slight attachments to the theatre my circumstances afforded, like the drowned upon a rope, and waited for the resuscitating touch. Somewhere beyond me I was aware of succor. Not knowing from whence it should come, I grasped at everything within reach and was buffeted and torn about in the eddy of reverses. What more even than his need of me drove me back on Gerald McDermott was the certainty that he was deriving from Fancy Follette the quality I missed. She was playing in one of the cheaper theatres and one of those entertainments that men are supposed to resort to when their families are out of town, and I had a moment's feeling that he exposed his sex to ridicule by the avidity with which he surrendered himself to her perfectly obvious methods. Until he sent his family north to one of the lake resorts for the hot weather, I found myself involved in certain obligations of visiting at his house, where I saw that his wife created for him by her incompetence much the same sort of background that my bereaved and purse-pinched condition made for me, and watched with alternate sympathy and resentment his flight from it to the effective self-complacency which Miss Follette induced in him. I don't mean that Jerry wasn't fond of his wife in a way, and faithful to her, in so far as she didn't interfere with his male prerogative of being played upon by other women, but I do not think he had ever an inkling that the vortex of anger and despair which she forced him to share with her, in lieu of the passion which she couldn't any more excite, was of the same stripe as his need of the high inflated mood that Miss Follette provided for him with her little bag of tricks." for from the first Jerry seized on me, poured himself out, despoiled himself of all the hopes, conjectures, half-guesses of his career, and that without in the least discovering that I was in need of much the same sort of relief myself. After his wife had taken the children to the country, though she used even then to come down on him suddenly with both of them and break up his work for days, or just when it was running smoothly, wire him to rush up to Lakeview and allay the horrors of her too active imagination. Often evenings after the day's work, he would take me to dine at queer little French or Italian restaurants, which were supposed to be preferred on account of the atmosphere rather than their cheapness, and uncoil for me there all the intricate turnings of his work upon itself, and the rich shapes and colors it took played upon by the slanting eyes and carmine smile of Miss Follette. He would sit opposite me with a cigarette and a glass of Dago Red, his black shining hair, which he wore too long, slanting above his forehead like a boding wing, uncramping his soul. And though I liked him as a friend and as a playwright thought him immensely worth while, I was divided between exasperation at his tacit exclusion of me from the world of excited powers in which any stimulation of his maleness threw him, and fear that in missing his capacity for quick, shallow passions I had missed the one indispensable thing for my art. It is the chance of a lifetime, Jerry would be reassuring me, to delineate a character that will be so intimate an expression of the one who is to play it. It's really extraordinary that she should have been named Fancy. It's symbolic. Oh, if you imagine she is really in the least like the Mrs. Brandeis you are creating, 
Besides, I happen to know her name is Powers. Amanda Powers. He caught at this delightedly. Ah, she's a poet. A poet. Such self-knowledge. To think of her knowing what would suit her so exactly. But I was not in the least interested in Miss Follette's psychology. What I was trying to get at was the source of the creative mood which I was sensible did not arise from anything Miss Follette was, but from what Cherry was able to think of her. I admitted it was a mood you had to be helped to, but I wasn't going to accept it from any male compliment to his in Amarata. I set up Jerry's case alongside of Miss Dean and Manager O'Farrell, and a kind of fine intolerance drove me from it as ships are driven apart upon the tide. It drove me back in the first instance upon what Pauline and Henry Mills stood for in my life. I was full of a formless, importunate capacity, like the motor impulses of a paralytic, and I imagined a relief from it in the shadow of some succoring male who, by assuming the traditional responsibility of getting a living, should leave me free to produce the perfect flower of art. At the time I was as far from realizing as Pauline that she was eminently the sort of woman the sheltered life produced— had Henry Mills been upon the market, I should have seized upon him promptly as the solution of all my difficulties. Pauline did her best for me. That is to say, she brought out for me an infinite variety and arrangement of the sentimentalized sex attractions with which she charmed dull care from Henry's brow. It was only by degrees that I perceived that the utter want of relativity of the quality that was known in Evanston as true womanliness was due to its being conditioned very much as I thought of myself as happiest to be. It was not until Pauline went to the country for the hot weather, without making any sensible change in my affairs, that I began to understand how little she contributed. What I chiefly missed was a place to walk to when I went out for exercise. I spent a great deal of time just walking, for there was not much doing in the theatrical line to interest me, and I was sustained and tormented by intimations that somewhere, not far from me, my help walk too. I don't know where this conviction came from, that there was help somewhere in the world, but by the middle of the summer the terrible keen need of it walked with me through all my days and lay down with me at night. There were times when the certainty that it was there seemed almost enough to lift me again to a plane of power, other times when the sheer hunger of it bit into the bone. It was most like the sense I had had as a child of the large friendliness that brooded over Hadley's pasture. It was like the promise of the shining destiny that had moved between my youth and the common occurrence. But now, at times, just along the edge of sleep, or out of the thick waking drowse of heat, it shaped familiarly human. I think about that time I must have dreamed again the dream I had of Helmuth Garrett, just after I had seen Majeska, writing that letter in his uncle's house, and with the help of what my mother had told me, I was able to read it plain. I do not distinctly remember dreaming this, but there were times when, just after waking, my mind would be full of him, and there would be a stir in me of the wings of power. But in the broad day, though I thought of him often, I could not so much as recall his face clearly. The one thing that I remembered about him was that I had pleased him. It was a mortifying certainty that Jerry's ready acceptance of me as a woman, of whom his wife could not possibly be jealous, had defined for me that I didn't know how to please and interest men. They often were interested in me, but I was never in the least conscious of what drew them or caused them to shear away. I had a suspicion, doubtless of Taylor Villian extraction, that there was a sort of culpability in knowing, but it came back to me now almost with a thrill that I had known with Helmuth Garrett. I had been able, out of all the possible things which might be said, to choose the thing that swayed him. I hadn't known ever for what things my husband loved me, but in a brief hour with Helmuth Garrett I was conscious of much in my manner to him arising from his conscious need. 
and I had no more than shaped this in my mind than I felt a faint stirring within me as of power. About this time I began to be more aware of the something without toward which my work tended, just after I had been asleep, as if the self of me had gone on seeking more successfully in the silences. I would arise very early with such a faint consciousness as a vine might have toward the nearest wall, and get up in the blue of the morning to go for long walks through the pleasant, empty streets, sometimes out to the lake shore, where the glint of the moving water under the mist struck faint sparkles from my stagnant surfaces. I would come back from these excursions beginning to faint with the day's heat, to wear through the afternoon with books and long drowses, and then in the cool of the evening it would call me again, and I would seek it until late at night, sometimes in the lit streets, fetid with the day's smells, sometimes on a roof garden or at a park concert, where the lights, the gaiety, and the music served merely as a drug to my outer sense, which went on busily at its absorbing quest. Sometimes men spoke to me in these lonely wanderings. I would remember it afterward as one recalls little unnoticed incidents in the midst of great excitement, but for the most part I was, except for the invisible presence, as unaccompanied as if the city had been quite empty. If I could have laid the anxiety of my diminishing bank account and the dread of not getting an engagement, I should have been almost happy. It was along early in August that Chicago was greatly stirred by the visit of one of the presidential candidates, for that was a presidential year, who was also a popular hero. It had come rather unexpectedly, and the preparations for it were of the hastiest. There was to be speaking at Armory Hall, and a reception afterward, and I thought I would go and clasp the hands with the great man, as if, perhaps, I might find in it, as many of his admirers did, a sort of king's touch for the lethargy of my spirit. The meeting began early in the sweating afternoon and dragged out three heavy hours. Nothing of any importance transpired there until we were moving up the right side of the hall toward the receiving committee. The hall was split lengthwise by a bank of chairs, and down the left aisle the company of those who had already gripped the broad palm of the candidate had been elbowed to oblivion by the committee. It was in the very beginning of the handshaking, and there were not so many of them as of us. They lingered in groups and talked with one another. I was about midway of the aisles and several persons deep in the crush when I saw him. How well I knew the lock falling over his forehead, and the quick unconscious motion of the head that tossed it back. There was an indefinable air of the outdoor man about him, though he was quite correctly dressed and had a lady's light wrap over his arm. Helmuth! Helmuth! I cried out to him from the center of my will. I fought my way to the outer edge of the moving crowd. I caught at chairs and struggled to maintain my position opposite him. He was talking to two or three men, and just at the edge of the group a woman stood with an air of waiting. I resented her immobility, so near him and so little moved by him. Helmeth! Helmeth! Look! Look at me! I demanded voicelessly across the bank of chairs. He heard me. Slowly he turned. His attention wandered from the group. Helmeth! Helmeth! All my will was in my cry. Now he looked in my direction. There was that in his face that told me my cry had touched the outer ring of his consciousness. Then the lady who stood by took advantage of his detachment to touch him on the arm. Only a man's wife touches him like that. I knew her at once. She was the type of woman who subscribes to the delineator and belongs to the church because she thinks it is an excellent thing for other people. She had blonde hair discreetly frizzled about the temples, and her dress had been made at home. As soon as she touched him, Helmuth Garrett turned to her with divided attention. I saw her take his arm. He looked back. The cry held him. His eyes roved up and down. The moving mass closed between us and carried me completely out of sight. 
it was fully a quarter of an hour before the crowd released me, and by that time he had quite vanished. I hung about the entrance to the hall, I pushed here and there in the press, elbowed out of it by resentful citizens. At last, when the hall was closed, and even the policemen had gone from before it, I went home, to lie awake half the night planning how to get at him. And the moment I woke from the doze of exhaustion into which I finally fell, I knew that the thread which bound me to Chicago had snapped. I stayed on two or three days, vaguely hoping to come across him. I even looked in the hotel registers before I accepted Sarah's urgent invitation to spend the rest of the month with her at Lakeview. One night, when the wind out of the lake was fresh enough to suggest, in the closed window and the drawn blind, a reciprocated intimacy, I told Sarah all about Helmuth Garrett. And to think, I said, how different it might have been if only I had got that letter. Yes, Sarah admitted, but that doesn't prove you'd have been happy. Not if we loved one another? Oh, I'm not sure loving has anything to do with happiness or is meant to. Sometimes I think God, or whoever it is manages things, has a very poor opinion of happiness because you don't find it invariably along with the best of experiences. It happens, or it doesn't. If love does anything for you, it is just to give you the use of yourself. But it hasn't, I protested. I'm just stumping along. You haven't really had it. Just being kissed once, what does that amount to? Oh, Sarah, Sarah, that is what hurts me. I haven't really had it. I'm never going to. I'll just go halting like this all my life. No, you won't. Sarah shook her head, piercing her own knowledge slowly into comfort for me. You remember what I told you that time when you found out about Dean and Mr. O'Farrell? There's a kind of feeling that goes with acting that is like loving, only it isn't. I don't know where it comes from. Maybe it is what they call genius, but I know you can slide off from loving into it. That is what makes Jerry think he has to be in love all the time. It is a little stair he climbs up and then he goes sailing off. You don't think Fancy Follett really does anything for him? Goodness, no. She hasn't a teaspoonful of brains. Well, then, she triumphed. After a while, his genius will be so strong in him that he won't need that sort of thing, and he will think it ridiculous. And you think that will come to me? It did come. You didn't have to be in love to begin, Sarah objected. Sarah, I will tell you the truth. I was in love all the time. I didn't know with whom, but always wanting somebody, trying to get through to something trying to mate. That was it. Nights when I would do my best and the house would be storming and cheering, I would look around for... for somebody, and I would go to my room and he wouldn't be there. I used to think Tommy would be he. I wanted him to be. I thought some day I would turn around suddenly and find him changed into whatever it was I wanted. But I know now he never could have been that. And all this summer, I've heard it calling. I've walked and walked. Sometimes it was just around the corner, but I never caught up with it. And when I saw Helmuth Garrett, I knew. I had leaned back out of the circle of our small shaded lamp to make my confession, but Sarah came forward into it, the better to show me the condoning tenderness of her smile. It's no use, Sarah. I'm no genius. I have to be in love like the rest of them. She shook her head gently. You'll get across. Love would help. I wish you had it. But I'll confess to you. I had love and it only opened the door. There's something beyond, bigger than all men. You must reach out and lay hold of it. Oh, if it were love one needed, I should die. I should die. I never had seen her so moved before. Tell me, Sarah, I've always wanted to know. I want you to know, but it isn't easy. I didn't know anything about love. 
How could I, the way I was brought up? My father was a Baptist preacher. I had been taught that it was wrong to let anybody touch you, and when he kissed me I felt as if he had the right. I know, I know. I had been kissed that way myself. How can anybody know? I loved him, and I was the only one of many. He left me without a word, like a woman of the street, not looking backward. She got up and moved about the room, the thick coil of her rich brown hair slipping to her shoulders, and her bodily perfection under the thin dressing gown distracting me even from the passion of her speech. I had a momentary pang of sympathy with the delinquent Lawrence. I could see how a man might be afraid almost of the quality of her beauty. Sometimes, she said, I think marriage is a much more real relation than people think, that something real but invisible happens between them so that even if they are parted, they are never quite the same again. It is like having a limb torn from you. You ache always in the part you have lost. I knew something of what that ache could be, but I could only turn my face up to hers that she might see my tears. You have enough of your own to bear, she said. I must not lay my troubles on you. But I wanted to tell you how I know it is not love that makes art. I was dying for love when Mr. O'Farrell put me to acting. I was bleeding so, and suddenly I reached out and laid hold of whatever is, and I found I could act. It was as if the half of me that had been torn away had been between me and it, and I laid hold of it. That's how I know. She came behind me, leaning on my chair, and I put up my hands to her. Oh, Sarah, Sarah, help me to lay hold of it, too. But for all her shy confidences, deep within, I didn't believe her. Toward the first of September, we went back to the city, Sarah to begin rehearsals for the Futurist, and I to take up the dreary round of managers' offices and dramatic agencies. The best that was offered me was poor enough, but it had a faint savour of a superior mode of clinging to it. It was from a Mr. Coleman, an actor-manager of the old, heavy-jowled Shakespearean type, who was projecting a classic revival with himself in all the tragic parts, and I signed with him to play Portia, Cleopatra, and the wife of Brutus. We had been busy with rehearsals about ten days when I had a telegram from Forrester saying that Mother had died that day, and I was to come immediately. It was late Sunday evening when I received it, and I hunted up the manager at the hotel. "'I'm going,' I told him. "'Well, of course, your contract. "'I'm going anyway, and I know the lines.' He was as considerate, I suppose, as could be expected. "'I can give you three days,' he calculated. Four, I stipulated. Well, four, he grudged. That would allow two days for the funeral. End of Book Three, Chapter Two. Book Three, Chapter Three of A Woman of Genius by Mary Hunter Austin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Book Three, Chapter Three. As it turned out, I was more than a month in Taylorville, and so saved myself from the Coleman players for a more kindly destiny, though at the time it did not appear so. It grew out of my realizing in Effie's first clasp of me something more than our common loss, more than family something I felt myself answer to before we could have any talk together that did not relate to the funeral and the manner of my mother's death. They thought from little things that came to mind afterward that she must have been prepared for it, but forbore to trouble them with the presentiment of what could not in any case have been much longer delayed. She had clung to them more and had been still more loath to trouble them with her wants. The Saturday before, she had made Effie understand that she wished all the photographs of my father brought together. Queer little old daguerreotypes of him as a young man, a tintype of him in his volunteer soldier dress, 
and a large faded photo of him as an officer leaning on his sword. She kept them by her and would be seen poring upon them, as though she tried to fix the identity of one about to be met under unfamiliar or confusing circumstances, though they did not think of this until afterward. The Sunday of her death, Cousin Judd had come in to sit with her, as his custom was, an hour earlier than the morning service. He had read the day's lesson from the Bible and sung the hymn, and then after an interval Effie, who was busy about the back of the house, heard him sing again my mother's favorite hymn. Come thou font of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy praise. And as he sung she saw the tears rolling down his face. So she turned her back on them and let them say their goodbyes without her, though she had no notion how near the final parting was. Forrester was dressing. He and Effie had taken turns at church going ever since Mother's stroke, and he was surprised to find that Cousin Judd had gone off without him. Mother clung to him when he went to kiss her goodbye. She struggled with her impotence, but they made out that it was not because she wanted him to stay at home with her, and for the first time since her illness she wished not to be propped up at the window where she could sign to the neighbors going by, but seemed to want greatly to sleep. Effie wheeled her into the corner of the sitting-room, and a little later she noticed that Mother's head had slipped down on the pillow as it did sometimes, past her power to lift it up again. So my sister straightened the poor head with a kiss and went back to getting the dinner. She moved softly because Mother seemed asleep, but at last when she went as usual to tell her that Forrester was visible at the end of the street, on the way home, she saw that the head had slipped down again, and this time as she lifted it up there was no life in it at all. One of the strange incidents of that morning, and yet not strange when you think how much they had been to one another, was that Cousin Judd, though he had started home directly after church, could not get there, but when he had driven a little way out of town, drawn by he knew not what unseen force, turned back and pulled up in front of our door, just as the doctor, who had been summoned hastily, was saying that Mother had been dead an hour. It was Monday morning when I arrived, and the funeral could not be until Tuesday, to allow time for the news to penetrate to all the distant country places from which my mother's relatives would be drawn to it, moved and anxious to come, though many of them had not seen her for a matter of years. I think I realized at once how it would be about my getting back to Chicago, especially when I spoke to Effie about it. She cried out and clung to me in a way that made me see that I stood for something more to her than just sisterliness. Without saying anything, I wrote to Mr. Coleman that I should be detained a week or longer, and that though I hoped he would be able to save my place for me, I didn't really expect that he would. It was not in the Taylorville Cemetery that we buried my mother, but a little plot set aside from the old Judd place, along with the rest of the Wilsons, Judds, and Jewetts, those that had dropped back peacefully to their native sod, and those sent home from Gettysburg and Appomattox. It was a longish ride. From turn to turn of the country road, teams dropped into the procession that led out from town. On either side the woods blazed like the rank cherubim, host on host. Great shoals of fiery leaves lay in the shallows of the burying ground. At the last, shaken by the light breeze that sprung up, little flamy darts from the oak whirled into the grave with her. They were to say in their own fashion that there was nothing more natural. I think my mother must have found it so. We had scarcely got home again, still sitting about veiled and voluminous, when I was drawn out of grief to meet Effie's emergency. It was Almira Jewett who had brought me face to face with it. Almira had taken off her things and was getting tea for us in her brisk, capable way. Anyhow, she said, I suppose you'll stay with your sister until she gets sort of used to things. It flashed on me that what she was expected to get used to was going on just as she had been without the excuse of my mother's needing her. 
Oh, I'll stay till the breaking up. I met her promptly. My land, said Almira Jewett. You talking of the breaking up and your mother ain't hardly out of the house yet? They do say there's nothing like play acting to make you nimble in your feelings. I knew, of course, that they would lay it to the defibricating influence of my profession that I should take the breaking up of my mother's home so lightly, but I had caught a brief hiatus in Effie's sobs, and I realized that what the poor child was afraid of was being hypnotized into a situation against which her natural good sense revolted. I was bracing myself against the tradition of filial obligation that I felt was going to be put in force against me, when suddenly help arrived from an unexpected quarter. "'I suppose you're going with the troop yet?' Cousin Lydia interposed, for the first time in her life, I believe, delivering herself of a conclusion. "'It's a pity, because if you was any way settled, you could take Effie with you. Forrester was a good son. She ruminated on that for a while. He was what you call a real model son, but I don't know as I want to see Effie married to him the same as your mother was. It gave me a shock to think that all these years she must have been seeing how things were. She shan't, I assured her, not if I have to stay with Forry myself. I had thought a good many times what was to become of Effie. I couldn't take her with me, of course, but I wasn't in the least prepared to see her intrigued by the popular sentiment into becoming a mere figurehead for Forrester's role of provider. Keeping up a home, they called it, in Taylorville, as though the house and furniture and the daily habit of coming back to it were the pivotal facts of existence. It almost seemed as if it might come to that. After the others were all gone and the night closed in on us three, the spirit of the dead came and stood among us. Effie wept in Forry's arms and said that he should not be quite bereft. He should have her anyway. You poor child, you've got a brother left. You too, Olivia. You shan't want for a home while I live. That, of course, was the sort of thing Taylorville expected of him. It began to seem as if I might have to make good my word about staying with my brother to let Effie free. I believe he would have accepted that without even a suspicion of what I surrendered by it. If anything, he would have seen in it only another dramatization of his role of dutifulness. That a woman had any preferred employment besides cushioning life for the males of her family had not impinged on the consciousness of Taylorville. But the very next morning I awoke anew to the purpose of rescuing Effie and to the recollection of an incident of the funeral, noted but not taken into the reckoning in the stress of more absorbing emotions. Effie, wasn't that Mrs. Jastrow I saw at the cemetery yesterday with her head done up in a black veil? Crepe, too? I have just recalled it. Effie nodded. One would have thought, I resented, that she was one of the family. Ah, uh, that's it. She thinks she is. One of the family? Oh, you don't mean that for a... Where was Lily then, I demanded. She wouldn't come, of course, not being recognized as one of the family, and yet counting herself one. But explain, how could she? I thought that was broken off long ago. When mother was first taken, Effie agreed, but you see, she made such a dead set at him, she had to keep it up somehow. She couldn't admit that Forry hadn't wanted her, so they made it up between them, Lily and her mother, I mean, that she and Forry had really been engaged, but it had been broken off because Forry couldn't marry so long as mother. She broke off with tears again, remembering how mother was now. That was two years ago. You don't mean to say they've kept it up all the time. They've had to. You see, Lily hadn't been careful about not getting herself talked about with Forrester. Oh, not scandal, of course, but you know how it is when a girl is crazy after a man. Everybody gets to hear of it. And then they had to make so much of the engagement never coming to anything on Mother's account. It quite spoiled Lily's chances. And you know Forrester... Oh, he was taken in by it, no doubt. 
It was something to sentimentalize over and be self-sacrificing about. Well, of course, he couldn't quite abandon the poor girl, and she really is fond of him, and perfectly safe to philander with. Well, now that he has no one depending on him, I suppose he will marry her. That's what is worrying me, protested Effie. You see, it all depends on whether I go on depending on him. She broke down over that. Mother hadn't wanted Forrester to marry Lily Jastrow, and everybody by the mouth of Almara Jewett had thought it was Effie's duty to keep him from it if she could. And I could by just staying on. It's Mother's money in the business, yours and mine as much as his, and this house, it's partly ours if we stay in it. Well, if you want to. Effie came over and sobbed on my shoulder. Oh, I don't, she said. I suppose it is hard and selfish. I'm fond of Forry, but I want to do things in the world like you have. And I want to marry and have babies. Oh, oh, she was quite overwhelmed with the turpitude of it. You shall, you shall, I determined for her. Oh, Olivia, I have wanted you so. I knew you'd understand. It was all right so long as Mother lived. I could do anything for her. But now I want... I want to be me. I understood very well what that want was. But first off, I had to explain to Effie why I couldn't take her with me. It was wonderful how she entered into my feeling about my work and my lack of success in Chicago. Of course, you ought to go to New York. You'll be a great tragic actress, Olive. I know that. You could go, too, if you could get your share out of the business. You could have mine and yours. She glowed over it. But the fact was, we couldn't get the money out of the business. As it stood, we couldn't have sold the shop for what Mother had put into it. And besides, we should have had to deal first with Forrester's conviction that he was taking care of our shares for us. I needn't have worried about Effie. She was too pretty and competent not to have arranged for herself. The principal and his wife drove over from Montecito to say that they would be glad to have her come back and finish the course interrupted within a few months of graduation by my mother's illness. And for her board and tuition, she was to act as the principal's secretary. Within a year, she wrote that she was engaged to their son. In the meantime, I undertook to stop the capacious maw of Forey's need of being important, and the only way I saw to do it involved my surrender of any hope I had of finding my own release in what my mother had left us of my father's hard-won savings. I shouldn't have had any compunction, so fierce was my own need of success, about forcing my brother's hand, but I meant definitely not to leave any gap in his life for Effie to be drawn back into. Before we had come to this point, the second afternoon after the funeral, in fact, circumstances had begun to work for me. Effie and I, looking out of the window, saw Mrs. Jastrow coming along by the front fence with all her gentility spread, as it were, by the feeling she had of her call on us being a diplomatic function. She's coming to see how we take it, Effie averred. Her coming to the funeral is one of the family? Well, how do we take it, Effie? Mother couldn't bear the idea of it. Tears came into my sister's eyes. I could see the wings of self-immolation hovering over her. Look here, Effie, you go and take home Mrs. Ensley's spoons. There had been so many out-of-town connections dropping in for a meal that we had been obliged to fall back on our nearest neighbor. Lily's respectable, isn't she? And Forrester has encouraged her. Well, you don't want to spoil the poor girl's life, do you? Oh, said Effie, oh, Olivia... I could see she was torn between compunction and admiration for my way of putting it on high moral grounds. I heard her counting out the spoons in the kitchen as I went to let Mrs. Jastrow in. I think she didn't know any more than Effie did what to make of my manner of receiving her. She sat on the edge of a chair and sniveled a little into a handkerchief, which was evidently her husband's. 
but it was chiefly I could see, because she had come prepared to snivel and couldn't quickly adjust herself to my change of base. "'Poor Lily!' she moaned. "'She thought such a lot of Mr. Lattimore's mother, but I tell her she must bear up.' "'She must indeed,' I assured her. "'Forrester needs all the sympathy he can get just now.' I could see her peeping over the top of her handkerchief, trying to guess what to make of that, but the sentimental was easy for her. "'That's what I tell her. They'll have to comfort each other. Them poor young things, they'd ought to be together. But Lily's so sensitive she couldn't bear to put herself forward.' "'I'll tell Thorry you called,' I assured her. "'Mrs. Jastrow fanned herself with her damp handkerchief. "'Her poor little pretense broke down under my friendliness. "'He's got to marry her,' she whispered. "'Lily's been talked about, and he's got to.' "'I could guess suddenly what it meant to her "'to have reached up so desperately for something better for her daughter "'than she had been able to manage for herself.' and to come so near not getting it. I was able to put something like sympathy into my voice when I spoke to Forrester at supper. Mrs. Jastrow called today. She says Lily isn't bearing up as she might. I suppose you ought to go and see her. Effie's eyes grew round at me over the teacups, but after all, Forry didn't know what had passed between mother and me in regard to Lily. If I chose to take his relation to her as a matter of course, he couldn't object to it. We heard Forry in his room changing his collar before he went back to the shop again. He'll go to her tonight after he closes up, Effie told me. It will end with her getting him. So long as he doesn't get you. But it was unfair to put ideas like that in Effie's head. After all, it is a very good match for him in some ways. She'll always look up to him, and that is what Forry needs. It was natural to Effie to judge every situation by what it had for those concerned. She wasn't troubled as I was by the pressure of an outside ideal. By the end of a month, when I thought of going back to the city, it was tacitly understood that as soon as convenient Forrester was to marry Lily Jastrow. He meant, however, to be fair with us both about the property. He had given us notes for our share and expected to pay interest. The note wasn't negotiable, as I learned immediately, and the interest wasn't any more than Effie would need for her clothing. I felt that the jaws of destiny, which had opened to let Effie out, had closed on me instead. I returned to Chicago early in November. My place with the Coleman players had long been filled, and there was nothing whatever to do. End of Book 3, Chapter 3「Chapter 4 of A Woman of Genius by Mary Hunter Austin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Book 3, Chapter 4 Jerry's play, which had had its premiere while I was away, was going on successfully. One of the first items of news Sarah told me about him was that his wife was expecting another child, undertaken in the hope that, if she couldn't hold her husband's roving fancy, she could at least fix his attention on her situation. All that she had got out of it so far was a reason for staying at home, which left Jerry the freer to bestow his society where it was most acceptable. "'Does she know? Miss Follett, I mean, about the child?' "'Not unless Jerry has told her, which he'd hardly do.' Sarah laughed a little, and that was not usual with her. She had very little humor." Fancy is so up in the air about the success of the play. She thinks she inspired it. I imagine they'd feel it an indelicacy of Mrs. McDermott to have intruded her condition on their relation. Of course, it is understood that there's nothing really wrong about it. 
It is wrong if his wife is made unhappy by it. I hadn't Sarah's reason for being lenient. Somebody ought to speak to Jerry. You might. He would listen to you. It is just because there is so little in it that it is so hard to deal with. I suppose I took to interfering in the McDermott's affairs because I had so little of my own to interest me. Besides, I was fond of Jerry and didn't see how he was to be helped by getting his family into a muddle. But after all, Sarah reminded me, it is his own wife and his own inspiration. It wasn't in me to tell her, even if I had understood it myself at the time, that the secret of my resentment was that it should be so accepted on all sides that one must choose between them. I wanted, oh, I immensely wanted, what Jerry was getting out of his relation to Miss Follette, but I wanted it free of the implication that my abandonment of my husband to the village dressmaker put me in anything like the same case. The real trouble with you, Jerry told me, is that you are trying to live in Chicago and Taylorville at the same time. Not being able to make any headway with him, I went to call on Miss Follette. I wasn't on terms with her that would admit of an assault on her confidence. I didn't know her well enough to call on her in any case, but I wasn't to be thwarted of good intention by anything so small as a breach of manners in doing it. It wasn't so much the offense of my undertaking it that counted, I found, as Miss Follette's determination not to hear anything that would ruffle the surface of her complacency. I had to drop plumb into my revelation out of the opportunity she made for me in the question as to whether the play would or would not go on the road before Christmas. I should hope so, I dropped squarely on her. Jerry's wife needs him. There's a child coming in April. Yes, said Miss Follette. She was giving me tea, and she poised the second lump over my cup with an inquiring eyebrow. Have you seen what we have done with the second act lately? Anyway, I said to myself as I went, she knows. She can't skid over the facts as she has my telling her. But it was the certainty that, knowing she kept right on with Cherry, that drove me back on Pauline and Henry Mills. I fled to them to be saved from what, in the only other society I had access to, fretted all my finer instincts, to be ricocheted by them again on to that reef of moral squalor upon which the artist and woman in me were riven asunder. What I should have done was to take my courage in my hands and have gone on from Taylorville to New York, but the most I was equal to was a fixed determination to accept anything which would take me nearer Broadway, which even then was to the player world all that the lamp is to the moth. In the meantime I had settled in two housekeeping rooms in a street that I wouldn't have dared to give to a manager as an address, one of those neighborhoods where there are always a great many perambulators and waste paper blowing about. There was never anything for me in the frame of life called bohemian more than a picturesque way of begging the question of poverty. What I looked for in a lodging was escape from the bedraggled professionalism which went on in what were called studios, by means of a cot bed, an oil stove, and a few yards of art muslin. That I hadn't managed it so successfully as I hoped was made plain to me a few days after I had moved in, by the discovery of a card tacked on the opposite door that read, Leon Griffin, the Variete. It was the same theatre at which Cecilia Brune was playing the chief attraction in song and dance. In the glimpses I had of Mr. Griffin, in the dark hall going in and out, I was aware that he gave much the same impression of unprofitable use that was associated in my mind with the shamrocks. All this time I kept going through the motions of looking for an engagement— now and then some shining bubble of opportunity seemed to float toward me, to dissolve in thin air as soon as I put my hand out to it. 
One of these brought me to Klein and Erskine's waiting room on the day that Cecilia Brun elected to register her complaint against what she considered a slight of her turn at the variété. She flounced about more than a little, not to let the rest of us escape the inference that she was not used to being kept waiting. When she had hooked and unhooked her handsome furs for the fourth time, she introduced me to Leon Griffin, who, except for the name, I shouldn't have recognized for my hall neighbor. It was like being slapped in the face with my own hard condition to have him crowded on me in that character before the whole roomful. Life seemed so to have beggared him. In broad day he looked the sort of a man who has failed to sustain himself in the man's world and must reinforce his value with the favor of women. Little touches of effeminacy about his dress failed to take the attention away from its shabbiness. His hair had the traditional thespian curl in spite of being cropped short to allow of various make-ups, one surmised, and his very blue eyes were in a perpetual state of extenuating the meagerness of his other features. Being ashamed of my shame at meeting him there, I began to be very nice to him. Cecilia, in spite of her magnificent raiment, perhaps on account of it, had been disposed to graciousness. She drew us together with a wave of her hand. "'She ought to be doing Ophelia on Broadway,' she introduced me handsomely. "'Wouldn't that get you?' "'I saw you with the Hardings last year,' Griffin assented, almost as though I might think it a liberty. "'Where are you playing now?' He had the stamp of too many reverses on his face not to estimate mine at its proper worth. He had fine instincts, too, for as soon as I told him that I was out of an engagement that season, he put himself on record quite simply. "'My turn goes off next week. I'm trying to get Klein to put it on the circuit.' When we came out of the office together he fell into step with me. One of the young women ahead of us made the shape of a bubble with her hands and blew it from her. Poof, she said. "'There goes another of my chances.' She laughed with a fine courage. "'They all go through with it,' Griffin affirmed. "'There's Eversley.' I have forgotten which of the well-known incidents he related. "'Eversley told me I might come to it. "'What made you think of him?' I demanded. "'I saw his name in the paper. "'He's to play here this winter. "'He's a wonder.' He said wonderful things to me once. I had just recalled them. They'll come true, then. Eversley never makes a mistake. Why, I remember once. He broke off as though he had changed his mind about telling me. I was wondering if I couldn't get rid of him by stopping in at Sarah's when he broke out again suddenly. To think of you being out of an engagement and a girl like Cecilia Brown, yes, I know her name is Brown, Sissy Brown of Milwaukee. I've always suspected it, I admitted, but it is her looks, of course, and the clothes. Cecilia has lovely clothes. Well, so could you if... He checked himself. I don't mean to say anything against a lady. I've always suspected that, too, I admitted, but one doesn't like to say it. Well, you know what she gets. Thirty-five a week. A girl doesn't wear diamond sunbursts on that. Mr. Griffin, I wish you'd tell me what sort of man it is that gives diamond sunbursts to variety girls. I've never seen any of them. You have, probably, but you don't know it. You meet their wives in society. Henry Mills? I don't know what made me say it. The image of him came tripping along the surface of my mind and slid off my tongue, without having more than momentarily perched there. Is he in business downtown, and has he got a perfectly proper family and too many dinners under his vest? Mr. Mill's home life is ideal, but I didn't mean... Neither did I, but that's the type. They mostly have ideal families, but they couldn't live up to them if they didn't have Cecilia Bruns on the side. I beg your pardon. 
He had looked up and caught me blushing a deep, painful red, but it wasn't on account of what he had intimated. I was blushing because of the discovery in myself of needs which, compared to the ideal of life I had set for myself, were as much of a defection as anything our conversation had suggested for Henry Mills. I was conscious in those days of a slow, steady seepage of all my forces toward desperation. "'You'll have to take a company out for yourself,' was Jerry's solution. "'I'll write you a play. I've got a ripping idea. A man with a gift and two women, good women, both of them. That's where I score against the eternal triangle, each of them trying to save him from the other and breaking him between them. Jerry's plays were never anything more than dramatizations of his immediate experience. You and Sarah Croydon, you set each other off. I'll write it for both of you. He walked up and down in my little room with his hands in his pockets and his shining black hair rising like quills. Jerry, how long will it take you to write that play, and how much will it cost to produce it? Ten thousand dollars, he answered to the last question. About eighteen months, if I go right at it. And I've money enough to last me to the end of February. No, to his swift, generous gesture, you have to live eighteen months on yours, and another child coming. I made up my mind that I should have to speak to Pauline and Henry Mills. Greater than any mystery of creative art to me is the mystery by which the recipients of its benefits manage to keep ignorant of its essential processes. I have never been able to figure to myself how Pauline and Henry escaped knowing that the creative mood, the keen hunger of which is more importunate than any need of food or raiment, was to be had for very little more than they spent fattening their souls on its choice products. For it is always to be bought. It is the distinction of genius as against talent, always to know in what far unlikely market the precious commodity is to be bought. How was it that Henry escaped knowing that the appealing femininity which plays so large a part in the success of an actress with an audience of Mills's, is largely the result of having been the object of that solicitous protection which it is supposed to provoke. With what, since it was agreed between Pauline and me that I was not to pay down on that counter what Cecilia and Jerry parted with cheerfully, was I ultimately to pay for it? Now that I had on all sides of me the witness of desperation, I began to be irritated at the way in which, in view of our long friendship, they accepted it for me. As the holiday season approached, without any change in my circumstances other than a steady diminution of my bank account, I came to the conclusion that the only possible move was toward New York, and that I should have to ask Henry to advance me the money for it. In view of what came to me afterward, it was a reasonable proposition, but I reckoned without that extraordinary blankness to the processes of art, which is common to those most entertained by it. It was a day or two after Christmas, from which I had been excused by my recent bereavement, that I went out to dinner there with the determination to bring something to pass commensurate with their usual attitude of high admiration for and confidence in my gift. We had gone into the library after dinner, at least it was a room that went by that name, though I don't know for what reason except that Henry smoked there and the furniture was upholstered in leather, as in Evanston it was indispensable that all library should be. Here and there were touches that suggested that if Henry moved his income up a notch or two, Pauline's taste might not be able to keep pace with it. Henry warmed his back at the gas log and wished to know how things went with me. As well as I could expect them here, I've made up my mind to try for New York as soon as I can manage it. What's the matter with Chicago? Henry's manner implied that whatever you believed about it, you'd have to show him. Well, I'd have to be capitalized to do anything here the same as in New York, and the field there is larger. 
I went on to explain something of what the metropolis had to offer. I guess the worst thing about Chicago is that you're out of a job. People don't get sore on a place where they are doing well. No, they generally light out for a place where there are more jobs. I thought I should get on better if I took Henry in his own key, but he forged ahead of me. If there's anything the matter with your acting, why don't you ask somebody? There's nobody to ask. Besides, there isn't anything the matter with it. The matter is with me. Well, I must say, I don't see the difference. Oh, I cried. I hadn't realized that they wouldn't just take my word for it. It is because I am empty. Empty. I trailed off, seeing how wide I was of his understanding. I shouldn't have questioned Henry Mills's word about the capitalization of a joint stock company. And I resented their discounting my own statement of my difficulties. Pauline got a hold of my hand and patted it. I wondered if it was because all her own crises were complicated with Henry Mills that she always thought that affectionateness was part of the answer. It is only that with all your gift, Henry can't understand how you need anything else, she extenuated. I need food and clothes, I blurted out. Pretty soon I shall need a lodging. Oh, my dear! Pauline was shocked at the indelicacy. I don't know if she didn't understand how poor I was, or if it was only the general notion of the sheltered woman to find in complaint a kind of heresy against the institution by which they are maintained. After all, she caught up with her accustomed moral attitude, there's a kind of nobility in suffering for your art. It's what gives you your spiritual quality. I thought I recognized the phrase as one that was current in the women's clubs of that period. I took hold of my courage desperately. Well, I'm offering you a chance to suffer two thousand dollars worth. Pauline's tack was proof even against that. You comedy child, she laughed indulgently. You're getting ideas, Henry burbled on cheerfully. All these long hairs and highbrows you've been associating with, they've filled you up. That friend of yours, McDermott, somebody had him to the club the other day, talking about the conservation of genius. Nothing in it. Let them work for their money the same as other people, I say. You know you didn't have any money to begin with, Pauline reminded me. I was made to feel at a consideration that she hadn't pressed the point that if I couldn't do again what I had done then, there was something lacking in the application. They must have taken my gesture of despair for surrender. I guess you were just getting it out of your system, Henry surmised comfortably. It was not the first nor the last time that I was to come squarely up against the lay conviction that whatever might be known about the processes of art, it wasn't the artist that knew it. Later, when Henry took me out to the car, he came round to what had been back of the whole conversation. I suppose you could use more money in your business, most of us could, he advised me. But you don't want to let people find it out. There's nothing turns men against a woman so much as to have her always thinking about money. It was a very cold night as I came down the side street to my door, deserted as a country road. The narrow footpath trodden in the pavement looked like the track of desolation. The cold flare of the lamps was smothered in sodden splashes of snow. There had been the feeling of uneasiness in the air that goes before a storm all that forenoon, and in the interval that I had been revaluing a lifelong friendship in terms of what it wouldn't do for me, it had settled down to a heavy, clogging snow. I was startled as I turned in at the entry to find a man behind me. He had come up unsuspected in the soft shuffle and turned in with me. By the light that filtered through the weather-fogged transom, I saw that he was Griffin of the Variete. Now as I fumbled blindly at the latch, he came close to me. "'Beg pardon,' 
He had put out his hand over mine and turned the key for me. My fingers are so cold, I apologized. I turned my face toward him with the stiffness of cold and tears upon it, and there was an answering commiseration in his eyes. I reached out for the key, and he took my hand in his, holding it to his breast with a movement of excluding human kindness. If the gesture was at all theatrical, I did not feel it. I let him hold it there for a moment, before I went in and shut the door. End of Book 3, Chapter 4book three chapter five of a woman of genius by mary hunter austin this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain book three chapter five depression as well as the storm which held on heavily all night and the next day kept me close and the state of my coal bin kept me in bed most of the next day along late in the afternoon I was aroused from a lethargy of cold and crying by Leon Griffin tapping at my door to know how I did. The snow by this time had settled down to a blinding drift, and the thermometer had fallen into an incalculable void of cold. Griffin was in his overcoat as though he had just come in or was just going out, though I learned later he had been sitting in it all day in his room. The impression it created of his being in the act of passing led me to open my door to him, as I otherwise might not have done. A terrible cold blast came in with him, and a clattering of the shutters on the windward wall of the house. Outside the day was falling dusk. There was no light in the room but the square blank of the window, curtained by the sliding screen of snow, and my little stove, which glowed like a carbuncle in its corner. "'You're cozy here,' he put it as an excuse for lingering, for I hadn't asked him to have a chair. "'You hardly feel the wind. On my side there's a trail of snow half across the room where the wind whips it in between the casings. Though he had come ostensibly to offer me a neighborly attention, he was plainly in need of it himself. It was his last night at the Varieté, and between the storm and the depression of having nothing to turn to— he was coming down with a cold. I had him into my one easy chair and suggested tea. I hardly slept any last night, he apologized over his second cup. The shutter clacked so. I could hear it now like the stroke of desolation. That night, when I heard him stamping off the snow in the hall, I had a hot drink for him. But when I saw him by the rakish light of the hall lamp, Wringing his hands with the cold before taking it, I insisted he should come on into my still warm room. I had to turn back first to light my own lamp, and, in respect to my being in my dressing gown with my hair in two braids, to slip into my bedroom and experience, as I looked back at him through the crack in the door, the kind of softening a woman has toward a man she has made comfortable. The light of my lamp which was shaded for reading like a miniature calcium, brought out for me the frayed edge of his overcoat and all the waste and misuse of him, the kind of faded appeal that sort of man has for a woman. Forlorn as he was, as he put the bowl back on the table, I was so much more forlorn myself that I was glad to have been femininely of use to him. Pauline wrote me to come out and stay with her during the protracted cold spell, but owing to the difficulty in delivery, the invitation failed to reach me until the severity of the weather was abated. In any case, I was still too sore at what seemed to me the betrayal of my long confidence to have been willing to have subjected myself to any reminders of it, and whatever kindness Pauline meant, it could hardly have done so much for me as Leon Griffin did by just needing me. It transpired that he had no stove in his room, and the heat from the register for which we were definitely charged in the rent scarcely modified the edge of the cold. For the next two or three days we spent much of the time huddled over my stove. Snow ceased to fall on the second day, and nothing moved in our view except 
Now and then the surface of it was flung up by the wind, falling again fountain-wise into the waste of the untrampled housetops that stretched from my window to the icy flat of the lake darkening under a dour horizon. Somehow, though I had never been willing to confess to my friends how poor I was, I made no bones of it with Griff, as I had heard Cecilia call him, a name that seemed somehow to suit the inconsequential nature of our relation better than his proper title. We frankly pooled our funds in the matter of food, which one or another of us slipped out to buy and cooked on my stove. I took an interest in preparing it, such as I hadn't since the times when I imagined I was helping Tommy on the way to growing rich, and when the room was full of a warm, savory smell, and the table pulled out from the wall to make it serve for two, we felt, for the time, restored to the graciousness of living. We fell back on the uses of domesticity, by association providing us with a sense of life going on in ordinariness and stability. It came out for me in these moments that it is, after all, life that art needs rather than feeling, and that, to a woman of my capacity, was to be supplied not by innocuous intrigues like Jerry's, but by the normal procedure of living. I believe I felt myself rather of a better stripe to find it so in the domestic proceeding, though I do not really know that my necessity was any whit superior to Miss Follette's, except in offering the minimum possibility of making anybody unhappy by it but because I knew my friends would think it ridiculous that I could lay hold of power again by so inconsiderable a handle as Leon Griffin, I suffered a corroding resentment. Griffin was getting up a new act for himself, and evenings, as I helped him with it, I felt a faint stirring of creative power. When he had finished, I would take the shade off the lamp and render scenes for him from my favorite Elizabethan drama, and in the face of his unqualified admiration for me, I could almost act. Toward the end of the week, as the cold abated, Mr. Griffin asked me to see a play in which some of his friends were playing, and Jerry being prodigal of favors, I responded with an invitation to the futurist. I hadn't mentioned Griff to Sarah. I never more than mentioned him to any of my friends but I saw no reason why I should not speak of them to him, especially when they were so much upon the public tongue as Sarah was just then. Croydon, he said, isn't that an unusual name? He appeared to be puzzling over it. I seem to remember a town somewhere by that name. In New York, I told him. I was on the point of telling him how Sarah came by it, but an impulse of discretion saved me. I had seen the futurist so many times now that, once at the theatre, I occupied myself with looking at the audience and took no sort of notice of my escort until after Sarah's entrance near the close of the first act. Well, I laid myself open to compliments for my friend. I was startled by what I saw when I looked at him. He had shrunk away into the corner of his seat farthest from me, like a man whose garment had fallen from an unawares. The stark, naked soul of him fed visibly upon her bodily perfection. Sarah's beauty took men like that sometimes, when they were able to see it. There were those who thought her merely nice-looking. I could see his tongue moving about stealthily to wet his dry lips. I couldn't bear to look at him like that. It seemed a pitiful thing for a man to ache so with the beauty of a woman he had long ceased to deserve. It was as though he had laid bare some secret ache in me. Coming out of the theatre, he surprised me with the knowledge of Sarah's affairs. He knew that she had begun with O'Farrell. I played with him myself, he admitted. That was before Miss... M Miss... Croydon, I supplied. That was the town she came from. I shouldn't have told you except that you seem to know. I was expecting another name. Wasn't she, wasn't she married once, a fellow by the name of Lawrence? Oh, well, you may call it married. He was a cur. You can't tell me anything about him worse than I know myself. From the earnestness of his tone, I judged that he had suffered something at the hands of Lawrence. 
but I'll save this for him. He didn't stay with the other woman. She followed him and found him, but he wouldn't stay with her. I don't see that that proves anything except that he was the greater scoundrel. The other woman was his wife. It proves that he loved Miss Croydon best, that he couldn't bear the other woman after her. I thought it was no use matching ethical ideals with him, and I let the matter drop. It came back to me next day that if he had been with O'Farrell in Lawrence's time, he might have known something of the other shamrocks. I meant to ask him about it in the morning, but put it off as I observed that the recollection of it seemed to have stirred him past the point of being able to sleep. He was pale in the morning, and the rings under his eyes stood out plainly. He had the whipped look of a man who has been so long accused of misdemeanor that he comes at last to believe he has done it. I could see the impulse to confess hovering over him, and the hope that I might find in his misbehaviors the excusing clue which he was vaguely aware must be there but couldn't himself lay hands on. I suppose souls in the pit must have movements like that, seeking in one another the extenuations they can admit to themselves. We didn't, however, strike the note of confidence until it was evening. Griffin kept up the form of looking for an engagement, which occupied his morning hours, and in the afternoon Jerry came in to see how I had come through the cold spell, and to win my interest with his wife to consent to his going as far as St. Louis with the futurist. I forget what reasons he had for thinking it advisable, except that they were all more or less complicated with Miss Follette. But heavens, Jerry, haven't you ever heard of the Freemasonry of women? How can you think my sympathies wouldn't be with your wife, especially in her condition? It's only for a week, and, you know, except for her fussing, she is perfectly well. And look here, Olivia, you know exactly why I have to have other things, why I can't just settle down to being the plain head of the family. His tone was accusing. I know why you think you have to. Honest, Jerry, is it so imperative as all that? Honest to God, Olivia, unless I'm interested, I can't write a word. His glance traveling over my dull little room and makeshift furniture, the cheap kerosene lamp, the broken hinge of the stove. You ought to know, he drove it home to me. I felt myself involved by my toleration of Griffin in a queer kind of complicity. What do you want me to do? Tell her you think it is to the advantage of the play for me to be there in St. Louis for the opening. It's always good for an interview, and that's advertising. After all, I suppose I wouldn't have done it if I hadn't found his wife in a wrapper at four o'clock in the afternoon when I went out there. If she wouldn't make any better fight for herself, who was I to fight for her? And, as Jerry said, for him to be with the play meant advertising. I talked it over with Griffin that evening, as we sat humped over my tiny stove before the lamps were lighted. Outside we could see the roofs huddling together with the cold, and far beyond, the thin line of the lake beaten white with the wind in a fury of self-tormenting. It made me think of poor little Mrs. Gerald under the lash of her husband's vagaries. I can't help think that she'd feel it less if she made less fuss about it, I protested. Griffin shook his head. It's a mercy she can do that. It's when you can't do anything it eats into you. I reflected. There was a woman I knew who looked like that, O'Farrell's leading lady. She was jealous, and there was nothing she could do. She looked not upon. Miss Dean, you mean. I forgot you said that you knew her. I wanted immensely to know how we came to be mixed up with her. She was jealous of me, but there was no cause. How well did you know her? I... she... I was married to her. His face was mottled with embarrassment. It occurred to me that his confusion must have been for his complicity in the fact of their not being married now, but he set me right. 
I oughtn't to have told it on her, I suppose. She married me to go on the stage. I was boarding at her mother's, and I couldn't have afforded to marry unless she had. You don't know how handsome she was. I knew she couldn't act. I can't myself, but I know it when I see it. Her father had been an actor of a sort. He had taught her things, and I thought I could pull her along. She has got on. I let the fact stand for all it was worth. Yes, she had something almost as good as acting. She could get hold of people. She had O'Farrell. Was it on his account you separated? Long before that. You see, she could handle the managers in her own interest, but she didn't know what to do with me. So I, I got out of her way. Griffin's clothes were too loose for him, and his hair, which wanted trimming, disposed itself in what came perilously near to being ringlets, accentuating the effect of his having been shriveled and shrunk within the mark of his capacity. There was a certain shame about him as he made this admission that made me feel that though to leave his wife free to seek her own sort of success had been a generous thing to do, it was all he could do. His moral nature had suffered an incurable strain. Griff, did they tell you when you were young that love was all bound up with what you should do in the world and what you could get for it? They never told me anything. I had to find it out. Jerry, too. He thought he was going to have a graceful, docile creature to keep him in a perpetual state of maleness. I should have thought you'd have left the stage after that, I said, reverting to the personal instance. I ought to have, but somehow I kept feeling her. Even when I wasn't thinking of her, I could feel her somewhere pulling me. It was like living in the house where someone has died, and you keep thinking they're just in the next room, and you don't want to go away for fear you'll lose them altogether. I understand. The afternoon light had withdrawn into the bleak sky without illuminating it. I threw open the stove for the sake of the ruddy light, and the intimacy of our sitting there drew me on to counter-confession. It's like that with me all the time, I said, only there hasn't really been anybody. Sarah says there doesn't have to be anybody, that we only think so because we have felt it that way once. She thinks it is just personality, whatever there is that we act to. Well, I know you have to have it, any way you can get it. O'Farrell used to call it feeling your job. I wonder where he is now. So the talk drifted off to the perpetual professionalism of the unsuccessful, to incidents of rehearsals and engagements. I believe it would have been good for me to have run my mind in new pastures, but there was nobody to open the gates for me. I said as much to Sarah the very next time I saw her. It seemed a way of getting at what I hadn't yet told her, that I was within a week or two of the end of my means. I had the best of reasons for not calling my case to her attention, in the readiness with which she offered herself to my necessity. You must go to New York, of course. I've three hundred dollars, and I could send you something every month. I cut her off absolutely. I'd rather try Cecilia Brune's plan first, I assured her. Not while you have me. She was firm with me. Besides, you don't really know that Cecilia didn't buy her diamond sunburst on thirty-five a week. I told her all that Griffin had said. Sarah looked worried. I'll tell you about the diamonds. About a year ago, while you were with the Hardings, she got into trouble. Oh, she loved him as much as she was able. He gave her the diamonds, but Cecilia cared. And then, when the trouble came, he deserted her. That's what Cecilia couldn't understand. She had never given anything before, and she didn't realize that that had been her chief advantage. It gave her a scare. But in spite of Sarah's confidence in Cecilia's bitter experience keeping her straight, I could see that she had taken what Griffin had told me to heart. 
A day or two later, she referred to the matter again. If she goes over the line once and doesn't have to pay for it, she is lost. She was standing at my window looking out over the roofs and chimneys cased in ice, and she might, for all the mark her profession has left on her, been looking across the pasture bars. I was irritated at her detachment and her interest in the face of my own problem in an affair so unrelated as Cecilia Brune's. Why do you care so much? You'd care, too, if you had seen as much of her. It's like watching a drowning man. You don't stop to ask if he's worth it before you plunge in. I can't swim myself, I protested. I didn't want to be dragged in rescuing Cecilia. I had myself to save and wasn't sure I could do it. It was after this talk, however, that Griff, who still hung about the variete from habit, told me that Sarah had fallen into the way of stopping to pick up Cecilia on her way home from her own theatre. He thought it a futile performance. Nothing can stop that kind. They don't always know it, but that's what draws them to the stage in the first place. It's a kind of, what do you call it, going back to the thing they were a long time ago? Atavism, I supplied. I thought it very likely. All the centuries of bringing women up to be toys must have had its fruit somehow. Cecilia was made to be played with. She wasn't serviceable for anything else. And what was more, I didn't care to be identified with her, even in the Christian attitude of a rescuer. I said as much to Sarah one evening about a week later, when I had gone with Jerry to give my opinion of some changes in the cast, preparatory to going on the road with his play, and in the overflow of his satisfaction at the way the audience rose to them, he had asked me to go to supper with him. Then, as Sarah joined us and the spirit of the crowd caught him, pouring along the street, bright almost as by day, and with the added brightness of evening garments, Jerry, always open to the infection of the holiday mood, proposed that for once we stretch a point by going to supper at Reeves. Sarah and I demurred as women will at such a proposal from a man whose family exigencies are known to them, but Sarah found a prohibitory objection in a promise she professed to have made to go around for Cecilia on her way home, which Jerry promptly quashed by including her in the invitation. I protested. Supper at Reeves is quite enough of an adventure for one time. Cecilia paints. Not really, Sarah protested. It's only that she uses so little makeup that she doesn't think it necessary to take it off. All the better, insisted Jerry. I never did take supper at Reeves with a painted lady, and I'm told it is quite one of the things to do. I let it pass rather than spoil his high mood. It was not more than three blocks to the variete, and at the stage door Sarah insisted on getting out herself. Why did you let her? I protested to Jerry. Because it will please her, and Miss Brune will be gone. Sarah doesn't realize how late we are. I could see her returning through the fogged glass of the stage door. Cecilia is gone. The man said she was going to Reeves, too. We can pick her up there. Oh, I objected. I can stand Cecilia, but I draw the line at her gentleman friends. She didn't go there alone, I fancy. We'll have a look at him anyway before we give him the glad hand, Jerry temporized. The cab discharged us into the press of black-coated men and bright-gowned women that at that hour poured steadily into the anteroom of Reeves, which was level with the pavement, divided from it by a screen of plate glass and palms. Beyond that and raised by a few steps was the palm room, flanked on either side by dressing rooms, and opening out back, the great revolving doors, muffled with crimson curtains, that received the guests and sorted them like a hopper, according to the degree of their resistance to the particular allurements of Reeves. There was a sleek, satin-suited attendant who swung the leaves of the door at just the right angle that inducted you to the public café, or to the corridor that led to private rooms, and was famed never to have made a mistake. 
Jerry dared us hilariously as we went up the steps to put his discrimination to the test. You and I alone, then. Olivia's black dress would give us away, Sarah insisted. I want you to stay here and watch for Cecilia, she whispered to me. I must see her. I must. Her going on with Jerry would give her an opportunity to look through the café. If Cecilia hadn't already arrived, I would be sure to see her come in with the crowd that broke against the bank of palms into two streams of bright and dark, proceeding to the dressing rooms and returning by twos and threes to be swallowed up by the hopper, turning half unseen behind its velvet curtains. I slipped behind a group of bright-gowned women waiting for their escorts under the palms. I was hypnotized by the movement and the glitter. I believe I forgot what I was looking for, and all at once she was before me. The theatrical quality of Cecilia's prettiness and the length of her plumes would have picked her out anywhere, even without the blackened rim of the eyelids and the air she had always of having just stepped into the spotlight. She had stationed herself with her professional instinct for effect, just under the Australian fern tree, waiting for her escort, and in the moment it took me to gather myself together, he joined her. He had come up behind Cecilia and was brought face to face with him. It wasn't until he had wheeled into step with her that he saw me, and his face went mottled all at once and settled to a slow purple. Cecilia was magnificent. "'Oh, you here! How de do?' She slipped her hand under her escort's arm and sailed out with him. I caught the glint of the brass-bound door under the curtains. I don't know how long I stood staring before I started after her, to be met by the leaves of the revolving door which, reversing its motion, projected Sarah and Jerry into the palm-room beside me. "'I've been all over the café,' Sarah began. "'Didn't you meet her?' In the café, I was just telling you. No, no, in the corridor just now, they went through. But they couldn't, urged Sarah. I was standing at the door of the café with Jerry. The truth of the situation began to dawn on her. There's such a crowd, of course you missed her. Jerry began to build up a probability by which we could sustain Sarah through the supper which followed. We all of us talked a great deal, as people will, when they are anxious not to talk of a particular thing. When we were in the dressing room again, putting on our wraps, Sarah turned on me. She wasn't in the café at all, she declared. I never said she was. I said she went through into the corridor. In the silence I could feel Cecilia dropping into the pit. Did you know the man? I nodded. It was Henry Mills. End of Book 3, Chapter 5book three chapter six of a woman of genius by mary hunter austin this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain book three chapter six before i had an opportunity to talk the incident over with sarah she had seen cecilia she is perfectly furious with you she reported she hasn't heard from Mr. Mills since, and she thinks it is on your account that you have taken steps for breaking it off. Well, if she admits there was something to break off. I tell you, Sarah, you are fretting yourself to no purpose. The girl had been there before. I'm afraid so. Sarah's taking it so much to heart was a credit to her, but I was more curious than commiserating. Tell me, what is in the mind of a girl when she does things like that? What does she get out of it? Excitement, of course. The sense of being in the stir, and the feeling of being protected. She says Mr. Mills has been kind to her. It is odd, but she seems to think it is all right so long as it is going on. It is only when it is broken off she can't bear it. That is why she is so angry at you. There might be something in that, I conceded. When it is broken off, she is able to realize how cheap and temporary it has been. 
while it is going on she can justify it on the ground that it is going on forever that would justify it i suppose i did not know how i knew this but lately i had discovered in myself capacities for understanding a great many things of which i had had no experience what concerned me was not cecilia's relation to the incident whatever am i going to do about going there again to pauline's i mean you can't tell and i can't go there and not tell i've got to choose between deceiving pauline and condoning henry and i've no disposition to do either sarah thought it over there is only one thing you can do you'll simply have to go to new york for a great many reasons besides you needn't tell me that but how how you know what i offered what i refused it is out of the question don't speak of it i suppose after this you couldn't ask the millses sarah i did ask well all her interest hung upon the interrogation they told me it was good for my spiritual development to suffer these things we faced one another in deep unsmiling irony sarah what do you suppose it costs a man for supper and a private room at reeves don't she begged it's only a step from that to cecilia yes i remember she said that men never afforded protection to women except for value received you must go to new york sarah reiterated you must the truth was i had never told sarah exactly how poor i was in the end i let her go away without telling at the worst i thought i might borrow from jerry who had given up the notion of going to st louis largely no doubt because i had failed to back him up in it completely and then just at the end changed his mind and went anyway i knew nothing about it until jerry wrote me from springfield for i had grown shy of going there where all mrs mcdermott's conversation was set like a trap to catch me in something that would convict jerry of misdemeanor jerry asked me to visit her in his absence but i put it off as long as possible i had to settle first about going to pauline's i arranged to spend the afternoon there meaning to come away before dinner and so by leaving henry to discover my attitude in the circumstance of my having been there without destroying his home open the way to my meeting him again without embarrassment to do that i should have left the house before the persuasive smell of the dinner began to creep up the stairs into the warm softly lighted rooms but from the beginning of my visit pauline in order that i might not feel her failure to put her affection more cogently had wound me about as with a cocoon of feminine devices from which i hadn't been able to extricate myself earlier i am not blaming her i am not sure indeed seeing how completely she justified herself to henry mills by what she had to offer that i had any right to expect her to understand how completely her playful and charming affectionateness failed of any possible use to me but i felt myself so far helpless in the presence of it that i stayed on until the smell of the roast unloosened all the joints of my resolution i hadn't realized how hungry i was until i found myself at a point where what henry might think of me became inconsiderable before the possibility of my being put out of the house before dinner was served at the same time i could have wept at the indignity of wanting food so much i remember to this day the wasteful heaping of the children's plates and my struggle with the oblique desire to smuggle portions of my helping home to griff who looked even more of a stranger than i to soup and fish and roast to say nothing of dessert it wasn't until we had got as far as the salad that i had leisure to observe henry grow rather red about the gills as he fed and speculate as to how far it was due to his consciousness that i could bring down the pillars of his home with the word and didn't intend to there was nothing said during dinner about my prospects or the stage in general 
but when Henry took me out to the car about nine o'clock, he cleared his throat several times as though to drag the subject up from the pit of his stomach, where it must have lain very uneasily. "'You know,' he began, "'I've been thinking about that scheme of yours of going to New York. I am inclined to think there is something in it. I haven't thought about it for a long time.' I told him, which was only true in so far as I thought of it as a possibility. It would freshen you up a whole lot, Henry insisted. Everybody needs freshening. I have been taking a little stir about myself. So that was the way he wished me to think of his relation to Cecilia. I've given it up, I insisted. We were standing under the swinging arc light in a bare patch the wind had cleared of the fine white February grit. Little trails of it blew up underfoot and were lost among the wind-shaken shadows. I could see Henry's purpose bearing down on me like the far spark of the approaching trolley. I wouldn't do that, he advised. It looks like pretty good business to me. You'd have to stay there some time to learn the ropes and if a few hundred dollars. I've given it up, I said again. The car came alongside, and Henry helped me on to it. If you were at any time to reconsider it, I hope you will let me know. The roar of the trolley cut him off. I knew I was a fool not to have accepted the sopped to my discretion. I don't know for what the powers had delivered Henry Mills into my hands, if it wasn't to get out of his folly what his sober sense refused me. Without doubt there are some forms of integrity that, persisted in, cease to be a virtue and become merely a habit. I could no more have taken Henry Mills's money than I could have gone to New York without it. I went home shivering to my fireless little room. I put on my nightgown over my underwear and my dressing gown over that, and cried myself to sleep. It was a day or two later that I recalled that Jerry had asked me to go out and see his wife, and I thought if I must ask Jerry for help, it would be no more than prudent for me to do so. But I wasn't in the least prepared as I went up the path, from which the snow of the week before had never been cleared, to find the house shut and barred, and no smoke issuing from it. I made my way around to the kitchen door to try to discover some sign which would give me a clue to the length of time it had been deserted, if not the reason for it. While I was puzzling about among the empty milk bottles and garbage cans, a neighbor woman put her head out of a nearby window and announced the obvious fact that Mrs. McDermott wasn't in. But in her condition, I protested, as though my informant had been in some way responsible for it. Well, if her own mother's isn't the best place for a woman in her condition. Three days ago, she answered to my second question. Mrs. McDermott's mother lived in Peoria, and I knew that when Jerry left there had been no such understanding. But as lingering there ankle-deep in the dry snow didn't seem to clear the affair— I undertook to rid myself of a sense of blame by writing all that I knew of it to Jerry within the hour. It was the third day after that he came storming in on me like a man demented. He had been to Prioria immediately on receipt of my letter, and his wife had refused to see him. It hardly seemed a time for indirection. "'Jerry, what have you done?' I demanded. "'Nothing. Not a thing.' I waited. There was a fool skit in one of the St. Louis papers, he admitted. The fool reporter didn't know I was married. It was about you and Miss Follette? He nodded. She had bought all the St. Louis papers, he said, meeting his wife. Well, that was natural. She wanted to read the notices. She was always proud of you. She believed them, too, he groaned and she's talked her mother over. They wouldn't even let me see the children. He put his head down on my table and sobbed aloud. I thought it might be good for him, but by and by my sensibilities got the better of me. Would it do any good if I were to write? You, 
Oh, they think you're in it. A kind of general conspiracy. You know you said that, that one of the things nobody had a right to deny an artist was the source of his inspiration. Jerry, I said what you asked me. I was properly indignant, too, when I had been so right on the whole matter. Besides, as Jerry had written little that winter except some inconsiderable additions to his play, I was rather of the opinion that he measured the validity of his passion by its importunity rather than its effect on the sum of his production. Besides, I told you, you would never get your wife to understand. If she would only be sensible, he groaned. She isn't, I reminded him. You didn't marry her to be sensible, but for her imagined capacity to go on repeating the tricks by which Miss Follette keeps you complacent with yourself. The trouble is, marriage and having children take that out of a woman. An artist ought never to marry. I will always say that. I began to wonder if that were true, if Cecilia Brune were not, after all, the wiser. We beat back and forth on the subject for the time that I kept Jerry with me. The evening of the second day came a telegram. Jealousy, tearing at the heart of poor little Mrs. McDermott, had torn away the young life that nestled there. Jerry wrote me later that the baby had breathed and died, and that his wife was likely to be ill a long time. In view of the extra expense incurred, I didn't feel that I ought to ask him for the loan I was now so desperately in need of. It was about this time that Griffin and I began to avoid one another about mealtime. I have read how wild animals in sickness turn their backs on one another. One must in unrelievable misery. We dodged in and out of our hall rooms like rabbits in a warren, and then suddenly we would meet and walk along the streets together, mostly at night when the alternate flare of the lamps and the darkness and the hurrying half-seen forms numbed the sense like the flicker of light on a hypnotist's screen, and we moved in a strange, incommunicable world out of which no help reached us. We saw women go by with the price of our redemption flashing at their breasts or in their hair. We saw men hurried, overburdened with work, and there was no work for us. In our own land we were exiled from the community of labor, and we sighed for it more than the meanest Siberian prisoner for home. And then suddenly communication seemed to be re-established. Effie, for no reason, sent me half of the rent money. I don't need it here, and I think maybe I shall get more out of it by investing it in you, she wrote. She had always such a way of making the thing she did seem the choice of her soul. I bought meat and vegetables and invited Griff to dinner. He took me that night to that sort of dreary entertainment known as musical comedy. He could often get tickets, and it was a way of spending the evening that saved fuel. As we tramped back through the chill, trying for an effect of jocularity in his voice— so that he might seem to have made a joke in case I shouldn't like, Griff said to me, I suppose you wouldn't go with the musical comedy. My dear Griff, I answered him in the same tone, I'd go with a flying trapeze if only it paid enough. I'm acquainted with Blow, the tenor. I've been thinking I'd ask him, we were as shy of speaking of an engagement as though it were wild game to be scared away by the mere mention of it. There was no reason why Griffin shouldn't have succeeded in musical comedy. He had a fairish voice and had turned his gift as many times as the minister's wife in Hickleston used to turn her black silk. It was not more than two days or three after that, as I was coming back to my cold room in the twilight, I had spent the day in the public library on account of the heat, and as I was fumbling at the lock, as I had been that first evening he had spoken to me, I heard Leon Griffin come up the stair three steps at a time, and I knew before I heard it in his voice that the times had turned for him. I struck out fiercely against a sudden blankness that seemed to swim up to the eyes and throat of me. 
He was trembling, too, as he came into the room. Olive, he cried. Olive, I've turned the trick. I'm going with the flimflams. That was the wretched piece we had seen together. He had never called me by my name before, and I had no mind to correct him. In the dusk he ran on about his engagement. They would go on their own presently and settle for the summer in some city. I heard him speak far from me. I was down, down in the pit of the cold room with the shabby furniture and the bleak light that disdained it from the one high window. "'Don't take off your things,' I heard him say. "'I came to get you. We'll have a blowout somewhere.' "'Olive! Olive!' His quick sympathy came out and the excusing charm. "'Oh, my dear, you're crying. "'Griff, you're leaving me.' It was as if I had accused him. I sank down in a chair. I was dabbling at my eyes and trying to get my veil off with cold fingers. Not if you feel that way about it. He came and put his arms about me and constrained me until I leaned against his body. I knew what he was, what a man of that stamp must be feeling and thinking, and knowing I permitted it. I was crying still, I think, his hands came fumbling under my veil. Presently, he kissed me. Olivia? Well, Griff, you know, it is for you to say if I shall leave you. You mean that you will give up? But how can you, Griff? It is the only thing that's been offered. We were sitting still on the low cot in my room, and there was no light but the dull glow of the stove and the last trace of the day that came in at the window. We had not been out to dinner yet, and Griffin's arm was around me. I could feel it slack a little now, as if he definitely forbore to constrain me. I mean, Lo could get you a place in the chorus. But Griff, I can't sing. You can sing enough for that, and Lo would get you the place if, if he belonged to me. I knew exactly what this implied— but no start responded to it. The nerve of propriety was ached out. Of course I know I'm not in your class, Griff was going on. I wouldn't do such a thing as ask you to marry me, but I'm awfully fond of you, and you're up against it. Yes, Griff, I'm up against it. Your fine friends, what would they do for you? Nothing, whatever. Well, then... You needn't go under your own name, and this is a chance. You could live and maybe get somewhere. Lowe told me he meant to strike for Broadway. You aren't insulted, are you? No, I'm not insulted. Curiously, that was true. I was drunk and shaking inside of me. I seemed to be poised upon the dizzying edge, but I was neither angry nor insulted. And I'd never come back on you if you got your chance for yourself. Honest to God, Olive, I've had my lesson at that. You believe me, don't you? I believed him. I hadn't any sense whatever of the moral values of the situation. It was too desperate for that. I guess I ought to tell you I'm a bad sort, bad with women. After I knew that my, that Miss Dean didn't want me, I didn't care what became of me. There was a woman in the company she liked me, and I thought it would give Laura a chance. That was what the divorce was about. I thought I could make it up to the other woman by marrying her, but that didn't work either. He was silent a while, forgetting perhaps that he had begun to explain himself to me. There's a way you've got to like a person to live with them. And anyway, I'm not asking you to marry me. He got as much satisfaction out of that as if it were a superior abnegation. You've got to decide right away, Griffin urged me. I must have a day to think, I insisted, not because I hoped that anything would interfere between me and disaster, but I wanted to be able to throw it up to the powers that I had given them an opportunity. I knew what he was. I had always known. When he put his cheek against mine to kiss me, I had felt the marks there of waste and looseness, just as I felt now 
that native trick he had for extenuation, for putting himself on the pathetic, the excusing side of things. But I did not shrink from him. I suppose it was because just then he was a symbol of the protection which I had so signally gone without. The need of trusting is stronger in women than experience. Nothing saved me but the persistent monitor of my art. Here, when all else was numb by loneliness and hunger and unsuccess, it waked and warned me. I had not drawn back from Griffin, nor the relation he proposed to me. But I couldn't stand for flimflam. I think just at first, though, I made myself believe I was considering it. I went out to see Pauline the next afternoon, not that I expected anything from her. It was merely that she represented all that stood opposed to what I was being coerced into, and I meant to give it a chance. I am thinking of going with flimflam, I told her. Oh, but my dear, surely not with that. I'll get eighteen dollars a week and my expenses. Well, of course, if you want to sell yourself just for a salary. Pauline's attitude could not have been improved on if she had known all that the engagement implied, but it wasn't in her to be ungracious for long. I suppose you'll get experience. I'll get my board and clothes out of it, I told her bluntly, and whether I like it or not, it is the only thing offered. And you're just taking it on trust. I suppose that is the right way. You can never tell how things will be brought about. I don't know how much of this was honest and how much derived from the capacity for self-deception which grows on women whose sole business in life is getting on with a man. At any rate, having shaken my situation around to the shape of a moral attitude, as a robin does a worm, nothing would have prevented her from swallowing it whole. Vange as I was, I refused her invitation to dinner. With what I had in mind to do, I didn't care to meet Henry Mills again. I was fiercer in my detestation of him and Cecilia than I had been before I had thought of being in the same case myself. I resented them as a ribald commentary on my necessity. As I rode home on the car, all my outer self was in a tumult, dazed and buzzing like a hive. I was dimly aware of moving, sitting upright, of paying my fare, and of great staring red posters that flashed upon me from the billboards. I remember that it occurred to me several times that if I could only understand what I read on them, it might be greatly to my profit. Somewhere, deep under my confusion, I was aware of being plucked by the fringes of my consciousness. Something was trying to get through to me. I refused to see Griffin at all that evening, and got into bed early, staring into the dark and seeing nothing but fragments of red letters that seemed about to shape themselves into the saving word, and then dissolved and left me blank. I tried to pray and realized that I had no connecting wires over which help might come. Belief in the God I had been brought up to had been beaten out of me at Hickleston very largely by the conviction of those who professed to know him best, that he couldn't in any case be the god of my gift. And I hadn't been thinking since then of the something without us to which I acted as deity. Now it occurred to me, lying there in the dark, that if the god of the church had cast me off, there must still be something which artists everywhere prayed to, a distributor of gifts, who might be concerned about the conduct of his worshippers. I reached out for him, and I did not know his name. I must pray, though. I must pray to something which stood for help. Slowly, as I cast back in my mind to find the name for it, I remembered Eversley. Eversley was everything which any player might wish to be, and Eversley had been kind. I would pray to Eversley, all at once there flashed across the blank of my mind his name in letters of red. That was it. That was the name on the billboards. Eversley was in town. I recall that Griff had spoken of it. 
I hadn't been able to spare a penny for a paper for a long time, or I should have known it. I would see Eversley. I got up and groped around in the cupboard for a piece of dry bread and ate it. Then I went back to bed and dropped asleep suddenly with the release of tension. Tomorrow I would see Eversley. Griffin failed to understand my change of mood in the morning. You aren't afraid that I shall try to hold you? No, I'm not afraid. Or that anybody will find it out? I shouldn't care if they did, I told him. I'm going to see Eversley. I suppose it's fair to tell you you'll be the last resort, Griff. I'll be the foundation of your fortune if Eversley will let me. But he won't. I think there was regret in his voice, but it was never in anything he said to me. I know you're not mean, Griff. That's why I told you. Oh, I'll tell you, too. I was mean once. I didn't mean to be, but it turned out that way. He was on the point of admitting something to me that I felt if I was to depend upon him, I shouldn't hear. I got out as early as possible and walked until I found a billboard. Eversley was at the playhouse. He had been playing here for three days. I walked past it several times, considering the possibility of getting his address from the stage doorman, though I knew I couldn't. It was clear and bright. Few people moved in the street. I walked between the alleyways in a row of ash cans, waiting for the belated carts of the cleaners. Eversley! Eversley! I called over and over as if it had been a charm. Suddenly, in the still cold brightness, a torn fragment of newspaper flapped in the ash can. It lifted and made a clumsy flight like a half-fledged bird and dropped beside me. Its one torn wing flapped gently as I passed it and showed me part of a pictured face. I said to myself that I was in a pretty state when even a torn face in a paper looked like Eversley. I had gone on three steps, and suddenly I stopped. It was Eversley, of course. His picture would be in the papers. I went back and lifted the printed scrap. It was part of an interview with the great tragedian, three days old, and it told me the address of his hotel. It was nearly eleven when I arrived there. The foyer was crowded with people, among whom I fancied I recognized several of my profession. They had the same desperate air that I knew must stand out on me. I thought the clerk recognized it. Mr. Eversley is not in this morning, I was told. They pretended to not to know when he would be in. I understood that this meant that he was in, but probably asleep or breakfasting. I found a chair close to one of the elevators and waited. The room was warm and I was faint. I do not know how long I sat there. I must have been almost unconscious. Suddenly I snapped alert. There was Eversley and two or three others stepping into the elevator on the opposite side of the room. I was too late, of course, to catch them. Mr. Eversley's apartments, I said to the elevator boy. First turn to the left, he told me when he had let me out on the fourth floor. I was afraid to ask the number of the room lest he should suspect me of intruding. There were five or six doors down the left corridor. I knocked at one at a hazard and was rejected by a large woman in Dezabille. I was discouraged. Somehow the prospect of knocking at every one of those doors and inquiring for Mr. Eversley daunted me. I was dividing between my dread of that and a still greater dread, if I should be found loitering too long in the corridor, of being taken for a suspicious person. In a few moments, however, a woman came out of one of the doors farthest down and moved toward me. I thought it was she I had seen getting into the elevator with Mr. Eversley. She had the gracious air of women who know themselves relied upon. She stopped, hypnotized by my evident wish to speak to her. Mrs. Eversley? She acknowledged it. I am trying to find your husband. I have his permission. I interpolated as I saw her pleasant, open countenance close upon me. 
I learned afterward how much of her life went to saving him the strain of publicity, and I did not blame her. My husband never sees visitors in the morning. If you would show him this card, I begged, perhaps he would make an appointment. She recognized the writing on the card, and I saw her relenting. Mr. Eversley, it proved, would see me. He pretended kindly to have recognized me at once, but he didn't ask after the Hardings. He saw that it was the last lap with me. My dear Miss Lattimore, sit here. Now tell me. So, I concluded at the end of half an hour, I thought you could tell me if it is all gone. If I am never to have it back again, I can go with a musical comedy. I hadn't told him, of course, what the conditions were of my having even that. But if you think it could be brought back again, I could hardly formulate a hope beyond that. Never, in the old way, he answered promptly. You wouldn't wish that. What you did at twenty you must not wish to do at thirty, for then there is no growth. What do you really feel about it? I feel, I said, as if I could do something, something pressing to be done, but somehow different, so different that I do not know how to describe it to anybody, nor to get them to believe in it. And so you have begun to doubt it yourself. I shall believe you, I said. He sat there after that for a while, staring into the open fire and rubbing his fine, expressive hands together in a meditative way. It was good to me to see him, just touched mellowly with age, the delicate carving in his face of nobility and gentleness. There were men like that then, men who made their mere being something more than a shibboleth of the traditional dependability. He seemed to be far away from me, groping around the root of truth in respect to that gift with which he was so richly endowed. He rose presently and took a playbook which lay face downward on the table. "'Could you do a bit of this with me?' he suggested. "'It will help me get my lines.' The play was Magda, new then on the American stage. Eversley was getting up the part of Colonel Schwartz. He explained the story to me a little, and I began reading and prompting him. Presently I felt the familiar click of myself sliding into the part." All my winter in Chicago rose up in the part of Magda to protest against the judgment of Taylorville. I knew better, too, than to attempt any sort of staginess with Eversley. I said the words, trying to understand them, and let the part have its way with me. It was not until we had laid down the book that I remembered I was still waiting judgment, and did not feel to want it. I won't take up any more of your time. I suggested. You've been very good to me. I got up to go. After all, what was there that Eversley could do for me? Well, he said, and is it to be musical comedy? No, I told him. No, it may be starvation or the lake, but I'll not let myself down like that. Was that why you asked me to do the part? I said after a while, in which he had sat gazing into the fire without taking any note of my standing. Sit down, he said. Have you ever heard of Polactkin? I shook my head and sat provisionally on the edge of my chair. Polatkin is a speculator. He speculates in ability. I think, on the whole, the best thing I can do for you is to introduce you to Polatkin. Mr. Eversley thought of Morris Polatkin because he had met him the day before in Chicago. Before I left the hotel, it was arranged that I was to see him the next day, and if he liked me, by the tone in which Mark Eversley spoke of him I knew that was foregone, he would take me on to New York with him and put my gift on a paying basis. So suddenly had the release from strain come that I found myself toppling over my own resistance. I went out in the street and walked about until reminded by the gnawing in my stomach that I had had nothing but the brewing of my twice-boiled coffee grounds for breakfast. I turned into the first attractive café and paid out almost my last cent for a comforting luncheon. 
It would have gone farther if I had bought food and cooked it at home, but I was past that. I had pinched and endured to the last pitch. I could no more. And besides the assurance of Mark Eversley, which as yet I could scarcely believe in, there had come a strange new courage upon me. For, as I had suffered and struggled with Magda, suddenly from some high unknowable source, power descended. I had felt it fluttering low like a dove, hovering over me. It had perched upon my spirit. I could feel it there now, brooding about me with singing noises. It had come back. I rushed to meet it as to a lover. As I walked back to my lodging, a flood of hopes, half shapes of conquests and surmises, bore me like a widening flood apart from all that the last few months stood for. Suddenly at the door I realized how far it had carried me from Griffin. The figure of him was faint in my mind, as one seen from the farther shore. I considered a little, and then I wrote him a note and slipped it under the door. I went out again, and walked aimlessly all the rest of the afternoon, and when it was dark I stole softly up to my room again. But he heard me. He came knocking almost immediately, full of the appearance of rejoicing, but even the dusk didn't conceal from me that embarrassment was on him. He looked checked and confounded, as when he had told me about his relation to Miss Dean, like a man caught in an unwarrantable assumption. Whatever Dean had done to him, it had broken the back of his egotism completely. He knew well enough he had no business with a woman like me, a friend of Mark Eversley's, and he was ashamed to have been caught thinking he had. He sidled and fluttered for an interval, making up his mind to a resumption of affectionateness, and finally making it up that he couldn't, and remembering an engagement somewhere for the evening. It was about eleven of the next day that I had a note from Eversley to come to his rooms to meet Mr. Palatkin. I went in a kind of haze of excitement, numb as to my feet and fingertips, moving about by reflexes merely and with a vague doubt as each new point of the way presented itself. The car I took, the hotel stair, the length of the corridor, if I should be equal to any one of them, so far was my consciousness removed from the means of communication. Eversley shook hands with me out of a cloud, moving in an orbit miles outside of my own, and when he left me, saying that Polatkin would come up the next moment, it was as if he had withdrawn into the vastness of outer space. In the interval before I heard Mr. Polatkin's knock, I rehearsed a great many ways of meeting him, none of which were from the right cue. I do not know why I hadn't been prepared by the name for his being a Jew, nor for the sudden shifting of the ground of our meeting which that fact made for me. So far as I had thought of him at all, it was in a kind of nebulosity of the high disinterestedness that was responsible for Mark Eversley's interest in me. It had been his generous succor, all of a piece of that traditional protectiveness, the expectation of which is so drilled into women that it rose promptly in advance of any occasion for it. The mere supposition that he was to provide for me had tinged my mind, unaware with the natural response of a docility made ridiculous by the figure of Polakin edging himself in through a door that an arrangement of furniture made impossible completely to open. His height did not bring him above the level of my eyes, and as much of him as was visible above his theatrical-looking furred coat was chiefly nose and pallid forehead disdained by tight, black, curly hair and extraordinarily black eyes, which seemed to have retreated under the brows for the purpose of taking counsel with the intelligence that informed them. I had put on my best to meet him, and though my husband had been dead more than two years, my best was still tinged with widowhood, for the chief reason that once having gotten into black I had not been able to afford to put it off for anything more suitable. I had put a good deal of white about the neck, trying for an effect which I knew, as Polakin's eyes travelled over me, had been feminine rather than professional. 
now as I realized how I had unconsciously responded to the suggestion of preciousness in the fact of his coming to take care of me, I felt myself grow from head to foot, one deep suffusing red. It comes out for me in retrospect how near I was to the situation which had intrigued Cecilia Brune and her kind, put at disadvantage not by a monetary obligation so much as by the inevitable feminine reaction toward the source of care and protection. At the time, however, I was concerned to keep the stodgy little Jew, who stood hat in hand taking stock of me, from discovering that I had come to this meeting with a degree of personal expectation, which I should have resented in him. I hoped, indeed, that my blush might pass with him for a denial of the very thing it confessed, or at least for mere shyness and gaucherie. I was helped from my confusion by the realization that Mr. Polatkin was not so much looking at me, or speaking to me, as projecting me into the future and gauging me against a background of his own creation. I was standing still, after we had got through some perfunctory civilities, for I thought he would want me to act for him. But I found afterward that he had trusted Mr. Eversley for my capacity, and I had a feeling of being able to meet the situation better on my feet. I caught him looking at me with an irritating impersonality. Jalowski shall make your corsets,' he affirmed. "'He makes them for Eames and Gadsky. "'A little more off there, a little longer here, so—' "'He did not touch me. "'He was not even within touching distance, "'but he followed the outline of my figure with his thumb, "'flourishing out the alterations which made it more to his mind. "'Jalowski would fix you so you wouldn't believe it was you,' he concluded." He appeared so well satisfied with his inspection that he expanded graciously. And there is one thing you have which there is lots of actresses would give half they got for it. You have got imagination in the way you dress your hair. It is a wonder how some of them can act and yet ain't got no imagination at all about the way they look, only so it is stylish. For an actress, it is all right for her to look stylish on the street. There are times when she has to look otherwise on the stage. You understand me? I slid somehow into a chair. I don't know exactly what I expected, but it certainly hadn't been this appraisement, which I had the sense to see was favorable and yet resented. The first thing we will see to yet is some clothes, for you will excuse me, Miss Lattimore, but what you are wearing don't show you off at all. You don't need to wear black. "'Of course I know you are a widow, Mr. Eversley was telling me, "'but there are some actresses that make out like they was "'because they think it becomes them, you understand. "'But there is no need for you to wear it, "'for Mr. Eversley is telling me that your husband is dead more than two years already.' "'He had loosened his coat to display an appropriate amount of gold fob "'dependent over a small balloon in the process of being inflated.' Now from somewhere in his inner recess he produced a folded paper. It is better we have a contract from the start. Though of course it is all right if Mr. Eversley recommends you, but it is better we don't have misunderstandings. He spread the paper out and weighted it with one of his pudgy hands. So you are going to take me? You haven't seen me act yet. Eversley has. Well, if you want to take his judgment. But he hasn't told me anything about you yet. What do you want of me? What are you going to do for me? If Eversley had told him how desperate my situation was, it wasn't a good move to try to hold out against him now. It might have given him the idea that I was ungrateful, but I couldn't stand for being handed about this way like a female chattel. That Eversley had told him I saw by the expression of astonishment on his face, which slowly changed to one of amusement. "'I'm going to save you from starving to death,' he began, and then, as the sense of my courage in the face of such an alternative grew upon him, "'I'm going to make you one of the leading tragic actresses of America.' "'And what am I to do?' "'Whatever I tell you. Eversley thinks you could study a while with Mrs. Delamater.' She is wonderful. 
Wonderful! He described with his arms a circle scarcely larger than the arc of his cherubic contour to show how wonderful she was. I should like some dancing lessons, too, I submitted. Do you dance? Ah, oh, no, it is too much to expect. But if I could find me a dancer, Miss Lattimore, a born dancer. He brought his arms into play again to describe a felicity which transcended expression. But they are not so easy to find, he sighed audibly. We must do what we can already. Eversley told me afterward that Polatkin had the soul of an actor, but the only part which he had ever been able to play without being ridiculous was Fagin, and now he was too fat even for that, so that he took it out vicariously in the success of those whose opportunity he made. It was a dream of his life to find a real genius, a dancer or a prima donna. I believe I was the nearest he ever came to it, and I owe it to him to say that I couldn't have arrived at more than the faintest approach to it without him. It was that contract I signed with him there in Eversley's room which brought him in the end about three hundred per cent on the money he advanced me, but I never begrudged it. He gave me a check then and there, and an address of a hotel in New York, where I was to meet him within five days. He looked me well over as he shook hands with me. "'You would be better if you would weigh about ten pounds more,' he assured me, and I was mixed between resentment at his personality and thankfulness to have even that sort of interest taken in me. I had lunch with Mr. and Mrs. Eversley afterward. There was not time for half the things I wished to hear from him, but this sticks in my memory. I had put it to him that the meagerness of my personal experiences had, so far, tended to the skimping of my art. "'There's no question as to that,' he told me, "'but it is nothing compared to the effect that your art will have on your experience. "'It's a mistake to let it set up in you an appetite for particular kinds of it. "'There's the experience of having done without experience. "'You can put that into your acting as well as the other.' and you'll find it is often the most valuable. I was later to find the worth of that, but, like most advice, it only proved itself in the event of my not taking it. There was not much to be done about my leaving Chicago. I had rooted there shallowly. I went out that afternoon to tell Pauline goodbye, for I wished to avoid Henry. It seemed a great step, my going away. There was a kind of finality about it. The casual character of my relation to the stage had disappeared. I was about to be married to it. Pauline cried a little. In spite of there being so much in my life that I couldn't tell her, I remembered how long we had been friends and that we were very fond of one another. She couldn't, of course, quite abandon her favorite moral attitude. "'You have a great work, Olivia, a great responsibility.' You must remember that you are the trustee of a rare gift. I'll take as good care of it, I assured her, as those who sent it take of me. At the time I believed I felt that the powers had taken notice of me at last. I got away as soon as possible. It seemed kinder to Griffin. We had been divided as by a sword, he knew now there was nothing between us, and he was abashed at the memory of having touched me. All that time we had lurked behind the pressure of packing and settling my affairs. We never came out squarely and faced one another. I think some latent manhood that had risen to my need of him slunk back with the certainty that I could do very well without him. "'You'll be sure and hunt me up if you come to New York,' I urged." I wasn't going to be accused of disloyalty because of the rise in my fortunes. He shook his head. You'll be up among the knobs then. He looked at me for a moment wistfully. You'll remember that I said I wouldn't try to hold you. I let him get what comfort he could out of the generosity he imagined in himself at that, seen against the shining background which Polatkin's money had made for me, he looked almost weazened. 
Goodbye, I said with another handshake, and I set my face steadily toward New York. End of Book Three, Chapter Six Book Four, Chapter One of A Woman of Genius by Mary Hunter Austin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Book Four, Chapter One. The third season in New York found me in a very gratifying situation. I had made a public for myself and friends, not only new friends, but old ones drawn there by good fortune of their own. I had worked out my obligation to Palatkin though I was still on such terms with him as allowed him to give me a good deal of advice, and for me to call him Polly in his more human moments. I used even to go out to his house at 127th Street to spend an hour with Mrs. Palatkin and the several little replicas of himself, of whom, in spite of their tendency to run mostly to nose and forehead, he was exceedingly proud." The help he had afforded me had uncovered new layers of capacity to fill out satisfyingly the opportunities he created. I was a successful actress. There was no doubt whatever that I was a success. I would have been able to prove it by the figure of my salary. And often when the house rocked with applause, and I was called time after time before the curtain, I would question the high half-lighted void. I would look and ache and cry out inwardly. For what? Well, I suppose I knew pretty well what I was looking for by the end of that year, though it wasn't a thing I could say much about, even to Sarah. Sarah and I had a flat together on 31st Street. The second winter we had played together, and a comedy Jerry had written for us, with so much success that it was impossible that we should remain together long. To have kept together two players of such distinguished and equal quality would have been to miss the luster of achievement which they might each shed on a lesser group, wholly without any other excuse for coherence. Our managers, too, contrived to get us not a little advertisement out of the circumstance of our being friends and undivided by success. There was, however, one fact known to us both, though without any conscious communication, which we would not for worlds have made known to an unsuspecting public, and that was that while I was still on the hither side of my full power, Sarah had come to the level of hers. Sarah was always wonderful in what I call static parts, parts all of one mood and consistency. She was notable as Portia, as Hermione, absolute. Perhaps the greatest favorite with her public was Galatea, which, besides being well within the average taste, allowed the greatest display of her bodily perfection. Yet, with all this, Sarah knew that she was nearing the end of her contribution, knew it perhaps with that prescience of the gift itself, folding up its wings for withdrawal. I have never been able to make up my mind whether she abandoned her talent because she had no more use for it, or if it left her because its time was served. I think we arrived at the certainty about our powers, night by night, that year as we came together after the performance, Sarah as though she had come back from a full meal, with a sense of things accomplished. But I, I came hungry, always. Sometimes it was merely with the feeling of interrupted capacity, as when one is left off in the middle of the course, when I would continue acting in my room, going over my part recalling others, trying experiments with them, pouring myself out until Sarah, poor dear, fell asleep in the midst of her effort to be interested. Other times I would rage up and down, all my soul baffled and aching with incompletion. I do not mean to say I hadn't taken a healthy satisfaction in what had come to me, the knowledge of being worthwhile, of contributing something, not less in sheer bodily well-being, leisure, beautiful clothes, conscious harmony with my background. I had more feeling of home for that little flat of ours than I had ever known in my mother's house or my husband's, for the plain reason that its lines and colors and adjustments were in tune with my temperament, as nothing I had had before had been. 
It wasn't until I had the means to give my personal preference full scope that I discovered how much of gracelessness in myself had been but the unconscious reaction to inharmonies of color and line. I had developed, in response to my environment, the quality called charm. And I was a successful actress. I have to go back to that to get anything like the effect of solidity which my world took on with that certainty. I was developing, too, as my critics allowed, and gave promise of steady growth. I was well paid and well friended. I don't mean to say, either, that I did not get something out of being a part of the dramatic movement of my time, knowing and known of the best it afforded. I was integrally a part of that half-careless, hard-working, well-living crowd so envied of the street. I knew a great many notables by their first names. And all the time I wanted something— at last I knew what I wanted. It will come. Sarah had faith for me. Everything comes if it is called hard enough. But you mustn't allow yourself to be persuaded by your wanting it so much to take any sort of substitute. That was on an occasion when my Taylorville training had revolted against some of the things that, though they passed current in my world, wore to me the indelible stamp of cheapness. Every now and then some aspect of it struck across my hereditary prejudices and gave me a feeling of isolation, of separateness, which drove me back in time to condone the offenses which set me apart in an inviolable loneliness. It was something my manager had said in my hearing about liking his leading woman to have a liaison with the leading man because it— kept her limbered up. I might as well, I said to Sarah. I could have my leading man any minute. This was true, though it was by no means the inevitable situation, and Sarah, in acknowledging it, had not spared to point out to me the probable outcome of such a relation. This is the way we all end, isn't it? I demanded. Why should I go looking for an exceptional experience, we both of us know that I shall never come to my full power without passion, and I have a notion that with experiences, as with everything else, we have to eat as we are helped, and my leading man is the only thing on the plate. And then Sarah had replied to me with the advice I set down a moment ago. It wasn't, however, that I hadn't seen clearly and enough of the cheapness and betrayal that comes of such irregular relations— to be warned, if only it were possible for women to be warned against trusting. What I wanted, of course, was some such sane and open passion as I appreciated between the Hardings and Mark Eversley and his wife, noble, extenuating, without a shadow of wavering. How, when I was able to conceive such a relation and to discriminate it so readily from the ruck of affairs like Jerry's and my leading man's, I came finally to miss it, is one of the things that must have been written in my destiny. Perhaps the distributors of the gift were jealous. The beginning of the new coil of my affairs was in Sarah's going on the road early in January, and my finding myself rather lonely in consequence, and going out rather too often to the McDermott's. Jerry had settled his family at 67th Street, then in that intermediate region which was at that time neither city nor suburb. Mrs. Jerry insisted that it was for the sake of the park for the children, though most of Jerry's friends were of the opinion that it was rather for the very thing for which they made use of it, an excuse for calling infrequently. No one could be on a footing of any intimacy with Mrs. Jerry without being set upon by the little foxes of suspicion and jealousy, which gnawed upon the bosom that nursed them. Connubial misery was a kind of drug with her, the habit of which she could no more leave off than any drunkard, or than Jerry could his sentimentalized, innocuous infatuations. All this comes into my story, for slight as my connection was with Jerry's affairs, in my capacity as confidant, it served to set in motion the profound confirming experience of my art." or perhaps I merely seized on it objectively to excuse what was really the compulsion of the gods, 
I could have gone anywhere out of New York to separate myself from Jerry's affair. That I should have chosen to go to London is the best evidence, perhaps, that I was not really choosing at all. It began with my spending mornings in the park with Jerry's children, who were nice children except for the way in which they continually reflected in their attitude toward their father, a growing consciousness of slighting and bitterness at home. Mrs. Jerry made a point of her generosity in rather forcing him on me on these occasions, and on the long walks which I fell in the habit of taking very early, or in the pale twilight, whenever affairs at the theatre would permit me. I remember how the spring came on in the city that year. I saw it go with the children to school in a single treasured blossom, or trailing the Sunday trippers in dropped sprays of hepatica and potentilla, back from the Jersey shore. Soft airs and scents of the field invaded the town and played in the streets in the hours when men were not using them. A spirit out of Hadley's pasture came and walked beside me. But it was not due to any suggestion of what there was in the invading season for me that Jerry occasionally walked along with me, for the chief use Jerry had of the earth was to build cities upon. Jerry drew the sap of his being out of asphalt pavements, and the light that fanned out from the theater entrances on Broadway was his natural aura. He had developed, he had branched and blossomed in the degree to which the inspiration of his work had been squeezed and strained through layers and layers of close-packed humanity. And the more he was played upon by the cross-bred, striped, and ring-streaked passions and affections of society— the more delicate and fanciful and human his work became. His lean figure, now that it had filled out a little, was built to be the absolute excuse for evening clothes, and never showed to such an advantage as in their sleek, satiny blackness, with a good deal of white front, and the rather wide black ribbon to his glasses, which brought out the natural pallor of his skin. His hair, which he wore parted very far at one side, and made to curve glossily to the contour of his head, was more like a raven's wing than ever, and had still its little trick of erecting slightly and spreading in excitement, especially when he was up for a curtain speech, and was, in the way he looked the part of the successful dramatist, a good half of the entertainment. His contribution to the occasion on which I was good enough to take his children for an outing to the Bronx or Van Cortland Park was made by lying flat on his back with his hands clasped under his head, waiting until I had exhausted myself with games before he was able to take any interest in me. I would come back to him after a while and sit on the grass beside him. Jerry's way of acknowledging the pains I had been at to amuse his offspring was to pat one of my elbows with a hand which he immediately restored to its business of propping his head. Jerry. I said, I am convinced that something very nice is about to happen to me. Run your hands over the tops of the grass here, and you can feel news of it coming up through the stems. Well, at any rate, you can take it when it comes, he reminded me. There won't be anybody to be hurt by your good times but yourself. Jerry, is it as bad as ever? So bad that if she doesn't let up on it soon, I shall do something to bring on a crisis and spend the rest of your life regretting it. Besides, there is Miss Doran. You'd have to think of her. Miss Doran was a dancer with a spirit in her feet and a South Jersey accent, whose effect on him Jerry was translating into quite the best thing he had done. It wasn't, however, that I cared in the least what became of her that I had thrown out that saving suggestion— but because it had been little more than a year since Jerry had disturbed the peace and broken the, not heart, let us say, the organ of her literary ineptitudes, of Mineola Maxen Friar, who had interviewed him once and taken him with the snare of a superior comprehension. Mineola had advanced ideas as to the relation of the sexes and a conviction that she was fitted to be the mentor of a literary career and had missed the point of Jerry's philanderings quite as much as his wife missed them. 
with Mineola in mind, and the tragedy she came near making out of it for herself, I ventured on a word of caution. You don't want to forget, Jerry, that there's one good thing about your marriage. It keeps you from making another one just like it. You think I'd do that? It is written in your forehead, Jerry, that you are to be attracted to the sort of woman whom you have the least use for, the kind that would make you a good wife. You couldn't possibly love well enough to live with her. I could live with you, he affirmed. Then it would be because you have never been in love with me. Look here, Jerry, what does the other all amount to? If you didn't have anyone, like Miss Doran, I mean, do you mean that you wouldn't write plays at all? I'd write them harder and I'd write them different. How can a man tell? This thing is. Once you know it is to be had, you just can't hold back from it. Not even if somebody else has to pay. Why should they? Jerry sat up and began to pull up the grass by the roots and throw it about. Why can't they see that all a man wants is to do his work? I could see, at any rate, that he was near the breaking point, and I knew that if the break came from Jerry himself, it would be irrevocable. That was what put me in the notion of going away immediately. I had barely saved my face with Mrs. Jerry in the Mineola affair, and I thought if there was to be another crisis, I had better clear up before it. I had put off deciding about my vacation until I could hear from Sarah, who was playing in the West and rather expected to go on to the coast, but now the idea of getting off quite by myself began to appeal to me. It was about a week after that at Rector's, where I had gone with a party of players on the spur of the moment. We saw Jerry come in with the dancer, and an air that said plainly that he knew very well what a married man laid himself open to when he came into a place like that with Claire Doran. I watched them by snatches all through the supper before I made up my mind to send the waiter to touch him on the sleeve and apprise him that I was there. What deterred me was the reflection that if it came into Mrs. Jerry's poor, befuddled head to make a case of his being seen there, the fact that I had stood her friend wouldn't in the least prevent her from having me up as a witness to her husband's private entertainments. I seemed to see in the set of Jerry's shoulders that he expected that his wife would do something and that it would be unpleasant. The necessity of taking some stand myself, of living myself for or against Jerry's connubial independence, had cleared my soul of sundry vagrant impulses and left the call of destiny sounding plain above the din of supper and the gurgle of soft, sophisticated laughter. The authority of that call, coupled, no doubt, with some annoyance at Jerry for putting me in a place where I had to decide against him, led me to break it to him there that I was about to leave him with this situation on his hands rather than at a less public occasion. He came at once with his napkin trailing from his hand and his raven's wing falling forward over his pale forehead as he stooped to me. I was wanting to see you, I said as I put up my hand to him over the back of the chair. I shall be leaving the next day after we close. For where? London, I told him. I shall be in time for the best of the theatrical season there. I hadn't thought of that as a reason until that moment. Besides, I am crazy to go. I smell primroses. Nonsense. That's Moat 85. Besides, you've never smelled them, so how should you know? That was true enough. Sarah and I had had six weeks of Paris the summer before, and a week in London in August, where it rained most of the hours of every day. But as I said the word, I realized that what had been pulling at my heart was the feel of the London pavements, with the smell of the dust in the hot intervals between the showers, and the deep red of the roses the boys cried in the street. Jerry stood down looking on me, and his face was troubled. I don't blame you for going. Come too, Jerry, bring the wife and babies. Miss Duran was tired of sitting alone so long, she stood up as if for going. A flicker of consternation passed in his face between his divided interest and a suspicion of the reason for my desertion. Look here, Olivia, 
Oh, impossible! It was plain that the dancer was going to make it uncomfortable for him for taking so much time to his goodbye. I'll see you at your steamer. He clasped my hand with a detaining gesture. I could see him looking back at me from the doorway, as though for the moment he had seen my destiny hovering over me. I have often wondered if Jerry hadn't provided me with an excuse, what the powers would have done about getting me to London on this occasion. I had almost a mind the next day to go out to his house and persuade him to drop everything here and take his family abroad with me. That I did not was, I think, not so much due to what I thought such a plan might contribute toward the saving of Jerry's situation, as the conviction, as soon as I had decided, that whatever it was that lay at the end of my journey, I was called to it. I was as certain that in London I would find what I went to seek as though it had been printed in my steamer ticket. I shut up the house and left the key of the flat at the bank. A letter I wrote to Sarah crossed hers to me, saying that she thought she would stay on in the West for her vacation. Two days after the theatre closed for the season, I sailed for London. End of Book Four, Chapter One Book Four, Chapter Two of A Woman of Genius by Mary Hunter Austin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Book Four, Chapter Two. For a week, perhaps, I was content merely with being there, simply happy and human. I had brought letters and addresses, which I neglected. In spite of the excuse I had made to Jerry about it, I did not even go to the theatres. I turned aside from the traditional goals to ride on the top of omnibuses and walk miles down the Strand and Piccadilly, touching shoulders with the crowd. The thing that I had striven for in my art, what men paint and write and act for, was upon me. Answers to all the questions about it that I had not the skill to put to myself lurked for me behind the next one of the Greek marbles and the next. The pictures were luminous with it. In the soft spring nights it took the streets and turned the voices happy. It danced with the maids in the alleyways to the tune of the barrel organs. Then, all at once, I had a scare. That which walked beside me seemed about to take flight. I would be smiling at it secretly. I would catch myself in the motion of saluting it, and suddenly it would be gone. Mornings I would wake up in Chicago to the old struggle and depression. I would have to go out in the streets and court back my joy. It fled from me and concealed itself in the crowd. I followed it by the trail of the first name I lighted on in my address book. It happened to be Mrs. Franklin Shane. I wrote her a note and then walked out in Hyde Park to see the last of the rhododendrons and regretted it. Mrs. Franklin Shane was Pauline Mills raised to the nth power, which I did not fail to perceive was due to Franklin Shane being Henry multiplied by a million. The acute sense of values, which had established Pauline at the center of Evanston, had landed Mrs. Shane at the outer rim of English exclusiveness. What she would do with her time and energy when she had penetrated to its royal core interested me immensely. I had been entertained at her home the previous winter when I had been studying a play that made me perfectly willing to be exploited by Mrs. Franklin Shane for the sake of what I got out of it to fatten my part. There in London she called for me in her car the afternoon of the day that brought her my note. I don't remember that anything was expressly said about it, but it was in the air that Mrs. Franklin Shane had arrived in her study of exclusiveness at knowing that the younger members of it were addicted to the society of ladies of my profession, and meant to make the most of me. I thought it might be amusing to see what, supposing with me as a tolerable bait, she could catch a younger son, she would do with him. 
she was clever enough not to put the use she was to make of me too obviously. I was invited to an informal reception the next afternoon in which she found herself involved by her husband's business exigencies. I gathered from her way of speaking of it that the guests were chiefly Americans, and that she had made the best of the situation, extracting from it for herself a kernel of credit by not turning down her compatriots, now that she was assured of having the English aristocracy to play with. The house, in front of which a hansom deposited me the next day, was notable. One could guess that the Franklin Shanes had been made to pay a pretty penny for the privilege of occupying it. It was stuffed full of the treasures of four hundred years of the selective instinct. "'You must really see the Velasquez,' my hostess had confided to me as soon as I had shaken hands with her, and I judged from the fact of her not mentioning my name to any other of her guests that she was saving me for a special introduction.' The Velasquez was very wonderful. There was also an early Holbein and a Titian so black with time that there was only one point in the room from which you could make out what it was about. I was slowly making my way to that point. I had been in the house half an hour and had met but one or two people whom I slightly knew. When I was aware of my hostess piloting toward me through the press, a black-coated male in whom I suspected one of the pegs upon which her social venture hung. It occurred to me that she had sent me to look at the pictures, so that she might know where to find me. The room was packed with Americans, satisfying in the only way open to them a natural curiosity as to the shell in which the only kind of society which wasn't open to them lived and the man blocking out a passage through it with his shoulders was so tall that it brought my eyes on a level with his necktie. There was an odd freedom about it that set me at once to correct my impression of him by his face, and the moment I raised my eyes to him, I knew him. I could hear Mrs. Franklin Shane mumbling the phrases of introduction, rendered unimportant by the radiant recognition that for the moment enveloped us, that burst around us as a flame in which our hostess seemed to shrivel and go out in a thin haze of silk and chiffon. I remember looking around for her presently, and wondering how she had got away from us. We began again at the point where we had left off. So you did go on the stage, then, in spite of Taylorville. And you— I pressed my foot into the velvet pile of the carpet to make sure that I stood. You are an engineer, I suppose? In spite of my uncle. Somewhere in the next room, someone began to sing. I did not hear the song nor see the titian. I was back in Wilsden pasture, and the soft rain of dying leaves was on my face. I was conscious of nothing but his hand which he had laid upon my arm to steady me against the pressure of the crowd which swayed and turned upon itself to let Mrs. Shane through, to drag me to be presented to the singer who was even more of a notability than I was. There was an interval then in which I appeared to be going through the forms of society and going through them under an intolerable sense of injustice in the fact that having found Helmuth Garrett at last, now I had lost him. It was one of those occasions when the inward monitor is so bent on its own affairs that the habit of living goes on automatically, or does not go on at all. It went on so with me for half an hour. By degrees what seemed an immense unbearable throbbing of the universe resolved itself at the renewal of that electrifying touch on my arm to the thrum of an orchestra in the refreshment room. I felt myself carried along by the pressure of the crowd in that direction, but just at the turn of the stair that went down to it, I was drawn peremptorily aside. Come, Mr. Garrett insisted. Come out of this. I want to talk to you. There was the old imperiousness in his manner, exclusive of all other considerations. He seemed to know the house. 
we took a turn through the hall came out presently at the porte cochere where a line of carriages waited supported by a line of skirt-coated figures like little wooden noahs before an ark i let him put me into a closed carriage without a word of protest i had not taken leave of my hostess i had not so much as thought of her i suppose he had been arranging this in the interval in which i had not seen him the moment the door of the carriage was shut we clasped hands and laughed shamelessly you had three little freckles high up on your cheek what became of them he demanded all at once his mood changed again all the years i've been without you i saw a picture of you in a magazine three years ago in alaska i came near writing you should have what were you doing there promoting engineer alaska russia mexico he began a gesture to include the whole round of the mining world but left off to take my hand again the world is round he declared as though he had somewhat doubted it it brings us back again to the old starting points they're always the same i suppose the places we set out from but we we are never the same is that a warning he looked at me checked for a moment only a platitude i had thrown it out instinctively against his engulfing manner against everything that rose up in me to assure me that nothing whatever had changed that it would never change the life of the london streets streamed around us crossing piccadilly circus we were held up with the traffic the roar of the city islanded us like a sea i suppose you know where we are going i suggested in one of the checked intervals to your hotel mrs shane gave me the address i told her we were old friends you mustn't be surprised if you find she expects us to have gone to school together i wanted to get away where we could talk i gave him an assenting smile still neither of us showed any disposition to begin he took off his hat in the carriage and ran his fingers through his hair about the temples it had gone grey a little now and then he gave a short contented laugh as a man will put suddenly at ease i'm glad you kept the old name olivia Lattimore. olivia i shouldn't have found you without you knew i had lost my husband i read that in the magazine there's where i have the advantage of you he dropped his slight banter for a somberer tone my wife died two years ago we were silent after that until the fact had been put behind us by a space of time i don't know why london seems a more homey place than new york it has been going on so long perhaps is so steeped in the essential essence of human living and the buildings there are smaller more personal the mind is able to grasp them to the uttermost i remember as we stopped at my hotel being taken suddenly with a tremendous awareness of it all the noble river flowing by the human stream miles on miles of homes and the green countryside i was aware of a city set in an island and an island in the sea the wide immortal sea going around and around it the coursing waves i checked myself in an upward gesture of the arms as though i had pulsed and surged with it i caught in my companion's smile a delighted recognition Shh, he said what'll flora haynes think of you flora oh flora wouldn't even think about a play actor what would your uncle he's dead now he stopped me. They're all dead, I told him, all those that mattered to us. We had another mood when we came to my rooms. I perceived suddenly what there was in him more than I had known. It was in his manner that he had commanded men. I was pierced through with the sense of his virility, the quality that goes to make a male. I was glad of an excuse to put away my hat and wrap, to escape for a moment from the effect he produced on me, from an ordinate pride in him that he could so produce it. 
The room was full of the tumult we created for one another. "'Will you sit here?' I said at last. I believe I pushed a chair toward him. "'No, you. He must have turned it back toward me. Otherwise, I do not know how I came to be so near him.' "'You know,' I said, "'I never got your letter.' I guessed as much when it came back to me. I should have come to you the next day, but I quarreled with my uncle. I walked all the way to the railway station before I remembered. But what had I to offer you? It was so long ago. No. No, yesterday. His arms were around me. Olivia. Yesterday. And today. I think I moved a little to be the more completely engulfed by him, to lay against his the ache of my empty breast. All these years I had not known how empty. We kissed at last, and joy came upon us. We loved. We kissed again between laughter. I remember little snatches of explanation in the intervals of kissing. All this time, Helmuth, I have wanted you so. I was on my way to you, all last winter in Alaska, in the long night, Olivia. I should have come soon. Oh, I cried, I have been drawn across the sea to you, all the way I felt you calling. We had to meet again, had to. After a time I insisted that he should sit down. You haven't had any tea. I tried to get control of myself. I was crossing the room to ring when he swept me up again. Look here, Olivia, I don't want any tea. I want you. God, he said, do you know how I want you? All at once I was crying on his breast. Oh, Helmuth, Helmuth, do you know you have only seen me twice in your life? And both times, he insisted, I've wanted to marry you. It was two or three days before we spoke of marriage again. I believe I scarcely thought of it. We had all the past to account for, and the present. We had moments of strangeness, and then we would kiss, and all the years would seem to each of us as full of the other as the very hour. Where were you, Helmuth, the second summer after we met? I told him of my visit to Chicago and the dream of him I had had there. Out in Arizona, carrying a surveyor's chain, dreaming of you. Often when the moonlight was all over that country like a lake, I would walk and walk. I had long talks with you. They were the only improving conversation I had. For years, I said, that dream of you was the only thing that kept my gift awake. Times I would lose it, and then I would dream again, and it would come back. I know now when I lost it completely. It was about a year before I saw you that time in Chicago. I had told him of that, too. That year I married, I could see that there was something in the recollection always that weighed upon him. I didn't, he said, until after my aunt had told me about you. I went back there when she died. She was always good to me. You know, don't you, Olive, that in spite of everything, everything, there is only you. Let us not talk of it. I do not know how it is proper to feel on such occasions, but I suppose that he must have had, as I had, stinging tears to think of the dead and how their love was overmatched by this present wonder. I would have had somehow Tommy and my boy to share in it. I went rather tardily to make my apologies to Mrs. Franklin Shane. I hope they sounded natural. My dear, you needn't expect me to be surprised at anything Helmuth Garrett does. She talked habitually in italics. My husband says that it is only because he so generally does right that it is at all possible to get along with him. I snapped up crumbs like this with avidity. His wife, too, you must have known her, I hinted. This was at the end of a rather complete account of Helmuth's business relations with Mr. Shane. 
Oh, well, I could see Christian charity struggling with Mrs. Shane's profound conviction of the rectitude of her own way of life. She was a good woman, but no imagination. She was so pleased to have hit upon a word which carried no intrinsic condemnation that she repeated it. No imagination, whatever. One feels, she modified the edge of her judgment still further, that so much might have been made out of Mr. Garrett. These self-made men are so difficult. Are you difficult? I demanded when I had retailed the conversation to him that evening. I suppose so. Anyway, I am self-made. She is right so far. I dare say it is badly done. You'll have to take a few tucks in me. Not a tuck. I like you the way you are. Oh, I like you. I like you so. There was an interval after this before we could go on again. Tell me how you made yourself, Helmuth. Don't leave anything out, not a single thing. By mistakes, mostly. Every time I made one, I knew it was a mistake and I didn't do it again. I don't know that I'm much of a success anyway, but I've got a large assortment of things not to do. That was the way I learned how to act, filling in behind. I thought that came by instinct. What counts with a man is not so much getting to know how to do it, but getting a chance to prove to other people that he knows how. I've been through that too, I told him, but he was bent on making himself clear. I suppose I ought to tell you, Olivia, I'm only a sort of scab engineer. I haven't any papers. But if you can do the work, Mrs. Shane said, Oh, Shane will trust me, he's learned. What hurts is to have worked up a scheme to the point where it is necessary to have outside capital, and then have one of the outsiders stick out for a certificated engineer. That's what comes of my uncle's notion that a man should pick up his professional training. There was the core of that old bitterness rankling in him still. He could not yield himself quite to consolation. But you have got on, Helmuth. You got here. What here meant to me exactly was more than my lover, more than the pleasant room behind us, the obsequious servitors, more even than the sleek silvered river and the towered banks that took on shapes of romance under the London grey. There was something in the word to me of fulfillment, the knowledge of things done, the certainty of an unassailed capacity for doing. We were sitting with the broad window flung open, the top of a lime tree tapping the sill of it with soft shouldering touches, as of some wild creature against its mate creaking a little in somnolent content. I put out my hand to touch his knee. Oh, as I might have done it if the here had been the point toward which we had traveled together all these years. He laughed then, as he often did when I touched him, a man's short full laugh of repletion. He thrust out his knee quite frankly till it touched mine and closed his hand over my fingers. He returned to what had been in the air the previous moment with an effort. The suspicion that it was an effort was all I had to prepare me for what was about to leap upon me. Oh, I've pulled through, I've pulled through. But I'm not where I might have been, and I'm not rich, Olivia. Not what is called rich. Is being called rich one of the things that goes with, what was it you called yourself? A promoting engineer? It goes with it if you are any good at it. Not that I care about money except for what it stands for. And then there are the girls. You have girls? It struck me as absurd that I hadn't thought of it until that moment. I thought Mrs. Shane would have told you. I have too. It isn't going to make any difference with you, Olivia. Ah, what difference should it make? I was surprised within me by the haste I made to cover my consternation that there was more difference in it than my words allowed. 
children of yours, I said, so much more of you for me to love. The apprehension was whelmed in the possessing movement with which he drew me to his breast. End of Book 4, Chapter 2《Book Four, Chapter Three of A Woman of Genius by Mary Hunter Austin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Book Four, Chapter Three. We had to go back to the subject, of course. It couldn't be left hanging in the air like that. It was a day or two later at Hampton Court where we had gone for no reason, really, except that it seemed a more commensurate background for what was going on in us, the identification in each by the other of the springs of immortal passion. We had roved through all the rooms, recharged for us with the exceptional experience, and come out at last on the river bank, where there was quite a holiday air among the houseboats. Behind us we could hear the soft slither of the fountain in the sunk garden, the warm sun streaming on us through the filmy air, the flutter of curtains in the houseboats above the little pots of geraniums, the voices of young people laughing and calling across, began to steal across my mind with a sense of the extraordinary richness of life. Here was all the stuff of which I had built up my earliest dreams of the shining destiny young people growing up about me, room to stretch my capacity to the uttermost, the orderly social procedure. For the moment I believed that I might turn back on that path my feet had failed in, and find in it all that I had missed. I recalled that there were always children in my dream. For the instant they were back, little heads and faces, all the eyes on me, soft curls like wisps of gossamer, I suppose there must be such little unclaimed souls forever hovering and flitting, little winged things, to love's mighty candle. What should there be in the touch of a man's hand on a woman's that they should come crowding to it like homing doves? There was a maid going by with her charge, one of those glowing fair-haired English children who supply us with the images by which we prefigure the angelic choirs. Helmuth held out his hand to the boy, and with that swift spark that passes between the young and those by whom they are beloved, he toddled forward and laid hold of the inviting finger. If I had had more experience of the pang that shot through me then, I should have known it for jealousy. It drove me on toward what, until now, I had avoided. "'Tell me about your girls, Helmuth. he felt in the pocket of his coat. If you would care to see them, he was so pleased and shy. I suppose he must have understood better than I how it was with me. They are with an aunt in Los Angeles. It was handier for me to see them when I ran up from Mexico. They are rather decent kiddies. You'll see them when they come to New York this winter. Shall you be in New York? It struck coldly on me that he should speak of plans that seemed to be going on regardless of the extraordinary interruption of our love. Until I get this Mexican scheme on its feet, I shall be going back and forth. They look like their mother, I suggested. I was looking still at the small, rather pale photographs he had handed me. Because they look so little like me? You forgot I saw her once in Chicago. I remember. You know, I think I went there that time because I heard you were playing there. He was silent a moment, pitching bits of sod into the river. There is something that manages these things. If I had met you, then we couldn't have been like this, and we might never have met again. When he said, like this, He had touched my knee with his hand with that possessive intimacy with which a man may touch his own woman. I had to go back to the photographs of the children to save myself from the blinding lightning of his eyes. Are they like their mother? I suppose so. I hope so. She was a good woman. I am sure of that. He sat up with intention. 
Ah, it isn't just a sense of what is due her that makes me say that. She was thoroughly good. When I met her out in Idaho, she was my chief's daughter and the only nice girl in the place. She wasn't what you are. No other woman is. But she was one of those plain, quiet women that have a kind of grip on rightness. There was nothing could make her let go. My mother was like that. I think I can understand. Well, it was mighty good for me. I am a bad lot, I suppose. I always want things harder than most, and I think the wanting justifies me in getting them. But she taught me better. She did things to me that made me fit for you, and I don't want us to forget that. Oh, my dear, it is I who am not fit. But I could see he did not believe that. He had come upon me that day in the woods when happily the mood of Perdita had shut round the odd, blundering Olivia like an enchanter's bubble through which iridescent surfaces he was always to see me. And by the mere act of loving he had fixed me in my happiest moment. He was the only man I ever knew, whom I could handle like an audience. Perhaps he was the only man who never knew me in any other character than the lady of romance. We went that evening to see Beerbaum Tree in a Shakespearean piece, always so much more worth while in London than anything the same people can do on any other soil, as if the play had mellowed there by all the rich life it tapped with its four hundred year roots. Borne up by my mood and the beauty of the production, so much greater than anything we could manage in New York at that time, I was chanting bits of it all the way home, and when we came to my room again, I moved before him in the part of Egypt's queen. Who is born the day when I forget to send to Antony shall die a beggar? Oh, Helmuth, if you could just see me do it. I was aching to lay up my gift before him as on an altar. You shall do them all for me when we are out in the shack in Mexico. Mexico? I was blank for the moment. We'll have to live there for a few years until I get this scheme on its legs. Look here, Olivia, you haven't said yet when you are going to marry me. I've only known you four days. I tried for the note of feminine evasion. Four days and an afternoon, to be exact. What's that got to do with it when you are made for me? Don't you like this helmet? He caught me to him with that frank delight in the pressure of his arm about my body, the feel of his cheek against mine that was as fresh to me as water in a wilderness. It's not this I'm objecting to, but the trouble I shall have doing without you. He let me go at that, as though he would not add the persuasion of his touch to what he had to say. The truth is I have no business to ask a woman to marry me for the next two years. I'm pledged to this Mexican proposition. I've staked all I have on it, and I've asked other men to put their money in, and I can't go back on it. I shall have to be back and forth between London and New York and the mines for at least a couple of years. If it wasn't for wanting you so, but now that I've found you again, I know there's no going on without you. He turned his face toward me that I might see the lines of anxious thought there, the buffetings and disappointings, and through it all the plain hunger of the man for his natural mate. I saw that, and I didn't flinch from it. I took his face between my hands and drew it down to my breast. I'm under contract for the next year, I told him. I signed just before I left. What does it all matter? Can't we be just engaged? We'd be engaged to be married, and I couldn't take you to Mexico on an engagement. I'm under contract, I told him again. You mean to say that you'd go on acting after we were married? It isn't worth retailing what we said after that. It has been said so many times. It was the same thing that Tommy said, better put, more fully. He was ready, you understand, to make concession to my liking for the stage, to feel himself sincerely a poor substitute for what I had got for myself out of living— 
but there it was at the end that he couldn't make for his own work the concessions he demanded of mine we would have to live in mexico he said at last that's incontrovertible and besides there are the kiddies to think of their mother wouldn't want them brought up in the atmosphere of the stage he had me there i thought of miss dean and griffin of the cecilia bruns i had known and Palatkin tracing the outline of my finger with his fat forefinger. I wouldn't either, and my frank admission of it brought us out of the atmosphere of controversy to the community of our love again. You understand, don't you, that I feel even more obligation to her now? I nodded. I understood fully that obstinate trace of disloyalty that came of his having given himself to what she wouldn't approve of, to what he couldn't for decency's sake admit of giving her daughters. I know what people think of the life of the stage, I agreed, and I know what's worse, that most of it is true. Not that it need to be, but it has got in the habit of being so. Well, then, if you feel that way, the inference was plain that he didn't know in that case why I held on to it. It has got into my blood, Helmuth. I can't explain, and I didn't realize until we got talking of it, but I don't believe I could live away from it. It is with me as it is with you about your engineering. If I had a momentary qualm lest that last should not be quite disingenuous, it passed in the realization that the comparison hadn't come home to him. I remembered how Forrester would have accepted the abnegation of my gift to his necessity of being important, and I didn't hold it out against Helmuth that he failed to realize at all the place that my work occupied, just as work, in the scheme of my existence. We came back to it the next day, and the next— it would have been simpler, of course, if it hadn't been for the children, and for my being at one with him in the opinion that the stage wasn't the proper atmosphere for the rearing of young ladies. I was still of the opinion which was exemplified in so far as I knew it, by Pauline and Mrs. Franklin Shane, that the function of mothering could not go on except by complete separateness from the business of making a living." All my training and heredity had fostered an ideal of family life which rendered obligatory a proper house and servants in the neighborhood of good schools, and the exclusion from it of everybody but those who found themselves in an identical situation. And if we had been able to imagine a compromise, Helmuth and I would have been hindered by the defrauded capacity for loving, from working it out logically at the mere suggestion of anything to drive us apart, the mating instinct set us toward one another irresistibly. We would leave off any argument and fall to kissing. We were pierced through and through with loving. Let us not think of it any more. Something will work out for us. Let us just be happy the way we are, I would protest. Oh, child, child, will you never understand that the way we are is what is so hard to bear? Then he would snatch me up until the suffusing fire of his caress would steal through all my body and sing in me like Bacchic sap of vineyards in the spring. You oughtn't to marry me unless you can't help yourself, he would laugh shamelessly. So we fell deeper in love and not out of our difficulties. Toward the end of that week, the weather, which had been thickening to a storm, brought us to one of those thunderous London days, full of a stifling murk that might have been breathed out by the nostrils of the greasy, hurrying snake that went by in the bed of the river. Inconsequential lightnings flashed in the smoky vault, from every quarter of which rolled unrelated thunder. Helmuth came over from Mr. Shane's office in London Wall. The need we had of being together was oppressive like the day which, when we had sought it in the park, we could hear like some great monster bellowing for its mate. We went out and walked about for a time under the trees, fancying the relief of freshness in the green obscurity that under the ranked trunks thickened to blackness. 
No one was about but a few belated nursery maids, scurrying in silhouette against the pale glow of the light pinned down and imprisoned under the thick cloud of foliage. We were on the broad walk, when suddenly a wind tore loose in the firmament. It made a whirling chaos of the murk, it wrung the treetops, but the air along the ground was stagnant as a cistern. Now and then a few great drops spattered on the leaves of the limes. Over a quarter of a mile from us, near the Alexandria Gate, the tension of the day snapped suddenly in flame. A bolt had shattered one of the great trees. Straight across the grass toward us the bolt sped like a ball of light. It skimmed the ground knee-high, flame points on its edges, flickered viciously as it drove at us. There was no time for anything— Helmuth cried out to me once, and I stepped within the circle of his arms. We could hear the fireball sizzling as it cleared the grass. Within a yard of us it went out in a flare of gas and a crack like thunder. Suddenly buckets of rain were precipitated on us. We could hear the slap of them on the pavement as we ran. I was crying hysterically by the time we came to my room in a cab. I remember Helmuth trying to rid me of my wet things, and my clinging to him crying. Oh, my dear, my dear, it was so near, so near, I thought I was going to lose you before I had had you, before I had had you at all. No, no, not that, Olivia, not that. His arms were around me, and all my life up to that moment was no more to me than a path which led up to those arms. I remember that— and the world dissolving in the wash of the rain outside, and the lift of his breast, and deep under all, old unimagined instincts reared their heads and bayed at the voice of their master. End of Book Three, Chapter Three Book Four Chapter Four of A Woman of Genius by Mary Hunter Austin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Book Four, Chapter Four. After the evening of the storm, we talked no more of marriage for a while, and about a week later I went over to Paris, ostensibly to shop, and was joined there by Mr. Garrett on the way to Italy. I suppose that Italy must always lie like some lovely sunken island at the bottom of all passionate dreams, from which at the flood it may arise. The air of it is charged with subtle essences of romance. One supposes Italy must be organized for the need of lovers. Nothing occurred there to break the film of our enchanted bubble. For a month we kept to the hill-towns and to Venice— where we could go about in the conspicuous privacy of a gondola, and all that time we met nobody we had ever known. It was all so easily managed. We had to think of the girls, of course. No one seeing our registered names side by side. Mrs. Thomas Bettersworth, New York, and Helmuth Garrett, Chilicahote, Mexico, would have thought of connecting them. Helmuth attended to all his business correspondence as though he were still in London, and nobody expected to hear from me in any case. It is strange how little history there is to happiness. We had come together past incredible struggles, anxieties, triumphs, defeats. We had been buffeted and stricken, and now suddenly we were stilled. If, at any time, the ghost of the uneasy past rose upon us, we kissed and they were laid. So long as we kept in touch, there ran a river of fire between our blessed isolation and the world. And for the first time we looked upon the world free of the obligations of our being in it. We looked and exchanged our separate knowledges as precious treasure— my exploration of life had been from within. I knew what Raphael was thinking about when he painted that fine blue vein on his Madonna's wrist. But Helmuth had looked on the movement of history. What he saw in Italy was the path of armies, lines of aqueducts, old Roman roads to and from mines. Everything began or ended for him in a mine, in Gaul or Austria or Ophir, 
Dynasties were marked for him by change in the ownership of mines. So he drew me the white roads out of Italy, as one draws fiber from a palm, and strung on them the world's great adventures. There were hours also when we let all this great fabric of art and history float from us, sure that by the vitalizing thread of understanding, which ran between us like a new live sense, we could pull it back again. But we loved. We loved. Nothing that happened to us there came with a more revealing touch than the attitude in which I caught myself looking out for and being surprised at, not discovering in myself any qualms of conscience. All that I had known of such relations in other people had made itself known by a subtle, penetrating, fetid savor against which some instinct, as sure as a hound, threw up its head and bathed the tainted air. But in my own affair, the first compulsion that irked me was the necessity I was under of not telling anybody. I wasn't conscious at any time of any feeling that wouldn't have gone suitably with the outward form of marriage. There were times even when I failed to see why one should take exception to the neglect of such form. I was remade, every pulse and fiber of me, my beloved's, and so obviously that the necessity of tagging my estate with the ceremony struck me as an impertinence. Marriage, I think, must be a fact capable of going on independently of the prayer book and the county clerk. Whatever you may think, no God could have escaped the certainty of my being duly married. There were days, though, just at first, when I suffered the need of completing my condition by an outward bond, I knew very well where the custom of wedding rings came from. I should have worn anklets and armlets as well, if only they could have been taken as the advertisement of my belonging wholly to my man. Depend upon it, the subjugation of woman will be found finally to rest in the attempt visibly to establish what the woman herself concurs in, the inward conviction of possession. How much of what was in my own mind was also in Helmuth's, I do not know, but because I had brought upon myself the condition of not being married, I failed to speak of what I found regrettable in it. What did come out for me satisfyingly was the man's sheer content in his mate, the response and our pride in it of his blood and body to my presence, and the new relish it created in him for the processes of living, for his pipe and his meals and his work. He had brought some estimates to figure out. Evenings at work on these, he would call me to him and sit with his left arm thrown lightly about my chair, the pencil going as though my presence were an added fillip to activity. He took on weight in that holiday, and his mouth relaxed to a more youthful curve. We spent the last three weeks of it at a quiet hotel on the point of land that divides Lake Como from Lecco, opposite Cadanabia. Times yet I will wake out of dreaming to find the pulse of the city transmuted into the steady lisping of that silver fretted lake. We had come to a phase like that in our relation, deep and full and shining. We spent hours sitting on the parapet in the sun, looking at it. I would sit on the stone ledge, and Helmuth would stretch himself with his pipe, along the ground. Helmet, I said on such a morning, do you know this is the first time I ever rested? He gave a little gurgle of content. The sun turned on the sails of the fishing boats and flashed a sympathy. I'm afraid, I admitted, I'm never going to want to do anything else. Oh, I'm going to want to. This is good enough, but it wouldn't be half so good if I couldn't take it along with me and do things with it. Great things. He threw his arm across my knees with one of those quick, intimate caresses, flooding me full of the delighted sense of how completely I belonged to him. I feel, he said, as if I'd been going about with one arm or one hand, and now I've got a full set of them. Wait until I show you. When you talk of doing, Helmut, that means leaving me. That's for you to say, Olive. 
That was as near as he had come yet to reminding me that it was I who had chosen this instead of a relation which would have implied my going with him wherever his work led him, and that the choice was still open to me. The night after the storm he had written me. There is nothing that troubles me about tonight except the fear that you may regret it, that you might ever come to have a doubt of how I feel about it. I want you to feel that whatever you choose is right to me, and though I hope for nothing so much as to make you my wife, I shall not urge you beyond what you feel that you can do without urging. It was a generous letter, and no doubt it had its weight in persuading me to trust the situation in the face of that instinct which saves women even from passions that seem their own justification. If he had counted on the naturalness of love to set up its own public obligation, he had not been far wrong with me. If it had been practicable, I should have walked out with him any day those first weeks to be married. But marriage is a very complicated business in Italy. In a measure I had satisfied my fret for the visible tie with the ring which he had bought me in Florence, which, as the stones flashed in the sun, turned me back on the thought I had when first he set it on my hand. Helmuth, do you suppose that we are pushed on to make laws and observances about marriage, because the bond that comes into being then has a consistency and validity beyond what we feel about it? Oh, beyond what we feel about it, yes. He sat up then a little away from me, as he often did when he drew upon experiences lying beyond the points at which his life had been touched by mine, and began skipping little stones into the water. Yes, I'm sure that what you feel about a thing that happens to you is not always the test of what it does to you. Sometimes I think feelings haven't much to do with our experiences except to get us into them. He left off skipping stones and began to pile them into a little heap. I was thinking of Laura, he concluded. It was not often that he spoke to me of his wife. I can't remember that I had a great deal of feeling about her. I was too busy, I suppose, getting on with my engineering. But she had a grip on me. She had a grip. Look here, my dear, I ought to tell you this. You're the wonder of the earth for me, and I know very well that my wife's world was a very little one. It was bounded by the church on one side, and by conventions on all the others. But somehow I don't want to get too far away from it, and I don't want the girls to get too far. He swung about to look squarely up at me. This that you've given me, it's heaven. It's a thing for a man to die for and die happy. But there's the other, too. He laughed a little awkwardly. He caught my feet in one of his strong hands. Have I made you understand? I understand that kind of life. It's like a clean, scrubbed room. I know. I was brought up in it. There have been times when I have been desperate because I couldn't go back and live there. But I ought to tell you, Helmuth, I can't find my way back. You, why should you? You were made to live in king's houses. But I wanted to be sure you weren't going to be disappointed if I haven't the manners that always belong to palaces. I've been in camps where a scrubbed broom looked mighty good to me. He stretched himself and rolled over on the ground, lying with his back to the sun, "'soaking in it in simple animal content. "'Little white flecks showed on the lake. "'The sails of the fisher-boats tilted slowly "'and composed themselves anew with the line of the shore "'and the flowing hills. "'Directly opposite, the walls of Cadenabia "'showed white amid the green, like a little streak of Arcady. "'We've never been,' I reminded him. I thought you wanted to leave it so you could always think of its being as romantic as it looks, without making sure that it isn't. That was the reason I had given him, but the truth was that Cadenabia was on one of those tourist routes where, supposing anybody we knew to be wandering about Europe, we would be sure to run into them. 
This morning, however, I was seized with an irresistible desire to visit it. But supposing it isn't as interesting as it looks, I submitted, if I go there with you I shall never know it, and think how disappointed I should be if I should ever come there without you and find that it is the one place we ought to have seen. There was a little motor launch plying between the shores of the lake, and an hour before tea-time we crossed in it. We spent the hour in the garden of the Duke of Saxe-Meinigen, and then along the parapet we stroll in search of tea. It was the height of the tourist season, and the gay groups moving in the streets between the quaint low houses gave it a holiday air. We heard them calling one to the other, exchanging appreciations and information. All at once we heard them calling us. Garrett! Garrett! A party in the act of settling at a tea-table in the garden of one of the hotels dissolved and reorganized about us as the center. There was laughter and garbled greetings and handshaking. Presently Helmuth began to introduce me. They were a party of Californians, all more or less acquainted and importunate. We were swept back by them to the table and tea. There were two married couples and one unmarried woman of about my age, and a boy of sixteen. I could see by the way she appropriated him that his acquaintance with Miss Stanley had been of the degree that might have ripened into marriage, and that Miss Stanley had not wholly made up her mind that it wouldn't. She was one of those unmarried women who contrive by a multiplicity and vivacity of interests to deny what is explicitly advertised by their anxiety, to have you understand that they consider themselves much better off just as they are. I could see her taking in all the details of my appearance, to find the key to what Mr. Garrett might presumably like in me, and striking out in her manner to him a quick sketch of me, bettered in the direction of what she believed it most to be. The other women, if they had been brought up in Taylorville, would have resembled Pauline Mills. That they didn't, I could see, was the difference of geography. They were all full of gay talk and reminiscence of a mutual life in the West, on a footing that left me rather more than room to play the part, which I had cast for myself with celerity, of being a casual acquaintance of his, picked up at a hotel. He had introduced me to them as Mrs. Bettersworth, and whether they would have known me or not by my stage name, I took care they shouldn't have the opportunity. Nothing would do, but he must stay to dinner. I guessed that there was that degree of acquaintance between them which would have made it unfriendly of him to refuse. I could see Miss Stanley prick up at his manner of leaving the decision to me and realized that whatever we might have agreed upon, there would be no keeping our relation from being at least a matter of curiosity to the women, the elder of whom had promptly included me in the invitation. I invented a mythical traveling companion across the lake, whom I must join, and managed to make my being in Mr. Garrett's company appear so casual that I came near to overdoing it by exciting his concern. "'What's the matter? Don't you like them?' he wished to know as he saw me to the landing. "'Ever so,' I insisted promptly. "'But they wouldn't like me after a while. You behave as if we'd been married five years.' "'Oh, well, haven't we?' He looked back and his brow gathered a little. "'For two cents I'd tell them.' But after all, there was nothing he could do but see me comfortably off and go back to them. He told me afterward that Mr. Harward, the elder of the two gentlemen, had been useful to him in business. It must have been close on to midnight when he waked me, sitting on the edge of my bed. He must have gone to his own room very softly, meaning not to disturb me. Now I heard him calling my name in a whisper, and his hand seeking for my face. I reached up and drew his down to me. Oh, my dear, I was startled at what I found there. Beloved, why are you crying? 
I could feel him shake with sudden uncontrollable emotion. I kept his head on my breast and comforted him. When did you come in? An hour ago. You were asleep. The commonplace question seemed to quiet him. Was it something went wrong at the dinner? Wrong? Yes. But not there. Not there. It's all wrong. It has been wrong from the beginning. Dear heart, tell me. Olive, marry me. Say you'll marry me. There was urgency in his whisper. There was pain in it. Say it. Say it. I'll marry you. I've been waiting for you to ask. Oh, my dear one, I have begged you so. Tell me, I urged. There isn't anything to tell, only... We walked along the parapet and were very happy together. They're a good sort. I have known them for years. And we found a peasant woman selling lace. Good lace, the woman said, and cheap. Harwood bought some for his wife, and Stanley bought his sister some. Harwood went back, pretending he'd forgotten something, and bought a piece his wife wanted and thought she couldn't afford. And I couldn't buy you any. Not openly. I wanted Miss Stanley to select some handkerchiefs that I said were for the girls, and she said girls shouldn't wear that kind. Oh, Olive, don't you understand? I understand. You shall go back tomorrow and buy me some more. But it won't be the same. And afterward, after dinner, we sat in the garden, and Harwood sat with his arm around his wife's chair, and you were over here, hiding. Oh, Olive, I want my wife. I want her in the light, before everybody. I want her. I was crying now. It's all wrong, he insisted. It's been wrong from the beginning. We belong together, before everybody. He kept repeating that phrase over and over. All the years that we've been apart... And now, just to have it in a hole in a corner. No, no, my dear, I protested. Before God. It's been before God. We sobbed together. By and by, love came and comforted us. I suppose if it had been possible to go out and be married immediately, we should have married the next morning. But in Italy there are observances. It would have taken three weeks at least, and hardly less in Switzerland. In two weeks our vacation came to an end. Helmuth set out by the shortest route for Mexico, and I interposed a week's shopping between me and Mrs. Franklin Shane, to whom I had pledged myself for a week at her country house. In November I was to meet Helmuth Garrett in New York, and settle things, he had stipulated. Somehow I could not bring myself to think of my relation to him as involving cataclysmal changes. I wouldn't say to myself that I intended to marry him, and I couldn't say that I wouldn't. End of Book 4, Chapter 4「Book 4, Chapter 5 of A Woman of Genius by Mary Hunter Austin – this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Book 4, Chapter 5 Within a week after my return, Polatkin came to see me about a project of a theatre of my own, which had been on the horizon since the year before. Polatkin himself was to furnish the money, which, considering what he had made out of me under our earlier contract, he was not in the least loath to do. He couldn't understand why I hesitated. Is it that you think you are getting along without Palatkin? Well, you can try. I hastened to reassure him. Well, then, are you getting cold feet about that Ravenscroft woman? Understand me, she can't act at all. It's something scandalous the way she tries to act like you do, and she can't. If I was her manager, I would introduce a typerope into the third act and have her walk it. But what I would have, something that wasn't copied from somebody else. I wasn't thinking of Miss Ravenscroft, I confessed, 
I'm thinking of getting married. Married? Married? And leave the stage? My God, it is a sin. He clutched the air and shook handfuls of it in my face. What do you want to get married for? He demanded. Ain't you getting on like anything? Ain't you popular? Ain't you making money? All of those, I admitted. Well, then. His wrath, which had frothed white for a moment, cooled down into a fluid sort of bewilderment, which seemed about to set and harden in a smile of disbelief. The man I'm going to marry lives in Mexico. Mexico? Mexico? He bubbled again. I ask you, is that any sort of a place for a man to live? What marries the greatest tragic actress ever was going to be? Ah, my God. In moments of great excitement, he reverted to the trick of the tongue to which he was born. All these years I have waited for this. I have said, Miss Lattimore is a great actress. She has talent. She has brains. And when she will have passion? Whew! He blew out his loose lips and made a balloon with his hands to express the rate at which I would rise in the scale of tragic actresses. And now that it has happened, she wants to live in Mexico. He deflated himself suddenly, folded his hands over what he believed to be his bosom, and looked at me reproachfully. This being the first time he had studied my face directly since I came home, I suppose he must have seen there my doubt and indecision. Understand me, he said soberly. I have known a lot of actresses, and I want to tell you that this marrying business don't pay. They got to come back to the stage. They got to. You ain't going to be any different down there in Mexico to what you are in New York. Understand me? Yeah, Mexico. The word seemed to inflame him, but he had the sense to let me alone for a while. A few days later I saw in the paper that he had taken the lease of the theater he had mentioned to me, and I knew that he wasn't counting on my going to Mexico. I suppose if I had had the courage to look into my own mind to find out what I wished to do, I might have surmised what was going on there from the fact that I didn't mention the idea of marriage to Sarah. I have tried. All this book has had no other purpose, in fact, than to try to tell how I came to be in the relation I was to Helmuth Garrett, came into it as to a room long prepared for me, without any struggles or tormenting, and without thinking much about the effect that his presence in my life would have upon my work. I suppose that, inasmuch as I had a man's attitude toward work, I had come unconsciously to the man's habit of keeping love and my career in two watertight compartments. I found I was not able to think of them as having much to do with one another. Still less had I the traditional shames of my situation. I remember the first time I went to rehearsal, groping about in my consciousness for the source of what I felt suddenly divide me from the rest of my company, and finding it in the knowledge of myself as a woman acquainted with passion, with a secret, delicious life, and far from identifying me with the cheapness and betrayal which until now I had supposed inseparable from the uncertified union, it set me apart in the aloofness of the exclusive, the distinguishing experience. It remained for Sarah to pierce me, in spite of all I intrinsically felt my relation to Helmuth Garrett to be, with the knowledge of where I stood in the world, which I still believed had the last word about human conduct. It was not altogether the intent to deceive that kept me from opening the matter to her in the beginning, but a feeling that the less advice I had about it, the better." and if I did tell her, I wished first to arrange that I need not feel any constraint upon me of our habit of living together. I was anxious to have Helmuth find me when he came, free to be all to him that our love demanded, and in view of all the years in which Sarah and I had lived together, I did not know how to go about it. 
I began to think that I should have to tell her after all, when the powers, who must have known very well what was going on, took that into account also. Sarah's season began a week before mine, and I remember her saying that she would be glad when we could come home together, as she had had an uneasy sensation for the last night or two of someone following her. Sarah had any number of admirers, but the sort of men who were attracted to her still splendor were not the kind to follow her home at night. "'Turn them over to the police,' I suggested. I had had to try that once or twice. "'Oh, I couldn't!' She turned scarlet. Even after all those years, I had not realized how all her life was time to catch the slightest approaching footfall of what, to her simple faith, must inevitably come. I found her waiting for me at the stage door on my first night. No matter how many of them you have, first nights are always in the balance— and we were so taken up with discussing how I had got on with it that it wasn't until I was fitting the key in the lock that I was recalled to the occasion of her annoyance. Just below us there seemed to be a man dodging in and out of the blocks of shadow made by the high-railed stairways that led up to the first floor of the row of flats in which our rooms were located. Something in the figure, or in our standing there before the shadowed door with the dull light of the transom over us, brushed me with the light wing of memory. I seemed to recall some such conjunction before, but it was gone before I could connote the suggestion with time or place. All I said to Sarah was that if we saw anything more of that, we would certainly speak to the police." The next night we went to supper with friends, and it was after midnight when my cab, Sarah didn't afford cabs for herself, drew up at the door. The approach to it was by way of a handsome pair of stairs with an ornamental iron railing, of so close a pattern that anyone sitting on the steps in the dark would be pretty well concealed by it. That there was someone so sitting, dropped there in a stupor of fatigue or drunkenness, we did not discover until we stumbled fairly on to him. The exclamation we raised awoke him. It arrested the attention of the cab driver just turning from the curb. He raised his lamp and sent the rays of it streaming over us. The man I could see was shabby, ill, and embarrassed. He ducked his head from the light, but his hat had fallen off on the step, and as he threw up his arm to protect himself from recognition, I knew him by the gesture. Griff, I cried. Griffin, you? I caught him by the arm. He let it fall at his side and stood looking at us pitifully, like a trapped animal. I wasn't doing any harm, he mumbled. The cab driver, seeing that we knew him, let down his lights and clattered away. I thought quickly he must have been in want. He had looked for me and, at the last, was ashamed to claim me. "'But, Griffin,' I insisted, "'you don't know how glad I am to see you. You must come in.' He wasn't looking at me. He hadn't heard me. "'Look out,' he said. "'She's going to faint.' He brushed past me to Sarah. She leaned limp against the railing. He steadied her as a man might a sacred vessel in jeopardy. But Sarah didn't faint so easily as that. She gathered herself away from his hand. "'Come upstairs,' she commanded. It was only one flight up. I don't know how we managed to get a light and to find ourselves in its pale flare, confronting one another. I could see then that my first surmise had been correct about Griffin, to the extent that he looked ill and in want. He was holding his hat, which he had picked up from the stairs and fumbled it steadily in his hands. His hair, which wanted trimming more even than when I had last seen him, had still its romantic curl. He looked steadily out from under it at Sarah. I had an idea, though I think it must have been derived from my own dizziness at what rushed in upon me, that Sarah was floating in air, that she hung there swaying with the breeze from the open window as a spirit, she was spirit-white, and her voice seemed to come from far. 
Leon, Leon, how he knew what she demanded of him, only God who makes men and women to love one another knows. She died, he said to the unspoken question. She died two years ago. I've been all this time finding you. Suddenly a quick flame burst over Sarah. You came, you came to me. I could see that she moved toward him, all her magnificent body alight, her arms, her bosom. I turned quickly through the door into the room beyond. I couldn't stay to see that. I went on into my bedroom and knelt down, hiding my face in the bedclothes. I think I meant to pray, but no words came. I rose presently and went into the kitchen. The maid did not sleep in the flat, but came every morning at nine. On the table there was a tray, as she left it always, with everything laid out in case we should be hungry coming late from the theatre. I moved about softly and made chocolate and sandwiches and arranged them on the tray. I knew Sarah would understand. About half an hour after I had gone to my room again, I heard her go out to find it. From time to time I could catch a faint murmur from the front room, I put the pillow over my head and cried softly. I remember how Griffin had looked at her that time in Chicago when I had taken him to the Futurists, and how I had been ashamed ever to introduce him. I wondered whether his real name were Lawrence or Griffin. I had fallen asleep at last, and I was awakened by Sarah standing beside me in her white gown. May I sleep with you, Olivia? I've put... Mr. Lawrence in my room. I drew her under the cover with me. She was cold, and now and then a shudder passed through her from head to foot. You guessed, didn't you? She whispered. He said you knew him in Chicago. His... Uh, Mrs. Lawrence is dead. You heard him say that. I understood she meant by that to extenuate his coming back to her. It was right for him to come if no other woman stood in the way. What there was in himself that stood in the way didn't seem to matter. "'He's been ill,' she said. "'I hope you didn't mind my keeping him in the house, Olive. "'We can be married tomorrow.' I sat straight up in bed in my amazement. "'Sarah, you don't mean that you are going to marry him?' "'Why, what else is there to do?' "'But Sarah!' I lay down again. After all, what else was there to do? You know, Olivia, you have never really loved anybody. I had no answer to that. Suddenly she broke out shaking the bed with her sobs. Oh, my dear, my dear, it is true that he loved me. It is true. He came back to me as soon as he was free. Oh, Olive, if you had known what it is all these years not to know if it was true... If he hadn't only taken me just as a stopgap, a fancy, how was I to know? I didn't think very much of the proof that he loved her now. Sarah, beautiful, prosperous, was a goal for any man to strive toward, even without the necessity which was written in every line of Leon Griffin Lawrence. Sarah, I questioned gently, do you mean to say you've loved him all this time? that you love him now? She left off sobbing to answer me with that steady, patient truth with which she met any issue of life. I loved him. All the love I had I gave him. It's not the same now, of course. Its wings are broken, but it is his. Once you've given, you can't take it back again. But he... he has no claim on you now. Sarah, do you need to marry him? I am married to him. But, Sarah, look here, Sarah, it isn't true that I have never loved. I didn't love the man I was married to, but I have learned something about love. I've learned that marriage without it is a thing no self-respecting woman should go into. Love, said Sarah, is a thing that, once you've gone into, binds you by something that grows out of it that is stronger than love itself. Olivia, I am bound. 
if you want to know, I'd rather be bound to, to Leon Lawrence by that tie than to the dearest love without it. Oh, Olivia, can't you see? Can't you understand that I have to do right? That the way I see things, there's a law. Not a civil law, but a law of loving that goes on by itself, and being faithful to it is better to me than loving. You must see that, Olivia. I see that this is the happiest thing for you, and I'll not put anything in your way, Sarah. I kissed her. What, after all, does one soul know of another? It came to me as an extenuating circumstance when I looked him over the next morning that Mr. Lawrence wouldn't live long enough to do her any particular harm. He had been so little of a man always to me, so much less so now, eaten through as he was by poverty and sickness, that I could never understand how he happened to be the vehicle of that appealing charm, which even as I looked, drew me over to his side in something like a sympathetic frame. I could see that he regarded me anxiously, and I thought it to his credit to be able to realize that there might be somebody not absolutely delighted at his marrying Sarah. But it wasn't, as I learned later, any sense of his shortcomings that waked in his eye toward me. He was lying on the sofa in our little parlor, for the shock of the encounter had been too much for the abused and broken thing he was. Sarah had gone out to consult Jerry. I believed about their marriage— she wouldn't have asked me, knowing how I felt about it. Griffin looked up at me with the old formless demand on my consideration. You've never told her, have you? Told what? On my part, it was genuine amazement. About us, you know, there in Chicago. He dropped his eyes. Something almost like a blush of shame overcame him. I stared. Good heavens, Gr, I'd forgotten it. How well I didn't know. Some women. He stopped, embarrassed by my sheer credulity of its having anything to do with this relation to Sarah. I told you I was a bad lot, he protested, but I swear that since my wife died and I could come back to her, I've been straight. You believe that, don't you? Oh, I'll believe it if it's any comfort to you. When I talked it over with Jerry afterward, I could see the queer, twisted kind of moral standard by which he made it appear that any irregularity of his during his wife's life was unfaithfulness to her and not Sarah. She had come back with Jerry, and I was walking with him to the city hall for the license. He had begun by protesting just as I had, and had surrendered to his conviction that nothing less would satisfy Sarah. After all, I said, it shows that there is some sort of harmony between them, that he should realize that the only reparation he could make would be to come back to her. Cur, Jerry kicked at the pavement, to pollute the life of a woman like Sarah with his wretched existence. That's how you feel, I reminded him, but remember how all these years Sarah has felt polluted by the thought that she wasn't married to him. How oh, damn! Sarah thinks, and I'm beginning to think so too, that there is something to marriage that binds besides the ceremony. I know. Jerry's wife had left him that summer, and though he knew it was the best thing for both of them, he was trying to get her back again. It binds of itself. If only they would tell us that in the beginning, instead of putting up all this stuff about its being the law and religion. We think we can get out of it just by getting out of the law, and none of us know better until it is too late. People like Sarah know. They know just the way swallows know to go south in winter. You'll see, she will be happier married, not because it is pleasant, but because it is right. They were married that afternoon in our apartment, and it was not until I was settled in the hotel where I had elected to stay until I could find suitable quarters that I realized that the chance of this marriage had accomplished for me the freedom that I had not known how to obtain for myself. I lay awake a long time after I came from the theater, 
and the mere circumstance of my being alone and in a hotel, as well as the events that led up to it, brought back to me the sense of my lover, of his being just in the next room and presently to come in to me. I felt near and warm toward him. And then I thought of Sarah and Griffin, and how almost I had become the stop-gap to his affections that she dreaded most to find herself to have been. It didn't seem very real in retrospect. I shuddered away from it. Then I began to think how I had first been kindly disposed toward him, and that brought up an image of the dim corridor of the hotel, where I had come to my first knowledge of such relations, and my abhorrence and terror of it. I thought of O'Farrell and of Miss Dean, and that suspicion of sickliness which her personality had for me, and saw how it must have arisen from her consciousness of what she had done to Griffin, rather than her relation to manager O'Farrell. Then I thought of Helmuth Garrett, and one night in Siena, when the moonlight poured white over the cathedral, and a linden tree in bloom outside the window, and a nightingale singing in it. Suddenly it was mixed up in my mind with the slanting chandelier and the tin-faced clock, and slowly a sense of unutterable stain and shame began to percolate through and through me. End of Book Four Chapter 5 Book 4, Chapter 6 of A Woman of Genius by Mary Hunter Austin This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Book 4, Chapter 6 It is a great mistake to suppose that assertiveness is the only mannish trait taken on by successful women, nor is pliability the only feminine mark they lose. By what insensible degrees it came about I do not know, but I found myself on the peak of popularity, very much of the male propensity to be beguiled. I was willing to be played upon, and so it was skilfully done, to concede to it more than the situation had a right to claim for itself. I pulled myself up afterward, or was pulled up by the sharp rein of destiny, but for the time while my success was new, I was aware not only of the possibility of my being handled, but of my luxuriating in it, of demanding it as the price of my favor, and in particular of valuing Palatkin for the way in which, by my own moods, my drops and exaltations, he brought me to his hand, how much of the fact of my private life he was really acquainted with I never knew, but he understood enough of its reaction to make even my resistances serve to push me on to the assured position of a theatre and a clientele of my own. It stood out for me as he described it, not so much as a means of dividing me from my beloved, but as a new and completer way of loving. I wanted more ways for that, space and opportunity. I wished to lay my gift down, a royal carpet for Helmuth Garrett to walk on. I would have done anything for him with it except surrender it. Not the least thing that came of my condition was the extraordinary fluorescence of my art. Every night as I drew its rich and shining fabric about me, I was aware of all forms and passions, the mere masquerade of our delight in one another. Every night I embroidered it anew, I adored and caressed him with my skill. Palakin went about wringing his hands over it. You are a wonder, a wonder, and you are wasting it on them swine. That was his opinion of my support. And to think you could have a theatre of your own and what you like. A theatre like me? Me spread over it, expressed, exemplified? carried out to the least detail? You shall have it even in the box office, he responded magnificently. How soon? I will bring the plans this afternoon. I got them ready in case you came around. But he was much too intelligent to undertake to bind me to them at that juncture. Things went on like this until the last week in November. Then I had a telegram from Helmuth saying that he would be detained still longer. 
Every pulse of me had been so set to his coming on the twenty-seventh that I thought I should not be able to go on after that. I should go out like a light when the current had stopped. I had so little of him, not even a photograph, nothing but my ring and a few trinkets he had bought me in Italy. If I could have had a garment he had worn, a chair in which he had sat, I went round and looked at the Astor House, because he told me that he had stopped there once, years ago. I stood that for three days, and then I went down to New Rochelle, where he had written me earlier his girls were at school. Not on my own account, you understand, but as a possible patron of the school on behalf of my niece, who was, if the truth must be told, less than two years old. While I was being shown about, I had Helmuth's children pointed out to me. They looked, as I had surmised, like their mother. If they had in the least resembled their father, I should have snatched them to me. Everything might have turned out quite differently. They were, the principal said, nice girls and studious, but they did not look in the least like their father. It was one of those dark, gusty days that come at the end of November, damp without rain, and of a penetrating cold. There had been a great storm at sea lately, and you could hear the wash of its disturbances all along the sound. There was no steady wind, but now and then the damp air gave a flap like an idle wing. It was like the stir in me of a formless, cold desire, not equal to the demand life was about to make on it. As I turned into the station road after a formal inspection of the premises, I met the girls coming back from their afternoon walk with the teachers, two and two. The Garrett girls were next to the last. They were very near of an age. I waited, half hidden by a tree, to watch them as they passed. They were well covered up from the weather in large blue coats with capes and blue felt hats with butterfly bows to match at the ends of their flaxen braids. They looked like their mother. I couldn't see them growing up to anything that would fit with Sarah and Jerry and Polatkin. The wing of the wind shook out some gathered drops of moisture as they passed. The branches of the trees clashed softly together, and as they turned into the grounds, I noticed that the older one had something in her walk that reminded me of her father. I was pierced through with a formless jealousy of the woman who had borne them in her body. I was moved, but not with the impulse to draw them to my bosom. I felt back in the place where my boy had been for the connecting link of motherliness, and failed to find it. I had had at once that knowledge of what is good to be done for small children and the wish to do it, but it was gone from me. It was though I might have had a hand or a claw, any prehensile organ by which such things are apprehended and when I reached it out after Helmuth's children, it was withered. What I found in myself was the familiar attitude of the stage. I could have acted what swept through me then, I could have brought you to tears by it, but there was nothing I could do about it but act. I wrote Helmuth that night that I had seen the children, and then I burned the letter. He came at last. He was greatly concerned about his enterprise, which was not yet established on that footing which he would like to have for it, and I think it was a relief to him to have me without the conventions and readjustments of marriage. It was tacitly understood between us that things were better as they were until that business was settled. I think he could not have had a great deal of money at the time. All that racing to and fro between London and Mexico must have cost something. His anxiety about the girls, which occasioned his sending them to the most expensive schools, and his affection for them, which led to their being carted about by their aunt to meet him occasionally at far-called places, was an additional drain. We were very happy. There is nothing whatever to tell about it. We met in brief intervals, snatched from our work, and did as other lovers do. Sometimes he would come for me at the theatre. The freshness of my acting never palled on him. Other times I would find him waiting for me in the little flat I had expressly chosen and furnished to be loved in. 
the pricking warmth of his presence would meet me as I came up the stair. Not long ago I found myself unexpectedly in a part of the city where we used to walk, because we were certain not to meet any of our friends there. There was a tiny café where we used often to dine, and the memory of it swept over me terrifyingly fresh and strong. With all this it was plain that we got on best when we were most alone. It was not that I did not every way like and was interested in the friends he introduced to me, outdoor men, most of them, and their large-minded, capable wives. I got on with them tremendously, and found them as good for me as green food in the spring, sated as I was on the combined product of professionalism and temperament. It was chiefly that the simplicity and openness of their lives brought out for him the duplicity that lay at the bottom of ours. For it was plain that they wouldn't have understood, wouldn't have thought it necessary. They could have faced those women, strange lands and untoward happenings, had many of them faced sterner things for the sake of their husbands, with the same courage and selflessness with which they would, in my circumstances, have faced renunciation. It was the realization of this, so much sharper in him who had seen and known, that checked and harassed Helmuth. He wished to be at one with them, to be felicitated on my success and my charm, to include me, if only by implication, in that community of adventure with which these mining and engineering folk had ringed the earth, and the necessity of holding our relation down to the outward forms of friendship established on the supposition of our having grown up together, fretted him. It isn't honest, he broke out once after he had tried to persuade me to let him tell his friends that we were engaged. It's all right between us. You are my wife in the sight of whatever gods there are, but that isn't what other people would call you. Somehow, Helmuth, so long as it is with you, I don't care much what they call me. Well, I care. I care a lot. You don't seem to remember you are going to be my girl's mother. Sons, too, I hope. We ought to have some more children. Sanderson's got four. Sanderson had been our host at luncheon that day. Helmuth was knocking out the ashes of his pipe on my hearthstone. He paused in the occupation of refilling it to look down at me in a moody kind of impatience that was the worst I knew of him. There was the suggestion of a cleft in his strong, square chin, which came out whenever he bit hard on a difficult proposition. The play of it now was like the tiny shadow of disaster. I was down in old Brownlow's office the other day, he went on, talking this Mexican scheme to him, and he had to break off in the middle of it to telephone to some chorus girl he had a date with. God, it made me hot to think of it. Because I'm in the same, he cut me off with a sound of vexation. Don't say it. Don't even think of it. How long does this contract of yours last? To the end of the season, I told him. Well, you check it just as soon as you can. I'll put this thing through somehow. We'll clear out of here. He had his pipe alight by now and began puffing more contentedly. I don't think much of this burg, anyway. He laughed as he settled himself in one of my chairs. A man doesn't have a chance to get his feet on the ground. There were times when he almost made me share in his distaste for it. That was when I had drawn him into the circle of my professional acquaintances, which somehow shriveled at his touch like spiders in the heat. Understand that I hold by my art, that I have poured myself a libation on that altar, that I value it above all other means of expressing the drama of man's relation to the invisible, and that I do not think you do enough for it, prize it enough, or use it rightly. But I suppose there is a yellow streak in me, or I wouldn't sicken so as I do at what it brings to pass in the personalities by which it is most forwarded. For since it must be that art cannot be served to the world except by a cup emptied of much that is most desirable in the recipients, it ill becomes them as long as they fatten their souls at it to take exception to the vessel from which it is drunk. Nevertheless, I used to find myself, when Helmuth was with me, 
sniffing at the spiritual garments of my friends for the smell of burning. I resented Mr. Lawrence the most. It was not altogether for the incongruity of his possessing Sarah, her fine smudgeless personality and her lovely body, delicate and shapely as a pearl, but for the incontestable evidence he offered me of how low I had stooped. From the peak of my present prosperity, my troubles in Chicago showed the merest accident, and the distance I had sprung away from them seemed somehow expressive of the strength with which I had sprung from all that Lawrence represented. Not all the care Sarah bestowed on him, and I think the best he could do for her was to provide her in his impaired health with an occasion for mothering, could quite distract the attention from the eradicable mark of his cheapness. He was as much out of key with the society in which Sarah's success and mine had placed him as he was flattered to find himself there. It had brought out in him, in the way privation had not, that touch of theatricality which intrigued Sarah's unsophisticated fancy in the first place. He let his hair grow into curls and made a mysterious and incurable pain of his broken health, and though he offered it as the best he had to offer, with humility, he suffered an accession of that devoted manner which had won his way among women of his own class, but which among the sort he met at my rooms was ridiculous. Jerry, too, with his married life in dissolution, for what looked to Helmuth, and in the light of his strong sense, was beginning to look to me like an aimless folly. Out of all these blew a wind witheringly on the fine bloom of my happiness. We did best when we shut it out in a profound, exalted intimacy of passion. What leads me to think that Polatkin must have watched me rather closely all this time is the fact that he waited until Mr. Garrett was gone to London again in the latter part of February to put it to me that if I really meant to leave the stage permanently, and it was a contingency which, in speaking to me of it, he had the wit to speak seriously— I could do no better for myself than to take flight from it from the roof of my own theatre. He put it to me in his own dialect, mixed of the green room and jewelry, that I had torn a large hole in the surrounding professional atmosphere by the vitality of my acting that winter, and that it would be a great shame to go out into the obscurity of marriage without this final pyrotechnic burst. I could have, by his calculation, a short season to open with, and a whole year of brilliant success before, well, before anything happened. I think by this time I must have known subconsciously that nothing would happen. It must be because no man naturally can imagine any more compelling business for a woman than being interested in him, that Helmuth failed to understand that he could as well have torn himself from the enterprise for which he had starved and sweated as separate me from the final banquet of success. I had paid for it, and I must eat. We opened in May, not the best time of year for such an adventure, but I suppose Palatkin was afraid to trust me to the distractions of another vacation. It occurs to me now, though at the time I didn't suspect him, that we couldn't have opened even then if he had not been much more forward with the plan than at any time he had permitted me to guess. At the last I came near, in his estimation, to jeopardizing the whole business by opening with The Winter's Tale, with Sarah in the part of Hermione, and myself as Perdita. Jerry was writing me a new play, but in the process of breaking off a marriage that ought never to have begun, he had found no time to complete it. But why, urged Polakin, if we must fall back on Shakespeare, choose a part that did not introduce me to the audience until the play was half done? He stood out at least for Juliet or Cleopatra. Why, indeed, I retorted, have a theatre of my own if it is not to do as I please in it? I knew, however, that what I could put into Perdita of Wilsden Lake and the Woods of Flame would have sustained even a more inconsiderable part. Effie and her husband came on to my opening night. I want to say here, if I have not explicitly said it, that my sister is a wonderful and indispensable woman. When I think of her, the mystery of how she came out of Taylorville, full-fledged to her time, 
is greater than the mystery of how I came to be at all. For Effie is absolutely contemporaneous. She lives squarely not only in her century, but in the particular quarter of it now going. No clutch of tradition topples her toward the generation of women past. Most women of my acquaintance are either sodden with leftover conventions or blousy with racing after the to-be, but Effie is compacted, tucked in, detached from but distinctly related to her background of Montecito. She was president of the Women's Club, chairman of the book committee of the circulating library, and though she had a letter every morning and a telegram every night from the woman with whom she had left her two babies, it didn't prevent her in the week she spent with me from getting into touch with more forward movements than I was aware were in operation in New York. But good heavens, Effie, how can you find time for them? It's as much as I can do to attend to my own job. Oh, you, you're a forward movement yourself. All I'm doing is hurting the others up to keep step with you. You know, Olivia, I've wondered if you didn't feel lonely at times, so far ahead that you don't find anybody to line up with. Every time I see a woman step out of the ranks in some achievement of her own, I think, now Olivia will have company. But heavens, I said again, I'm not thinking of the others at all. I don't even know that there are others, or at least who they are. I'm a squirrel in a cage. I go round because I must. I don't know what comes of it. I'll tell you what comes. Women everywhere get encouraged to live lives of their own. Do you remember what you went through in Higgleston? Well, the more women there are like you, the less there will be of that for any of them. It is the conscious movement of us all toward liberty that's going round with you. I was dashed by the breadth and brightness of her view. Effie, I said, is this a new kind of toy to dangle before your intelligence to keep it from realizing it isn't getting anywhere? Like the love affairs of your friends? She came back at me promptly. No, it isn't. It's, well, I guess it's a religion. I believed as I dressed at the theater that night that it was the contagion of Effie's enthusiasm that keyed me up to a pitch that I thought I shouldn't have reached without Helmuth. I had counted so on his being there for the first night, but he was still in London, and for a week I hadn't heard from him. I needed something then to account as I proceeded with my part for the extraordinary richness of power, the delicacy and precision with which I put it over line by line to my audience. I played. Oh, I played. I felt the audience breathing in the pauses like the silent wood. The lights went gold and crimson, and the young dreams were singing. So vivid was the mood that, when from time to time I was swept out on billows of applause before the curtain, I fancied I saw him there leaning to me, now from a balcony, or standing unobserved in a box behind the Sandersons and some friends of his who had pleased, on his introduction, to take a great interest in me. It was a wonderful night, flooded with the certainty of success as by a full moon. We danced under it in spirit. I believe that Polatkin kissed me. Two of my young men I saw with their hands on one another's shoulders, capering in the wings, as I was being drawn before the curtain again and again to bob and smile like a cuckoo out of a clock striking the perfect hour. And through it all was the sense of my beloved, the leaf-like touch of his kiss on my cheek, the pressure of his arm, so poignant that as I came out of the theatre late with Effie and her husband, I thought I could not bear it to go back to my room and find it empty. Willis, I said to my brother-in-law, you must lend me my sister tonight. I was sitting between them in the carriage, each of them holding a hand. I do not know what they were able to get of my acting, but nothing could have kept from them the knowledge of my tremendous success. I could see, though, that in his excited state it wasn't going to be easy for him to spare his young wife, and that made it easier for me as we drew up in front of my door to change my mind suddenly and send her back with him. What really influenced me was the certainty that I could not bear even for Effie to disturb the sense of my lover's presence, which I seemed to feel brooding over the room. 
I went up the steps warm with it. I had a moment of thinking as I opened the door and found the lights turned on that my maid had left them on so in anticipation of my return, and then I saw him. He was sitting by the dying fire. He had not heard me come up the stair, for his head was in his hands. He turned then at my exclamation, and I had time before we crossed the width of the room to one another to think that the attitude in which I had found him and the new writing of anxiety in his face as he turned it to me had its source in his finding me in what looked like a permanent relation to a theatre of my own. For a moment I thought that, and then my apprehension was buried on his breast. Oh, my love, my love. He held me off from him to let his eyes rove tenderly over my face, my breast, my hair. I do not know if he remembered the words he had spoken to me so long ago, or if they came spontaneously to the command of the old desire. Oh, you beauty! You wonder! Presently we went to sit down and stumbled over his bag upon the floor beside his chair. It brought me back to the miracle of his being there, and to the certainty that he must have come to me direct from the steamer. On the Cunarder, he admitted. Six days and a half. Oh, Lord! His gesture was expressive of the extreme weariness of impatience. I came ashore with the quarantine officers. I couldn't cable. I left at two hours' notice. It occurred to me that he must have at least come ashore before sunset and in that case he couldn't have come straight to me. I began to feel something ominous in the presence there of his bag. His overcoat, though the evening was so warm, lay beyond him on another chair. It flashed over me in a wild way that he had come to some sudden determination. He had been at the theatre that night. He had taken my being there in that circumstance as final. Perhaps he meant to abandon me to my art, to surrender me, at least, to its more importunate claim. He followed my thought duly from far off. I was at the theatre in time for your part, he said. There wasn't a seat, but they knew me at the box office and let me in. Then it was you I saw on the balcony, in the Sanderson's box? I thought it was a vision. I had business with Sanderson. He turned back to what was beginning to make itself felt through his profound preoccupation, the charm of my presence. There was that in your acting tonight that would have evoked visions, he smiled. I had them myself. I knelt down on the floor beside his knees. Helmuth, tell me, I begged. He began to stroke my face with his hand. It doesn't seem so bad as it did a few moments ago, and yet it is bad enough. I must leave for Mexico in an hour. Leave me? I was still in my mind occupied with what now began to seem a monstrous disloyalty to him, my obligation to Polakkin. There had been a great deal about our new venture on the program. Even if he hadn't seen the papers, he must have learned it as soon as he came into the theater. Unless you can go with me in an hour. Yes, dear, I know it is impossible. He was silent a while, clasping and unclasping my hand on his knees, knitting his brows and staring into the fire with the expression of a man so long occupied with anxiety that his mind, in any moment of release, goes back to it automatically. I stirred presently when I saw that his perplexity had nothing to do with me. "'I had a cable in London,' he said. Heaven only knows how long they were getting it down to the coast where they could send it. They have struck water in the mines. I failed to get the force of the announcement, except that from the manner of his telling it, it was a great disaster. I must leave on the 1223, he warned me. I did understand that. Oh, no. No, Helmuth, I cried out. Not now, not so soon. I clung to him, crying. Stay with me tonight, just for tonight. We rocked in one another's arms. I remember little broken snatches of explanation. I've worked so, Olivia. I've worked and sweated, and now... Presently he broke out again. 
to have worked and know that your work is sound and to be played a trick to lose by a ghastly trick if there is a god olivia why does he play tricks on a man like that hush my dear oh my dear do you know what i've been doing since i came ashore i've been buying pumps olivia pumps and machinery to work them think of the delay i'll have to ask shane for more money more and i meant to be paying dividends he held me off from him fiercely with both hands olivia suppose to-night instead of applause you had heard hisses and people going out turning their backs on you in your best lines oh he broke off and covered his face with his hands i crept up to him if they had i should have come back to you beloved and I shouldn't have remembered it. Oh, beloved, what are all things worth except that they give us this? I was on his knee now, and my hair was still in its maiden snood, as it had been in the play. I drew it softly about his face. Oh, my dear, to be this to me, what does it matter about the mines? It will come straight again in a little time. But this, this is now. I could feel the yielding in his frame. He was my man, and I did what I would with him. End of Book Four, Chapter Six Book Four, Chapter Seven of A Woman of Genius by Mary Hunter Austin This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Book Four, Chapter Seven among all the devices with which we confound the powers forever fumbling at our lives, none must puzzle them more than the set of obligations and interactions that go by the name of business, unless, indeed, there is a god of business, which I doubt. Past all misguiding of our youth, past all time and distance and unlikelihood, the god who would be worshipped most by the welding of spirit into spirit, had brought us two together, only to be rived apart by the necessity, which tied us each, not only to our own, but to other people's means of making a living. The two or three hours following on Helmuth's announcement of the accident, which had, who knows but at the instance of the powers which was bent upon uniting us, shattered the point of his attachment to the Mexican scheme, we spent in that drowning realization of the source of being and delight for each in the other, which is the process and the end of loving, and then the withdrawing of the whole electric constellations from the city skyline and the clatter of the morning traffic in the street and the dispersing blueness let in with them the considerations which whipped us apart. If there is a god of business, he is of a superior subtlety, for even then we proposed to one another that the best way of being quit of the obligation was to serve our time to it, and it was in pursuance of some such idea that I found myself, toward the latter part of June, going out to Los Angeles to meet Mr. Garrett, who would by that time have come up the coast from Mazaplan to make purchases of supplies. I should have gone much farther than that merely to have touched with him the warm pressure of his hand, his voice at my ear. All my dreams even were tinged by the lost out of my life of his bodily presence. It was a singular flame-touched circumstance that the assured success of my new venture set up in me a fiercer need. There had not been time for much in his letters but accounts of his struggle with conditions at the mine and his slow conquest of the water that flooded all the lower levels, of disheartening, incompetent labor and the multiplied difficulty of distance from any base of supplies. But that little was all time to our meeting again. I will explain all that when I see you. We will talk of that later were phrases that cropped out in his letters many times. I did not know, even in the act of going there, just what he expected to bring to pass in our affairs by my being in Los Angeles. I only know that I desperately wanted to see him. 
One thing I gathered from his letters, that in the preoccupation and haste of his stay in New York, he had wholly missed the significance of my new entanglement with Morris Palatkin. I have to suppose, to account for his never having any other conception of what my work was to me, that he had never known a professional woman, or one who worked at anything except as a stopgap doing the inconsequence of youth and marriage. He felt himself, humbly, rather a poor substitute for the color, the excitement and gaiety of my career. Why should so many people suppose that an actress's life is gay? But he balanced that with what he meant to purchase for me by his own achievement. He had, without thinking it necessary to account for it, the idea that is so generally and unexcusedly entertained that I am sometimes hypnotized into thinking it must be the right one, that a woman in becoming a man's wife ceases to be her own and becomes somehow mysteriously and inevitably his. It was not that in all our talk about it he had any conclusions about the stage as an unsuitable profession for women, but that he was inherently unable to think of it as possible for his wife. We were saved from dispute by the proof I had had in Italy that his inability to think of me as having a life apart arose chiefly in his need of me, which had in it something of the absolute quality of a child's need of its mother. I am glad now, in view of all that came of it, that I was spared the bitterness of not seeing, in his inability to accept the finality of my relation to my work, anything nobler than an insufferable male egotism. I have thought since that we might have made more of our love if we had but seen somewhere in the world the process of its being so made if we could have moved for a time in a footing of intimacy among other pairs who had produced out of as unlikely material a competent and satisfying frame of life we do not know any but theatrical people among whom the wife had interests apart from her husband that is where taylorville betrayed us and now you know what i meant when i said in the beginning that the social ideal in which i was bred is the villain of my plot for we wished sincerely for the best, and the best that we knew was cast only in one mould. I have begun to think indeed that this, more than anything else, accounts for the personal disaster which waits so often on the heels of genius, that we assume it to be the inalienable condition. For genius tends to spring from that stratum of society for which, when it has come to its full flower, it is most unfit and it comes up slanting and aside like a blade of grass under a potsherd of the broken mould of unrelated ideals. Somewhere there must have been men and women working out our situation, and working it out successfully, but the only example life afforded us was not of the acceptable pattern. Still my agreement with Mr. Garrett, that it was, after all, the pattern, saved us from mutual accusation and recrimination. Concerned as I was to make the most and the best of him, I kept looking out all the way after the train struck into the southwest for every intimation of the life there which would have helped me to get at the springs of his behavior, and was by turns shocked away from its bleakness and drawn with a rush of sympathy toward what a man must endure to live in it, if I saw myself as he had sometimes sketched me, filling its bleak and unprofitable reaches with my gift as with flame and flower, I was as many times shudderingly brought face to face with the question as to where in the wilderness I was to find wherewithal to go on burning. At Los Angeles, a town of which I had heard him speak as a place with the spirit with which he was in sympathy, I had nothing to look at for a week, but a great deal of rather formless, wooden architecture expressing nothing so much as the attempt to reconcile Taylor Villian tastes and perceptions with a subtropical opportunity. I do not know what that city may have become since I visited it, but at the time it was notable for a disposition to take the amplitude of its pretension for performance. Its theatrical season, if it had any, 
had dwindled to that exorable sort of entertainment which comes up in any community like a weed when the women are out of town and if there had been anybody i knew there i should have been debarred from making myself known to them until i had seen mr garrett and learned his plans i took to spending my time as far out of town as i could manage and by degrees a strange seductive beauty began to make itself felt with me a large unabashed kind of beauty that disdained prettiness and dared to dispense with charm it was a land ribbed and sinewed with all i had set my hand to making free with it as kings do with their dignity and the moment helmuth came before the warmth of renewal had its way with us i saw that the land had set its mark on him he was thinner his manner hurried obsessed there are times no doubt when loving must be set aside for the sterner business of living but it wasn't what i had come to los angeles for i was flushed with success i had spread the crest of my femininity i was prepared to be adorable enchanting and i found that what was expected of me was to sit by in my room in the hotel on the chance of his having time for me between the exigencies of buying cogwheels and iron piping he was so tired at times that i was made to feel that my demand upon him for the lover's attitude was an additional harassment and there was so little else i could do for him not that i wouldn't have been glad to have done him a wifely service laid out his clothes and seen to it that he had his meals regularly but what i could do was subservient to the necessity of keeping our relations secret it struck witheringly on all my sweet illusion of what i could be to him to have it so brought home to me that the uses of affection are largely dependent on the habit of living together at any rate i said consoling myself for his scant hours with me we shall have all day sunday together helmuth you don't mean to say something curiously like embarrassment suffused him i shall have to spend most of sunday at pasadena at the howards the girls are there you know i didn't know and the circumstance of its having been kept for me smacked of offence why since i had been good enough to come all this distance to comfort him with loving had he not explained to me that i must share him with the children why not have at least included me in a community of interest with them i thought he extenuated that the girls were the chief obstacle to your marrying me that you might get to feel differently about them if you didn't have them thrust too much upon you oh helmuth i began to imagine a perversity in his avoidance of the main issue it isn't the girls it isn't anything of yours it is something of mine it is my art you aren't willing for me to bring into the family with me it is because then i'm not accustomed to think of the stage as being the sort of thing that belongs in a family i thought you agreed with me about that he had me there if i had seen a way to separate all that i loved in my art from all that was most objectionable in the practice of it i should have married him and trusted to carrying my point afterward i had a vision of helmuth's girls overhearing polack and advising me about the fit of my corsets and me calling him polly i came back on another path to my recently awakened resentment just the same you ought to have told me mrs howard is miss stanley's sister isn't she they don't live together he had answered my unspoken question as though the ideas that were forming in my head had been in juxtaposition in his own before miss stanley and the young brother you remember him at Catanabia, live at the old place she has been a mother to him ah i couldn't forbear to suggest and she's mothering your children now good heavens olivia you are not jealous are you yes i am i told him i'm jealous of every minute you spend away from me i'm jealous of the men you do business with 
men who can talk with you, hear your voice. Oh, my dear, my dear. I put my hands up to his shoulders and cried a little upon his breast. His arms were about me. For me, all time and place dissolved only to keep them there. Look here, Olivia, if you feel this way, let us go and be married today, and then we can spend Sunday all together. I did not mean to urge you just now. Things are pretty rough with me. It'll be a year or two before I can straighten them out. But, after all, I guess our feelings count for something. I couldn't, I protested. You don't understand. There's Palatkin and Jerry. He has written this play for me. We are all tied up together. You know how it would be if any of your partners should withdraw. A woman has no business to be tied up to any man but her husband, he broke out. Think of any other man being able to tell my wife what she should or shouldn't do. We went over that ground again until we ceased from sheer exhaustion. It came to this at last, that he proposed that I should marry him at once. I could go back to Mexico with him. I hadn't to begin rehearsals until September. We could have the summer together, and then I could go back to my work until he could claim me. For a wild moment I yielded to the suggestion, if I could have him and my art. But I hope I am not altogether a cad— I saw what all his efforts could not keep me from seeing, that even to do that for me, to get me into his place in Mexico and back again would be a tax on him, and to ask him to do it with a reservation in my mind would be more than I would stand for. It isn't fair, Helmuth, my letting you think that anything could pull me away from this stage. It isn't that I don't agree with you about how a husband and wife ought to be with one another, nor that I am not entirely of the opinion that the atmosphere of the stage is not the place to bring up children the way you want yours brought up. It is because not even the kind of marriage you offer me would hold me. You mean that you'd leave me, that you'd go back to it? Well, why not? I left my first husband— I know that wasn't the way it seemed to me then, but that's what it amounted to, and he fell in love with the village dressmaker. I had never told him that part of my life. I had never thought of it in the terms in which I had just stated it. I saw him grow slowly white under the sun-brown of his skin. I see. If your only idea in staying with me is that I might— Good God, Olivia, do you know what you've said to me? Nothing except what is right for you to know. Do you remember, Helmuth, what I told you Mark Eversley called me? A woman of genius, I remember. He was looking at me now as though the phrase were a sort of acid test which brought out in me traits unsuspected before. Well, then I'm those two things, a woman and a genius— and the woman was meant for you. Don't think I don't know that, and I'm not proud of it with every fiber of my brain and body. I should have been glad once. If it were possible, I'd be glad now to have kept your house and borne your children, and see to it that they brushed their teeth and had hair ribbons to match their clothes. Their mother thought that was important. He snatched at this as at an incontestable evidence of my being all that I was trying to show him that I was not. It is important. I remember to this day the effect on me of my hair ribbons. He broke in eagerly. If you can see that, if you understand what their mother wanted, things I missed out of my life through having no mother, that I've heard you say you missed partly out of yours— "'Birthdays and Christmas and good chances to marry when they grow up. "'I do understand, Helmuth, but what I'm trying to tell you is that I can't go through with it. "'Those are the things that belong to the woman, "'that it takes all the woman's time to do the way their mother would have them done. "'And for me the woman has been swamped in the genius.' I don't say that I'm not a better actress for having tried so long to be merely a woman, 
for being able even now to know all that you mean when you say, woman, but there it is. I am an actress, and I can't leave off being one just by saying so. And I can't leave off being a proper father to my girls. I owe them the things we've been talking about just as I owe them a living. I suppose I should have married for their sakes, supposing I could get anybody to have me, even if I hadn't found you. And I don't want finding you to mean anything but the best to them. I had nothing to say to that, and he went back to a thought that had often been between us. We ought to have married when we were young, he insisted as though somehow that made a better case of it. If you hadn't begun, you wouldn't have been called on to leave it off. The point is that it won't leave me. Genius, I don't know what it is except that it is nothing to be conceited about because you can't help it isn't a thing you can pick up or lay down at your pleasure. It's a possession. I could see that he didn't altogether follow me, that he was not very far removed, and that only by his admiration for me, from the Taylorvillian idea that to speak of yourself as a genius was to pay yourself an unwarrantable compliment, and that the most I could get him to understand of the meaning of my work was what grew out of his being a most competent workman himself. He went back to the original proposition. Does that mean, then, that you are not going to marry me? It means that I'm not going to leave the stage to do it. It seems to me to mean that you don't love me as you have professed to. Oh, I know how women love. Good women. Helmeth! beg your pardon, Olivia. We stood aghast at what we had brought upon ourselves. Across the breach of dissension we rushed together with a facing passion. After all, I believe I should have gone with him if he had had the wit to know that the point at which a woman is most prepared for yielding is the next instant after she has just stated the insuperable objection. Whether he knew it or not, the whole of his outer attention was taken up with the purchase of pump fittings. Understand that I didn't for a moment suppose that I had lost him, that I didn't believe anything but that I could go to him at any moment if the whim seized me, that I couldn't in reason pull him back if the need of him arose. I finished out my vacation at resorts up and down the California coast, warm with the certainty that I should see him in New York the next winter. End of Book 4, Chapter 7「Book 4, Chapter 8 of A Woman of Genius by Mary Hunter Austin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Book 4, Chapter 8 the next season was a brilliant one, made so by the strength of my wanting him, and by the sense of completeness and finality which came to me out of the faith that we had been ordained to be lovers from the beginning. It began to seem, in the fashion in which we had been brought together as boy and girl, and then made it in ways which, credible as they had been, yet offered no obstacle to the freshness and vitality of our passion that we had been guided by that intelligence which in any emergency of my gift I felt rushed to save it, that I had been prevented from any absorbing interest until it had grown and flowered in me, appeared now to have come about by direct manipulation of the powers. I had curious and interesting adventures that winter in the farthest unexplored territory of the artistic consciousness, which tempt me at every turn to put by my story for the purpose of making them plain to you, and I am only deterred from it by the certainty that you couldn't get it plain in any case. A few days ago I picked up a copy of Dante and found myself convicted of shallowness in never having taken his passion for the cold-blooded Beatrice seriously by finding the evidence of its absolute quality in the circle within circle of his hells and paradisos, 
the rhythm of aches and exaltations. And if you couldn't get that from Dante, how much less from anything I might have to say to you. After all these years I do not know what is the relation of art to passion, but I have experienced it. If I said anything, it would be by way of persuading you that loving is not an end in itself, but the pull upward to our native heaven, which is no hymn-book heaven, but a world of the spirit, wherein things are made and remade and called good. What I made out of it at that time was the material of a satisfying success, and, though I got on without him much better than I could have expected, the fact that, after all, he did not get any nearer to me than the Pacific coast had its effect in the year's adventures. That I missed my lover infinitely, that I was thinned in the body by the sheer want of him, that I had moments of mad resolve— of passion itself abandoning cry to him, goes without saying. One need not, in a certain society, say more of love than that one has it, to be understood as well as if one displayed a yellow ribbon in the company of orangemen. But since I couldn't say it, an opinion passed current among my friends that I was working too hard and in need of a holiday. It came around at last to Palakkin himself noticing it, though I believe with the better understanding of the reason why I should be restless and sleepless-eyed. It was just after I had heard from Helmuth that he couldn't possibly hope to be in New York for another year that my manager suggested that it might be good business policy for me to play a short tour in three or four of the leading cities, a strictly limited season which would be enough to whet the public appetite without satisfying it. What cities? I believe that I jumped at it in the hope, somehow, that it might be stretched to include Los Angeles, where Helmuth was at the moment, and where I felt sure he would come to me. When I learned, however, that nothing was contemplated farther west than Chicago, I lost interest. That very day I had a telegram. Will you marry me? Signed, Garrett. It was dated at Los Angeles, and as I could think of no reason for this urgency, I concluded that it must be because the association there with the idea of me had been too much for him, and in that new yielding of mine to the beguiling circumstance, I was disposed to interpret it as evidence that he was coming round. I wired back, If you marry my work, Olivia and prepared myself for the renewal of that dear struggle which, if it got us no further, at least involved us in coil upon coil of emotion, making him by the very force he spent on it more completely mine. I expected him in every knock on the door, every foot on the stair, and had he come to me then, would no doubt have provoked him to that traditional conquest which, as it has its root in a situation made, affected for the express purpose of provocation, is the worst possible basis for a successful marriage. On the day on which, at the earliest, I could have expected him from Los Angeles, I sent my maid away in order that, if I should find him there in the old place waiting for me, there should be no constraint on the drama of assault and surrender for which I found myself primed. Then, by degrees, it began to grow plain to me that he did not mean to come, that the question, and my answer to it, had carried some sort of finality to his mind that was not apparent to mine. By the time I had a letter from him, written at the mine, with no reference in it to what had passed so recently between us, I understood that he would not ask me to marry him again. He had accepted the situation of being my lover merely, and I was not any more to be vexed by the alternative. I said to myself that it was better to have it resolved with so little pain, and that it should be my part to see that what we were to one another was to yield its proper fruit of happiness. I found myself at a loss, however, in the application, 
for though you may have satisfied yourself of the moral propriety of dispensing with the convention of publicity you cannot very well with a week's journey between you get forward in the business of making a man happy about this time jerry began to be anxious about what i couldn't prevent showing in my face the wasting evidence of love divided from its natural use of loving you break down altogether he expostulated and then where will i be he was tremendously interested in his new play which was by far the best thing he had done and in the process of getting it to the public he had so identified it with my interpretation that he was no longer able to think of the one without the other there had come into his manner a new solicitude very pleasing to me born of his sense of possession in me inasmuch as i was the lovely lady of his play and a sort of awe of all that i put into it that transcended his own notion and yet was so integral a part of it it had brought him out of his old acceptance of me as a foil and relief for the shallow iridescence that other women produced in him he had begun to have for me a little of that calculating tenderness with which a man might regard the mother of his nursing child night by night then as he came hovering about me he could not fail to observe though he could hardly have understood it the wearing hunger with which i came from my work pushed on by it to more and more desperate need of loving and drawn back by its unrelenting grip from the artistic ruin in which the satisfaction of that hunger would involve me now at his very natural expression of concern i felt myself unaccountably irritated jerry i demanded of him would it matter so much if we left off altogether writing plays and playing them what would it matter you are in a bad way if you've begun to question that what does living matter we are here and we have to go on yes but when we go on at such pains is there any more behind us than there is behind a ball when it is set rolling are we aimed at anything oh lord olivia what has that got to do with it he was sitting in my most commodious chair with his long knees crossed to prop up a manuscript from which he was reading me the notes of a tragedy he was about to undertake and his quills were almost erect with the tweaking he had given them in the process of arriving at his climax it was a curious fact that the breaking off of his marriage which in the nature of the case could not be broken off sharp but had writhed and frayed him like the twisting of a green stick by setting jerry free for those light adventures of the affections which had been so largely responsible for the rupture of his domestic relations instead of multiplying his propensity by his opportunity had landed him on a plane of self-realization in which they were no longer needful the poet in jerry would never be able to resist the attraction of youth and freshness but the man in him was forever and unassailably beyond their reach i was never more convinced of this than when he turned on this occasion from the preoccupation of his creative mood to offer whatever his point of attachment life had provided him to bridge across the chasm of my spirit i don't see why it is important that we should know what we are working for we might in our confounded egotism not approve of it we might even think we could improve on the pattern i write plays and you act them and a bee makes honey i suppose there's a beekeeper about but that's none of our business ah uh, if we could only be sure of that if he would only make himself manifest that's what i'm looking for just a hint of what he's trying to do with us well i can tell you he'll smoke you out of new york and into a sanitarium if you don't know enough to take a change and a rest polly wants me to go on the road for a while sort of triumphal progress he thinks applause will cure me you're getting that now what would bring you around would be a good frost you wouldn't want that in chicago jerry disentangled his limbs and sat up sniffing the wind of success if i could have you to open with my play in chicago he averred solemnly 
I'd be ready to sing the Lord dismiss us. He really thought so, to go back to the scene of his early struggle with his laurels fresh on him, to satisfy the predictions of his earliest friends and confound his detractors, above all to be received in his own country with that honor which is denied to prophets, seemed to him then almost as desirable in prospect as it proved in fact not to be. I found another advantage in the confusion and excitement of touring, in being able to conceal from myself that I hadn't a satisfactory letter from Helmuth since the pair of telegrams that passed between us, and no letter at all for a long time. It was always possible to pretend to myself that the letters had been written, but were delayed in forwarding. It was a raw spring day when we came to Chicago, the promise of the season in the sun, denied and flouted by the wind. It slanted the tails of the laboring teams and cast over the clean furrow, handfuls of the winter rubbish from the stubble yet unturned, and between field and field, it wrung the tops of the leafless wood. Now and then it parted them on white-painted spires, without disturbing them or the rows of thin white gravestones. It laid bared the roots of my life to the cold blasts of memory. It rendered me again the pagan touch, the undivided part that the earth had in me. My dead were in its sod, in me the sap of its spiritual fervors and renunciations. What was I? What was my art but the flower, the bright, exotic blossom born upon its topmost bough, its dying top? Here in its abounding villages, in the deep-rutted county roads, was the root and trunk. Outside, the wind flicked the landscape like the screen of the moving picture that the swift roll of the train made of it, and I felt again the pressure of my small son upon my arm, and the pleasant stir of domesticity and the return of my man. For the last hour Jerry had come to sit in my compartment opposite me and stare stonily out of the window. Now and then his jaws relaxed and set again as he bit hard upon the bitter end of experience. No one, I suppose, can go through that country so teeming with the evidences of the common life, the common labor, the common hope of immortality, and not feel bereft inasmuch as the circumstances of his destiny divide him from it. We passed Higgleston. Beyond the roofs of it, the elms that mark the cemetery road, gathered green. The roofs of the town were steeped in windy light. I had no impulse to stop there. I withdrew from it as one does from a private affair upon which he has stumbled unaware. Rather, it was not I who withdrew, but life, as it was lived there, turned its back upon me. Getting into Chicago through that smoky wooden wilderness, within which the city obscures itself as a cuttlefish in its own inky cloud, I felt again the wounding and affront, the cold shoulder lifted on my knees, the eager hand stretched out to catch my contribution. Chicago received me with its hat off, bowing to meet me, and when I remembered how nearly it had let me fall into the pit prepared for me by Griffin and the flimflams, I burned with resentment. It was seven years now since I had seen the city, or Pauline, the only friend I had made there who could be supposed to take an interest in my coming again. I meant, of course, to see Pauline. We had kept up a correspondence which with the years had shown a disposition to confine itself to a Christmas reminder and an occasional marked copy of a magazine. But I meant, of course, to see her. I had trusted to her finding out through the newspaper that I would be there, and on such a date. It fell in quite naturally with my inclination to have her card sent up to me the next morning a little after eleven. I was needing to be distracted. On my way up from breakfast I had met Cherry going down with a suitcase. Back to New York, he admitted to my question, as quick as I can get there. But with all the success, why they fairly stood on their feet last night. I know, I know. 
he looked unendurably harassed. I can't stand it, Olivia. I can't stand it. This place is full of ghosts. I remembered that both his children had been born there, and that he had not seen them for more than a year, and I did not press him. I'll keep your end up for a week if I can, I assured him as he wrung my hand. He turned back when he was a step or two down the stair. Don't stay too long yourself, he admonished. New York's the place. I was feeling that when Pauline came to me. It wasn't until I saw her that I realized what a distance there was, in spite of our common youth, had always been, between us. It started out for us both in the first glimpse we had of one another, in the witness in all the inconsiderable elements of line and color which go to make up a woman's appearance, of growth and amplitude in me, and fulfillment in hers. Pauline had been in her girlhood, if not pretty, at least what is known as an attractive girl, and though there was only a matter of months between us, it came to me with a shock that she was now not only not particularly attractive, but middle-aged. It was not so much in the fullness under her chin, which apparently caused her no uneasiness, nor in the thickness of her waist, of which I was sure she made a virtue but in the certainty that all that was ever to happen to her in the way of illuminating and self-forgetting passion had already happened. She had reached, she must have reached about the time I was taking my flight upward by the help of Morris Palatkin, the full level of her capacity to experience. She was living still, as I saw by the card which I still held in my hand, in Evanston, and she was living there because it was no longer within the scope of her possibility to live anywhere else. All this flashed through me in the moment in which Pauline, checked by what she was able to guess of unfamiliar elements in me, was crossing the room and taking me by the hands in the old womanly way, keyed it down to the certainty of not requiring it in her business any more. It was so patent that Pauline was now in the position of having done her duty toward life in Henry Mills, and was accepting all that came to her from it as her due, that it almost seemed for a moment that she had said something of the kind. What did pass between us, besides a kiss of greeting, were some commonplaces about my being there, and how pleased Henry and the children would be to see me. We sat down on a sofa together, and for a moment the old girlish confidence put forth a tender sprig of renewal. So many years since we were at school together. You've gone a long way since then, Olivia. A long way, I admitted, but she didn't catch the double meaning the phrase had for me. Henry and I were talking about it this morning, and the times you had here in Chicago— you poor dear, you had to make a good many starts before you got on the right road at last. A great many. But you found out that it all came right in the end, didn't you? That it was best just for you to trust. You used to be bitter about it. But trusting is always best. Oh, if you think I've been trusting all these years, I've been working. Of course, of course. Much of her old manner came back with the occasion for moralizing. But you were too amusing. You were quite fierce with Henry because he wouldn't do anything about it. She laughed reminiscently. And now you see. Her look traveled about the rose-colored room, full of the evidence of prosperity. Pauline, I said, if you are thinking that I could have gone to New York and become the success I am— Without the help that you and Henry might have given me, you are making a great mistake. What did happen was that I had to accept it from a quarter where it wasn't so much to be expected and was not nearly so agreeable. That man Mark Eversley found for you, you mean? Well, I suppose you did get on better for a little start. Start? I cried. Start? I had to have everything, food and clothes— a sudden recollection flashed upon me of those first days in New York, 
of myself become merely a dummy on which to hang a fat little Jew's notion of acceptable contours, the offence of it, the greater offence from which by the opportune appearance of the Jew I had so hardly escaped. Have you any idea, Pauline, what it means to have a man invest money in you? A man like Polakin. I was his property, a horse. He had entered for the race. He had a stake on me. Pauline looked aghast. Vague recollections of the actress heroines of fiction shaped her thought. You don't mean to say, Olivia, that you... that you were... His mistress? I finished for her bluntly. Is that the only thing your imagination takes offense at? Isn't it enough for me to tell you that he orders my corsets for me? That did reach her. I could see her struggle with the habitual effort to put the unwelcome fact down, anywhere out of sight and knowledge, under the cotton wool of a moral sentiment. Even now, if she could escape being implicated in my predicament by avoiding the knowledge of it, she would not only do that, but convict herself of superiority as well. My gorge rose against it. But if I didn't sell myself to the Jew, I drove it home to her. It was chiefly because he was decenter to me than the circumstance gave me a right to expect. I came near doing it for a cheaper man, and for a cheaper price, a man who had deserted one wife, and a bigamist, in fact. If you don't know that there were days when I would have sold myself for something to eat, it was because you didn't take the pains to. But you never said a word. Of course, if you had told me the truth. She floundered and saved herself on what she believed to be a just resentment. But I had no notion of letting her off so easily. I did not know exactly how we had got launched on the subject. It had not been in my mind to do so when she came in. But all the events of the past year seemed to lead up to it, to come somehow to the point of rupture against her smooth acceptance of my success as being derived from the same process as her own. I did tell you that I was in need of money to put me in the way of earning a living, I insisted. I did not ask you for charity. What I offered you was the chance of a business investment, one that rendered the investor its due return. The fact that you did not know enough about the business to know how good it was. I forestalled what I saw rising to her lips, had nothing to do with it. You were my friend and professed to admire my talent. I had a right to have what I said about it heard respectfully. I had got up from the pink and white sofa where our talk had begun and was trailing about the room in my breakfast gown, and the suggestion of staginess in the way the folds of it followed my movements irritated me with the certainty that the effect of it on Pauline would be to mitigate the sincerity of what I said. You'd known me long enough, I accused her, to know that I wouldn't have asked for money until I was in the last extremity, and then I wouldn't have asked for it for myself. I don't know that it would have mattered if I had starved, but my gift was worth saving. I didn't dream, she began. I hadn't any idea. Well, why didn't you ask Henry, then? Henry knows what becomes of women on the stage when they can't make a living. This was nearer to the mark than I had meant to let myself go, but I could see that it carried no illumination. She drew up her wrap and braced herself for one more gallant effort. The things you've been through, my dear, I don't wonder you feel bitter. But when it has all come out right, why not forget it? Oh, right, right! The room was full of vases and floral tokens of the triumph of the night before, and as I swung about with my arms out, disdaining her judgment of rightness for me, I knocked over a great basket of roses and orchids, which had come from Klein and Erskine. I don't suppose Pauline had ever knocked over anything in her life, and the violence of my gesture must have stood for some unloosening of the bonds of convention, with an implication which only now began to work through to her. You don't mean to say, Olivia, that you... that you are not... not a good woman? 
Oh, I said again, good. Good. What does it all mean? I'm a successful actress. Olivia! Well, no, if you insist on knowing. I'm not what you would call a good woman. I threw it at her as though it had been a peculiar kind of scorn heaped up on her for being what I had just denied myself to be. I saw myself for once with all my thwarted and misspent instincts toward the proper destiny of women, enmeshed and crippled not by any propensity for sinning, but by the conditions of loving which women like Pauline set up for me. And if you want to know, I said, why I am not a good woman, it is because women like you don't make it seem particularly worth while. Oh, she gasped, this is horrible, horrible. The word came out in a whisper. I saw at last that she was done with me, that the only thought that was left to her was to get away, to put as much space as possible between us. I got around with my hand on the door to prevent her. Pauline, Pauline, I cried almost wildly, as if even at the last she could have helped me from myself. Can't you remember that we grew up together, that we had the same training, the same ideals? Can't you remember that when we began, I thought the life you had chosen for yourself was the best, that I thought I had chosen it for myself, too? Only, for heaven's sake, Pauline, try to understand me. There is something that chooses for us. Don't you know that I wouldn't have been any different from what you are if I hadn't been forced? Haven't you seen how I've been beaten back from all that I tried to be? All this, I threw out my arms as I stood against the door, to include all that had entered by implication in our conversation. It had to come, and it came wrong, because you won't understand that a gift has its own way with us. I could see, though, that she wasn't understanding in the least, that she was badly scared and even indignant at being forced to listen to a justification of what, by her code, could have no justification. She was standing not far from me, crushed against the wall, as though by the weight of opprobriousness that I heaped upon her, and her whole attention was centered on the door and the chance of getting out of it and away from what, in the mere despair of reaching her intelligence with it, I flung out from me now wildly. I suppose, I scoffed, that it never occurs to you that a gifted woman could be as delicate and feminine as anybody, if only you didn't make her right to fostering care and protection conditional on her giving up her gift altogether. You— I demanded, who tie up all the moral values of living to your own little set of behaviors. What right have you to deny us the opportunity to be loved honestly, because you can't, at the same time, make us over into replicas of yourselves? I was sick with all the shames and struggles of the women I had known. I forgot the door and went over to her. You, I said, who fatten your moral superiority on the best of all we produce, how do you suppose you are going to make us value the standards you set up when the price you despise us for paying? Nine times out of ten we pay to the men who belong to you. What right have you to judge what we have done when you've neither help nor understanding to offer us in the doing? What right? What right? For the moment I had turned away in the vehemence of my indignation. I was pacing up and down. In the instant when my attention was distracted from the door, Pauline made a dart for it. I could hear her scurrying down the hall, but I went on walking up and down in my room and talking aloud to her. I was beside myself with the sum of all indignities. Was it not this set of prejudices which for the moment had presented itself in the person of Pauline Mills, which at every turn of my life had been erected against the burgeoning of my gift? Was it not in the process of combating the tradition of the preciousness of women as inherent in particular occupations that I had lost the inestimable preciousness of myself? Was it for what came out of Pauline's frame of life? I thought of Cecilia Brune here, that I had sacrificed my public possession of the man I loved, and what came out of it that was more to the world than what I had to offer. 
had I cut myself off from the comfort and stability of a home, simply because in my situation as famous tragedian I didn't see my way to bring up Helmuth's children so as to make little Pauline Millses of them. I was still raging formlessly in this fashion when Miss Summers, our ingenue, came to tell me that the cab waited to take us to the theatre for the matinee. All through the performance, which I was told went remarkably well, I was conscious of nothing but the seismic shudders and upheavals of my world, too long subjected to strain. It came back on me in intervals through the evening performance. I was physically sick with it. But by degrees, through its subsidence, new worlds began to rise. By the time I left the theatre that night, I knew what I would do. It had been a mistake, a natural but cruel mistake, for Helmuth and me to suppose that a way of living could at any time be worth the very sap and source of life. Love was a central fact around which all modes and occupations should arrange themselves. Let us put love, then, and live as we may. In all the world there was no need like the need I had for his breast, his arm, Always the point of our conclusions had been that I agreed with him, that I had thought that failing to repeat the pattern of their mother and his children, I had failed in all, that I didn't any more than he see my way to keeping on with my work and meeting him at the door every night when he came home, in the sort of garment that, in the ladies' journals, went by the name of house-gown. I laughed to think that we had not seen before, that it was ridiculous— I had no more doubt now, no more trepidation. What burned in me was so clear a flame that he could not but be illuminated. Only let me find him, let me go to him again. At the hotel desk where I paused for my key, I asked them to send up telegraph blanks to my room. With them came letters forwarded from New York. I started, as one does at an unexpected presence, to find an envelope among them with his familiar superscription. For the first time, I would rather not have had a letter from him. It would be interposing a fresher picture between me and my new resolution to put him for the moment farther from me. I saw then that the letter in my hand had been posted at Los Angeles. It was as though he had leaped suddenly all that distance nearer than as Chilicahote, Mexico, I noticed that it was a very thin letter. A thousand conjectures rushed upon me, not one of them with any relativity to what I would find, for when I tore it open there floated out a printed slip. It was a clipping from a Pasadena newspaper, and announced his engagement to Edith Stanley. End of Book Four, Chapter Eight Book Four, Chapter Nine of A Woman of Genius by Mary Hunter Austin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Book Four, Chapter Nine. There is very little more to write. I held myself together until I had written to Helmuth to say that I understood why he had done what he had done, and that I hoped he would be happy. The letter was not written to invite an answer. There was nothing he could say to please me that would not have been disloyal to Miss Stanley. Accordingly, no answer came, though it was a long time before I gave over the unconscious start at the sight of letters, the hope that somehow, against all reason, sometimes even yet. For I did not understand. I was married to him, much, much more married than I had ever been to Tommy Bettersworth and it wasn't in me to understand how any man can take a woman as he had taken me, and not feel himself more bound than ever church and state could bind him. It was ten months since I had seen him, but that, while my body still ached with the memory of him, he could have given himself to another woman was an unbelievable offense. There are days yet when I do not believe it. There was nothing any of my friends could do for me. I had the sense to see that and did not trouble them. 
Sarah, who was the only one who might have comforted me out of her own experience, was all taken up with her husband's declining health. Mr. Lawrence died the next winter, and by that time my wound had got past the imperative need of speech. Effie was expecting another baby and wasn't to be thought of, so I turned at last, when the first sharp anguish was past, to Mark Eversley. He in all America stood for that high identification of his work with the source of power that it is the private study of all my days to reach. I repaired to him as did Christians of old to favored altars. That I did so return for comfort to that distributor of gifts by whose very mark on me I was set apart from the happier destiny was evidence to me, the only evidence I could have at the time, that I had not been utterly mistaken in the choice I had made before I knew all that the choice involved. Eversley and his wife were Christian scientists, and though they did not make me of their opinion, I owe them much in the way of practice and example that keeps me still within the circle of communicating fire. I re-established, never to be broken off again, practical intercourse with the friends of the soul of man. I learned to apply directly for the things I had supposed came only by loving, and I found that they came abundantly. I grew in time even to think of Helmuth without bitterness. What I was brought to see, over and above the wish to provide a home for his children, must have been at work in him, was much the same thing that had driven me to my work. The very need of me must have hurried him into the relief of being loved. It was the only way which his purblind male instinct pointed him, to find an outlet for what goes from me over the footlights night by night. For a man, to be loved is of the greatest importance, but with women it is loving that is the fructifying act. That I was able to go on loving him was, I suppose, the reason why the shock I had sustained left no regrettable mark upon my career. The mark it left on me was none other than work is supposed to leave on every woman. What I am sure of now is that it is not work, but the loss of love that leaves her impoverished of feminine graces. I grew barren of manner and was reputed to be entirely absorbed in my profession. It was not, however, that I had excluded the more human interest, but they had taken flight. All the forces of my being had been, by the shock of loss, dropped into some subterranean pit, where they ran on underground and watered the choicest product of my art. If I had married Helmuth Garrett, I might have grown insensible to him. As it was, I seemed to have been fixed, though by pain, in the fruitful relation. The loss of him, the desperate ache, the start of memory are just as good materials to build an artistic success upon as the joy of having. And I did build. I gathered up and wrought into the structure of my life the pain of loving as well as its delight. I am a successful actress. Whatever else has happened to me, I am at least a success. I never saw him again. I never saw Henry and Pauline Mills but once, and some bitterness in the occasion came near to driving me toward that pit into which Pauline was willing to believe I had already descended. It was the second season after I had parted from her in Chicago that some sort of broker's convention had brought Henry on to New York and Pauline with him, and to the same hotel where Mark Eversley was shut up with an attack of bronchitis. Jerry and I, going up to call on him, came face to face with them. They were walking in the lobby. Pauline was in what for her was evening dress, her manner a little daunted, not quite carrying it off with the air of being established at the pivot of existence, which she could manage so well at Evanston. They were walking up and down, waiting, it seemed, for friends to join them, and they wheeled under the great chandelier just in time to come squarely across us. I could see Pauline clutch at her husband's arm, and the catch in her breath with which she jerked herself back from the impulse to nod, and looked deliberately away from me. For her, the evidence of my misdoing hung about me like an exhalation. 
She was afraid I should insist on speaking to her and some of her friends would come up and see me doing it. I didn't, however, offer to speak to her. I looked instead at Henry. I stood still in my tracks and looked at him steadily and curiously. I wished very much to know what he meant to do about it. He turned slowly as I looked from deep red to mottled purple, and very much against his will his head bowed to me. His body, to which Pauline clung, dared not move lest she detect it, but quite above and independent of his smooth-vested self-indulgent front, his head bowed to me, so went out of my life thirty years of intimacy, which never succeeded in being intimate. But though one may excise thirty years of one's past without a tremor, one may not do it without a scar. To allay the irritation of Pauline's slight, I came near to being as abandoned as she believed, as I had moments of believing myself. For the possibility that Helmuth Garrett had found in our relation of setting it aside made it at times of a cheapness which seemed to extend to me who had entertained it. I should have been happier, I thought, to have taken it lightly as he did, if so many women who had begun as I had begun had gone on repeating the particular instance, wasn't it because they found that that was the easiest, the only possible way to bear it? How else could one ease the pain of loving except by being loved again? And if I was to lose the Pauling Millses of the world by what had been entered upon so sincerely, why then what more had I to risk on the light adventure? All this time I was sick with the need of being confirmed in my faith in myself as a person worthy to be loved, to feel sure that since my love had missed its mark, it wasn't I, at least, that had fallen short of it. It was that summer Jerry had been driven by some such need, I imagined, as I admitted in myself, to put his future in jeopardy by another marriage— which, on the face of it, offered even a more immediate occasion for shipwreck than the first, and I hadn't scrupled to put forth to save him. The new capacity to charm which had come upon me with the experience of not caring any more myself to be charmed. I knew it would have been a poor tribute to my skill as an actress if I hadn't by this time known the moves by which a man who is susceptible of being played upon at all can be drawn into a personal interest. And though I didn't then and do not now believe that a love serviceable for the uses of living together can be built up out of made love, I was willing for the time to pit myself against the game that was played by Miss Chichester for Jerry's peace of mind. I played it all the better for not being, as the young lady was, personally involved in the stake." that I thought afterward of doing anything for myself with what I had got, when at last I had by this means brought Jerry down from Newport to my place on the Hudson for a weekend, was in part due to the extraordinary charm that Jerry displayed under the stimulus of a male interest in me, of whom for years he had thought of as being quite outside such consideration. There was a kind of wistfulness about Jerry when he was a little in love, that made him irresistible. No doubt I was also a little warmed by the fire which I had blown up. He was to come from Saturday to Monday, and the moment I saw him getting down from the dog cart I had sent to the station for him, I knew that I had only to let that interest take its course, to find myself provided with a lover, whether or no I could command my heart to loving. I do not remember that I came to any conscious decision about it, but I know that I yielded myself to the growing sense of intimacy that I consciously drew as one draws perfume from a flower, all that came to me from him. His new loverliness touched still with the old solicitous sense of the preciousness of my gift. I dramatized to the full the possibility of what hung in the air between us. I dressed myself. I set the stage accordingly. It was Saturday evening after dinner that I sent him to the garden to smoke, keeping the house long enough to fix his attention on my joining him, by wondering what kept me, 
and so overdid my part by just so much as I made myself conscious of the taint of theatricality. For as I went down the veranda steps to meet him in the rose-walk, the response of the actress in me to the perfectness of the setting and my fitness for the part of the great lady of romance drew up out of my past a faint reminder of myself going up another pair of stairs, so many years ago in the figure of an orphan child toiling through the world. Out of that memory there distilled presently a cold dew over my purpose. It was a perfect night, warm emanations from the earth shut in the smell of the garden, and light airs from the river stirred the full-leafed trees. At the bottom of the lawn the soft full rush of the Hudson made a stir like the hurrying pulse. Beyond the silver gleam of its waters lay the farther bank strewn with primrose-colored lights, and above that the moon, low and full-orbed and golden. Its diffusing light mixed and mingled with the shadow of the moving boughs. I was wearing about my shoulders a light scarf that from time to time blew out with the wind, and as we paced in the garden strayed across Jerry's breast and was caught back by me, but not before on its communicating thread ran an electric spark. It must have been a good two hours after moonrise before we turned to go in, where the great hall lamp burned with a steady rose-red glow. At the foot of the veranda a breeze sprang up fresher than before that caught my scarf from me and wrapped us both in it as in a warm, suffusing mood. We were so close that I had instinctively to put up my hand as a barricade against what was about to come from him to me, and as I did so I was aware of something that rose up from some subterranean crypt in me, that old romance of my mother's, Women like her, worlds of patient, overworking women, who could do without happiness if only they found themselves doing right. Somehow they had laid on me the necessity of being true to the best I had known, because it was the best and had been founded in integrity and stayed on renunciations. I knew what I had come into the garden to do. I had planned for it. I thought myself prepared to take up, as many women of my profession did, the next best in place of the best which life had denied me, but my past was too strong for me. The unslumbering instinct that saves wild creatures before they are well awake had whipped me out of the soft entanglement, and before Jerry could grasp the change of mood in me, I was halfway up the stair. This wind, I said, I think it will blow up a rain before morning. I went on up before him. You can see the river darkling below its surface. It does that before a change. I went on drawing the chairs back from the edge of the veranda. I called Elsa to fasten all the windows. When at last we came into the glow of the hall lamp, I could see his face, white yet with what he had missed. He thought he had blundered. He caught at my hand as I gave him his bedroom candle in an effort to recapture what had just trembled in the air between us. Olivia, I say, Olivia, your train leaves at 9.30, I reminded him. I'll be up to pour your coffee. I went into my room and blew out my candle. The warm summer air came in between the white curtains. I knelt down beside my bed an old habit long discontinued. I was too much moved to pray, but I continued to kneel there a long time, listening to the soft shouldering of the maples against the wall outside the window. Far within me there was something which inarticulately knew that whatever the world might think of me, in spite of what I had confessed to Pauline, I was a good woman." I had loved Helmuth Garrett with the kind of love by which the world is saved. Past all loss and forsaking, past loneliness and longing, there was something which had stirred in me which would never waken to a lighter occasion. And whether great love like that is the best thing that can happen to us, or the most unusual, it had placed me forever 
beyond the reach of futility and cheapness. All this was several years ago. Jerry and I are the best of friends, and I am far too busy a woman to miss out of my life anything Pauline Mills could have contributed to it. Besides, I am very much taken up with my nieces and nephews. Forrester's oldest boy shows a credible talent for the stage, and I have him at school here where I can watch him. I shall try him out on the road next summer. Effie's husband is in the legislature now, and Effie looks to see him governor. I am very fond of my sister. We grow together. I owe it to her to have found ways of making things easier for women who must tread my path of work and loneliness. It is partly at her suggestion that I have written this book, for Effie is very much of the opinion that the world would like to go right if somebody would only show it how. Sarah also added her word. It is the fact of your telling, whether they believe you or not, of your not being ashamed to tell that is going to help them, she insists. At any rate, it will help other women to speak out what they think, unashamed. Most women are not thinking at all what they are very willing to be thought of as thinking. I am the more disposed to take their word for it, since as they are both happy, they cannot be supposed to have the fillip of discontent. Sarah left the stage a year after Mr. Lawrence's death to marry a banker from Troy, and she has never regretted it. She calls her oldest girl Olivia. It is the sane and sympathetic contact with the common destiny which I get at her house and my sister's that keeps me from the resort of successive and inconsequent passions, such as fill the void in the lives of too many women who are under the necessity of producing daily the materials of fire. But you must not understand me to blame women for taking that path when so many are closed to them. Haven't they been told immemorially that loving is their proper function, their only one? Last year I walked in a suffrage parade because Effie wrote me that it was my duty, and the swing of it, the banners flying, the proud music, set gates wide for me on fields of new, inspiring experience, all the paths that lead to the shining destiny. Why shouldn't women walk in them? I should think some of them might lead less frequently to bramble and morass. And after all, said Jerry, a day or two ago when I had read him some pages of my book. You have only told your own story. You haven't found out why all the rest of us run so afoul of personal disaster. We, I mean, who, as you say, nourish the world toward the larger expectation. And, after all, said I, what is an artist but a specialist in human experience? And how can we find out how the world is made except by falling afoul of it? If when we fall we didn't pull the others down with us, I am willing to learn, but why should others have to pay so heavily for my schooling? Where's the justice in making us so that we can't do without loving, and then not let us be happy in it? I don't believe it is the loving that is wrong. It is the other things that are tied up with it and taken for granted must go on with loving that we can get on with. Marriage, you mean? Not exactly. Living in one place and by a particular pattern, thinking that because you are married you have to leave off this and take up that, which you wouldn't think of doing for any other reason. You mean? I know, he nodded. My wife was always wanting me to do this and that, on the ground that it was what married people ought, and I couldn't see where it led or why it was important. But what if it should turn out that the others are wrong and we are right about it? Oh, I think we are all wrong. People like us are after the truth of life, and marriage is the one thing that society won't take the trouble to learn the truth about. My baby, you know I lost him because I didn't know how to take care of him, and there was nobody at hand who knew much more than I. But Effie's last baby came before its time, and they saved it by science, by knowing what and how. Why can't there be a right way like that about marriage? and somebody to discover it. Then where would we come in? 
after it was all found out, if we are the experimenters. Oh, there'd be other fields. Why shouldn't it be that when we have found out our relation to the physical world? We are finding it, you know, radioactivity and laws of falling bodies. Go on finding out the law of our relations to one another. And when we found that out, then there's all the heavenly host. We'd have to find out how to get on with them. And in the meantime, we are spoiling a lot of people's lives because we can't get on with one another. He broke off suddenly. My wife is married again. I don't know if I told you. Ah, then you haven't quite spoiled her life. She has another chance. And the children? He had been very fond of them, I knew. I haven't done so much with my own life that I'd insist on controlling theirs. You've done wonders, I assured him. Jerry, honest, do you mind it so much, not having a wife and family? Oh, Lord, yes, Olivia. I need a wife the same as a man needs a watch to keep the time of life for me. He faced me with a swift, sharp scrutiny. Honest, do you mind? Sometimes, I admitted, when I think of what's coming, when I can't act any more. You'll be leading them all still when you are seventy. You do better every season. He threw away his cigar and came and stood before me, preening his raven's wing, which now had a little streak of white in it. Olivia, what's the matter with you and me being married? We get on like everything. There's more to it than that, Jerry. Being in love, you mean? Well, I don't know that I would stick at a little thing like that. He was looking down at me with an effect of humor, which I was glad to see covered a real anxiety about my answer. I've been in love lots of times. I've been mad about several women. I don't feel that way about you, and I don't know that I care to. But if wanting you is loving, if worrying about you when you aren't quite up to yourself, and being proud of you when you are, if liking to be with you and wanting to read my manuscripts to you the minute I've written them, if owing you more than I owe any other woman and being glad to owe it, is loving you, why, I guess I love you enough for all practical purposes. What would Toddy Lockwood say? Or is it Dotty? Miss Lockwood was Jerry's latest interest at the Winter Garden. Oh, she? She isn't in a position to say anything. It's only vanity on her part, and the lack of anything to do on mine. There'd be no time for toddies if you married me. Jerry, since you've asked me, I suppose you know that I... that I... He put up an arresting hand. I've guessed. There isn't anything you need to tell me, and I haven't an altogether clean record myself. But... I want you to know, Olivia, that there was never anything in my case that you could take an exception to, so long as my wife was with me. I couldn't make her believe it, but it's true. Except, of course, that I was a fool. I, I hope I'm done with that. I'd want you to be a bit foolish about me, Jerry. That is, if I make up my mind to it. I had to defend myself against the encouragement he got out of my admission. But, Jerry, when did you begin to think about what you've just said? About marrying you? Ever since that time I went down to your place, when that Chichester girl... When I wouldn't take her place, a peasily merely? Well, suppose I had. Suppose I had been what the Chichester girl wouldn't. Would you still have wanted to marry me? I would not admit to myself why I had asked that question. I don't know, Olivia. Men, don't you know, not often. But I want to marry you now. I want it greatly. I held him off still, trying to get my own experience in shape where I could leave it behind me. Such affairs never turn out well, do they? Hardly ever, I believe. Unless you turn them into marriage, I hazard. You know, he conjectured, I've a notion that the kind of loving that goes to making such affairs can't be turned into marriage very easily, 
It's a kind of subconscious knowledge of their unfitness that keeps us from turning them into marriage in the first place. I wonder. He let me be for the moment, revolving many things in my mind. It wouldn't be the vision and the dream, Jerry. You and I. Well, what of it? It might be something better, something neither of us ever had, really. It would be company. No, I've never had it. I remembered how blank the issue of my work had been to Helmuth Garrett. Well, then, we have years of work in us yet. I'll buy Palatkin out of the theater. He was going off at a tangent of what we might do together, but I had thought of something more pertinent. We might solve the problem of how to keep our art and still be happy. We might. He was looking down on me with great content, but quite soberly. Tell me, Olivia, suppose we shouldn't, even with the unhappiness, with all you have been through, would you rather be what you are, or like the others? We were silent as we thought back across the years together. There was very little by this time that we did not know of one another. No, I said at last, if... Being different meant being like the others. I'd not choose to have it any different. End of A Woman of Genius by Mary Hunter Austin